Members, if you can please take your seats. Okay, members, this meeting is now resumed. Members, we will now review and confirm the order paper. There are 38 items left on the agenda, including 21 member motions. Uh, members, I have also reviewed a number of urgent motions without notice to be added to the agenda. Councillor Chang. The motion's going to come on the screen. It's a, it's a member's motion that you have uh, that you've submitted into the clerk. We need to add it to the agenda. Okay, there it is on this on the screen. Oh, so, sorry. Uh, j just one sec. There you go. There I'd you like go. to thank you through the chair. Uh, I'd like to file a motion for 139 Points Avenue, request for representation at the Toronto Local Appeal Body. And the reason for the urgency is that there is a deadline to the appeal on February 8th. Okay, thank you. Thank you. On favor, show of hands, opposed if any, carried. Councillor Malik. Councillor Malik, oh, there you are. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Uh, um, uh, I am moving a motion to add uh, 43 Tank House Lane liquor license application for Old Flame Brewery. Um, the matter is urgent because the deadline for objections was February 2nd, 2022. Thank you. All in favor? Show of hands. Carried. Councillor Malik, you have another one. Thank you very much, and I move this also with thanks to my seconder, um, uh, Councillor Sachs. Um, uh, this motion is about Metrolinx's community participation and actions regarding Osgood Station and Ont the Ontario Line. The motion is urgent as then injunction um, between uh, Metrolinx and the Law Society ends on Friday, February 10th. On favor, show of hands, opposed if any, carried. Councillor Pasternak. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Yes, this is urgent. It was a request um, uh, by staff to move this uh, on, on an appeal uh, because the last, the deadline to appeal is February the 8th uh, before the next council meeting. All in favor, show of hands. Opposed, if any, carried. Okay, thank you. I will now take the release of polls. The clerk will open the speaker's list in CMP and you can place your name on the list if you have an item to release. Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have two that I'd like to release. Uh, CA 2.1, uh, this is civic appointments. Uh, the City of Toronto nominee to the Greater Toronto Airports Authority Board. I'd like to release. Okay, Councillor Crawford is releasing CA 2.1. On favor, show of hands, opposed if any, carried. Thank you. And the second one is CA 2.3, the appointment of the public members to the Toronto Public Library Board. Okay. Councillor Crawford is releasing CA 2.3. On favor, show of hands, post if any, carry. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much, Speaker. Good morning. I'd like to uh, release IE 1.7, which is a standard of care uh, training course for members of council. Okay. So Councillor Thompson is releasing IE 1.7. On favor, show of hands. OK, 
carried. Are yeah. there any further releases? Okay, thank you. Members, before the recess, Council was considering item HL 1.6, cold weather and the effects on those experiencing homelessness, which was timed as the second item following the Mayor's key matters. Council has timed item IE 1.4, Cycling Network Plan 2021 Active TO, a cycling network expansion project. Uh, updates as the first item of business this morning. I propose that we do resume consideration of HL 1.6 before moving on to IE 1.4. Okay, on favor, carry. Before we start, Councillor Moyes, you just want to make a... Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, for accommodating me. I'd like to take this time to announce that the St. Lawrence uh, Neighborhood Association is celebrating their 40th anniversary on February 14th. It is an honor to represent the St. Lawrence neighborhood and to work alongside the SLNA. I'd like to wish them a very happy 40th anniversary on February 14th. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, can I have a motion to adopt the order paper? On um, favor? Show of hands, opposed if any, carried. Okay, so we'll go back to HL 1.6. Give us a minute for the staff to put the names on the screen. I believe that we were in the middle of asking questions to Councillor Ching. <laughs> sizzle, sizzle. <laughs> Thompson, three minutes clarification of the motion. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Through you to Councillor Chang. Um, the motion that you moved yesterday, I know that. Uh, as a result of uh, the break, you'd had a chance to review and revise that motion. Yes. I wonder if you could just explain what that is, because I was going to ask you a question on the original motion, so I may not have to dive in too deeply with respect to my question. Sure. Please. Yes, I want to weave it all together. So here is my uh, revised version of my amendment. going up on the screen. All right. Um, did you see it? It's on our screen here, but it's Yeah. Um, is it going oh. to be put on the screen? I'm not sure what this type of section is. Okay, it's okay, on. Okay, it's the, here. It's so, on. Councillor, I wonder if you could just tell us what you have changed because my question was going to uh, basically focus on the fact that there was a motion at uh, ECDC, uh, which you were in attendance. Yes. Um, there was also a motion at um, Board of Health, which uh, the motion I move at uh, EDC, ECDC was around uh, Health Ontario and bringing everyone together to discuss the issue. Right. Board of Health similar and giving the medical officer of, um, of health to convene a group of experts and so on. Yeah. What's different from what you proposed yesterday yes. to what you've changed Today. now as part of this morning's amendment to your motion from yesterday? So instead of creating another thread that we have to kind of bring back into the fold, um, folding mine into the uh, original request from ECDC, EC 1.9. So um, if I can just get the revised version on the screen, please. Oh, it is. Okay. C I City can see it. Oh, great. City Council requests a general manager, shelter, support, and housing administration 
to include, one, conducting the review of policies and procedures of emergency warming centers operations requested in item EC 1.9, review of extreme weather supports for homeless and underhoused individuals, and then everything else that was originally there. And, yes. and that will all come in with respect to the reporting timeline? Yes. That Councilor Carol was trying to yes, seek right. out yesterday? Yes. In terms of coordinating that all together? That's right. So my apologies for creating a new thread when we no can problem. all weave it together. So okay. Speaker, thank you very much. Speaker, those conclude my question. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Thompson to speak. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, speaker, this particular matter is extremely important to all of us. Oh, I have a motion. <laughs> um, I'd like, Speaker, to move the following motions. Um, I'd like to delete, I think if the clerk can just put it up, I'd like to delete one and two the recommendations that came from the Committee at Board of Health. Yeah. Um, I think it's really important for us to all understand that we all want to address the issues around homelessness that is facing this city. It's, a, it's an important issue for all of us. The Board of Health discussion talked seriously about the concerns that we have. There were motions that were put forward to suggest that this is a crisis. And one would think that using that term would generate a response that would effectively want to bring forward resources, whether or not it's uh, personnel resources and or financial resources to address this matter. We know that not to be the case with respect to calling this a crisis as, as it's been stated. We do think it's important for the federal and provincial government to do more. We also think that it's important for municipalities across the region and beyond to do more themselves, to ensure that they have facilities to accommodate residents in their areas. Because what has happened, and we've seen this time and time again, because we here in the city of Toronto are very concerned about this very complex issue, we put a lot of resources to apply to this particular condition. To the tune off, if we add the $700 million that we're actually going to spend in this calendar year, the total since 2018 would be, in total, uh, $3.2 billion that we're spending on this issue of trying to accommodate those who are in need of housing and shelter. We are spending a significant sum of monies. We note as well that the other levels of government are not contributing sufficiently. In fact, what we see based on the questioning yesterday with respect to Mr. Tanner, we see that their numbers are being reduced. In 2022, the federal government, the provincial government spent $97 million. Compare that to the city's number of $457 million. Federal government spent $72 million. It is quite frankly shameful. And it is in that respect, what we want then is to get both those two levels of government doing more. My motion reflects that necessity and the need to do that. Simply calling it a crisis doesn't change the conditions. What we need are the resources to add to the mayor's objective, which is to provide more shelter, more housing, and more support. We also have, as it relates to my second motion, the ability for the general manager for SSHA to be able to put in place warming facilities as he thinks that they are necessary in, in obviously in consultation with different stakeholders and so on. We heard from him yesterday that it will cost us 
400, I think it's $400,000 per month for each of these particular facilities. So if we don't get federal and provincial funding to help us, we have to spend more money from the city, which we are not basically suggesting that we don't want to do. We want to spend money to help the situation. But to think that this is a city of Toronto problem alone, which it isn't, it's everyone's problem. So by calling it a crisis and not having the ability to respond to it in that way or having any resources to come to the specific condition and concern is, in my view, disingenuous just from the perspective of saying, highlighting the problem which we already know exists and we're not going to do much about it. My motions seek to actually do more to address the issue, Speaker. I'm asking members to support the motions. Thank you. We do have questions for you. Sure, thank you, Speaker. Councillor Matlow, three minutes clarification of the motion. Um, through, you, through you, Madam Speaker. Councillor Thompson, um, do you believe that uh, the fact that Torontonians are out in the cold throughout the cold winter months, often without predictable and ready access to warm and safe spaces to go, do you not, do you not describe that as a crisis? Um, through you, Madam Speaker, in my ward, recognizing there's a need for additional warming facilities, I offered the Scarborough Civic Centre. We know that there is a need for facilities. We know that the manager of shelter and housing has the ability to respond. And so we are investing in the ability to help. We also heard from the questioning from the general manager yesterday, even if we wanted to put in place a very complex system, we don't have the staffing ability to put that structure in place. So to respond to your question, Councillor, there is a plan to work through and putting together a strategic plan to address these issues. We have offered the opportunity to the general manager and he's working on that to address these conditions that are facing now, uh, some of our may I, uh, may I, may I, just to, just to continue, uh, Councillor Thompson, in that same line. Um, so you, you talk about uh, a plan that is a plan for a plan, that there will be a strategic plan eventually. Uh, admittedly, asking other levels of government for, to come and bail us out in this area, even though I agree that they, they should do more. Uh, is aspirational. We haven't seen evidence that they're doing that for this current budget uh, process that we're in the midst of. Um, given that we currently, right now, right today, have people on our streets, in our parks, in our lanes, throughout our city, who don't have predictable access to warm and safe spaces to go that could save lives and prevent, uh, prevent an impact on their health. Would you not agree that we should move now to ensure that they do have safe places to go that are predictable through the winter months while we negotiate with other levels of government to do their part and ensure that they provide us the supports that we need? That Thank was you your much. last question. Thank you very much for the question, Councillor. That work is actually being done. We've heard from the General Manager of Shelter Support and Services that he and his team are able to look at the conditions which are very disconcerting and respond appropriately. He has the tools to do so. He's also expressed to us that he is unable to put in place the type of system that is being asked for. So I don't think that we should be telling people that we're going to make uh, in, put in place or make a system available that we know we can't because he has indicated he's not able to for a number of reasons. Thank you. Councillor Morley, three minutes, clarification of the motion. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, through you to my colleague, Councillor Thompson. Uh, my question is just with respect to the history of action from our provincial and federal counterparts. Um, would you agree that in the past when we have looked at declaring or using language around crisis, we have heard um, about the challenges uh, and, and some of the uh, um, concerns and pressures currently on our shelter housing support uh, team and group. Uh, and unfortunately, what we've continued to see is inadequate response uh, for Torontonians who are unhoused. Um, and so I guess my question is, uh, in your experience, when we declare a crisis, does that not um, support um, getting the other levels of government to the table to take the kind of action that you are describing in your motions? No. So what? How is this motion going to uh, lean, lead towards that outcome? Thank you very much for that, because that's really a good question. Point. Thank you. It's important that we understand working with the other two levels of government to simply try to embarrass them doesn't generate a favorable response for us. So if our objective and goal is to ensure that we work with them, to get the type of resources that we need, which it is something that we want, we have to go through a process. We have probably the very best person in the history of this city who has been able to champion the causes for the city, who's been able to champion resources for the city, and no other person than Mayor Tory. And so we have this particular person in place that can help us with the dialogue, the discussion. When we attempt, and we've seen this time and time again, to embarrass the other levels of government, to suggest that they do something that they haven't done. We have not seen an accelerated process in which to get the needed things that we're asking for. It happens through a bit of diplomacy, dialogue, and negotiation. Arguably and agreeably, that has to take place. It has to increase in a much more rapid pace and that's something I know the mayor is acutely aware of, and I and you and everyone else in this chamber should stand behind him when he goes to have discussions with the other levels of government, asking for more, because they are giving us some, but it's not enough. We're spending beyond our ability to fight a condition that exists in this city. When we put 1,000 more space in place to help the problem that we encounter, we need 1,000 more. I've never seen in the time here a situation where anyone has agreed what we put in place is sufficient because of the demand, the demand that comes into place. The last question. Um, I think that that does help clarify, and I think just to sure. the point around em embarrassing the other levels of government, I think Torontonians, frankly, are a little bit embarrassed. And personally, when I drive in every day and I see neighbors and Torontonians sleeping on the grates um, and folks, you know, looking for change with cold hands, as I sit in my comfortable car, I feel embarrassed and I feel a sense of urgency and a sense of responsibility um, to call those folks to the table, whatever that whatever that looks like. And so, I thank you for your motions and I thank you for clarification. Thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you. Is that it? So our next <laughs> I can't see my, <laughs> I see, oh, okay, great. I can't see mine. thanks. Councillor Bravo, three minutes. Thank you, Speaker. Um, <clears throat> Councillor Thompson, uh, you, you heard the deputations that uh, came to um, ECDC and Board of Health and you know, you're probably aware of the 100, 230 people that spoke through the budget process. Did you hear a call from the people of Toronto that homelessness is a crisis and needs immediate action? Madam Speaker, through you, I listened to the deputations. I heard the deputations at um, both Economic Development and Community Council, Community, um, and uh, also Board of Health. The fact that, I, that there was the deputants who came in, as well as budget, doesn't mean that my position should reflect what was presented, because I know how we work to get things done. And so my motion is attempting to try to facilitate, obviously, actions in which would be consistent with respect to those people who came to speak to that specific issue in which you refer. Yeah, how we get things done, meaning how we fund things, how we make priorities in the City of Toronto, correct? 
I'm sorry? You're saying I, I couldn't how, hear you. how we get things done is how we, where we invest and what we make a priority in the city of Toronto. Is that what you mean? We get things done in a number of ways here. First and foremost, we discuss things in committee. We hear, right. provide inputs that are provided to our different committees as one. The input that we receive is factored into a series of things. First and foremost, what is doable? What can we accomplish? When it reflects our need to work with other levels of government, yes, thank it's you. In, let me just finish, Councillor. It's important for us to understand how to do that work. Just because you ask for something in a particular way doesn't mean that the corresponding response is that you get something back the way you think you should. Right, so we've been asked by um, the heads of 79 departments of uh, emergency departments, we've been asked by, by the Ontario Human Rights Commission to do something. Uh, we've been asked by uh, more than 10,000 people who've written to us, faith leaders. Um, those are somewhat authoritative voices, I would think. And what we heard back from staff, I think you were listening as well, is we do what we can with the resources that we have, but is it not true, um, Councillor Thompson, that to ask the federal and provincial government for investment, we need to take a, a strong stand, number one. And number two, that when we wanted to do things, when certain people here wanted to do things that cost a lot of money, like putting officers on transit, police officers on transit, the money was found. Okay, that was your last question. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last 10 seconds of what you said because there's a lot of conversation yeah, here. Yeah, so the, first, the that? first part is how can we morally say to the provincial Speaker. and federal government that we, we, we need immediate action around Speaker, homelessness? Speaker, I'm trying to hear. I can't hear. Councillor, Sorry, sorry just one moment. I just want to be able to hear you. Thank I'll repeat you. The, the, just the Thank substance you. of my question. The first part was how can we say to the provincial and federal government with moral authority that homelessness is a crisis and requires action if we don't say it here? And second, you say that we need to be judicious with resources, but when we, when there was an interest in putting uh, 80 officers on transit, that money was found. So this isn't this just an issue of priorities? Um, through you, Madam Speaker, we've heard from the general manager of shelter support and housing that he has the ability to respond to the uh, need to address what is problematic in this city is the need for more shelter. He's able to do that work as he has expressed. He needs to ensure that he can actually do the work that is required based on what we're asking him to do. And so what we heard from him yesterday specifically was the call for more facilities in the city. He doesn't have the ability to do it as it's being requested. We also know that he has the need for more resources. So this is what I'm attempting to respond to. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Councillor Fletcher, three minutes. Yes, I just wondered. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I just wanted to be talked about the Scarborough Civic Center. Has it been a warming and cooling center previously, Councillor? Uh, it's been both. And the uptake? Sorry? The uptake. Um, some days there's not many some days there is um, I don't believe that I've ever seen it over capacity for example what is the capacity Do you pardon know? me I don't actually know what the capacity is I think there's probably I'm gonna guess the number of beds I'm basically based on the number of beds because you can see it's pretty obvious I think there's probably be I'd say maybe 25 or 30 beds 25 there. or 30 beds and yes. often they're not there's a small uptake often there isn't in fact thank you. I just thank you Okay, thank you. Um, then I just wonder, do you have any out of the cold programs out in your ward? In my ward? that Correct. There are other agencies that are operating in and around the area. I don't know all of them, but there are other agencies that are actually working to address this issue because... So they have the, an out of the cold style program? Right. People are coming overnight, there are staying people overnight. Are, yes, I'm aware of this. And getting fed and warm and then... Sorry, yes. I'm... I don't know what it is, Speaker. I'm just having a hard time hearing that. Sorry, yeah, it, it yeah. is very hard to hear in here, Speaker. Yeah. yeah uh, it, there's something picking up. We're getting a little echo. Some audio yeah. is picking up uh, we, double. We, we do have a problem because I'm having problems hearing. So something is on somewhere that's doubling up. It must be feed. a problem with some. I don't know what's going on. Okay. I can hear you now, Councillor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
so the same type of program is out of the cold. I'm sorry? The same type of program as out of the cold. Yes, I would say it's similar. I would say. And how many do you have out there? I don't know the number. But you do have it. And have they shut down over the pandemic? Um, I don't know whether or not they actually shut down over the pandemic. I know that there was attempt to get more people assistance during the pandemic in a number of different ways, not only with respect to providing shelter, but also just in terms of food. Maybe you could get closer need. to your microphone too. Okay, sure. Do your Mad best Madonna here this morning. I'm sorry? Do your best Madonna. <laughs> right up. Not, I'm not sure what that means, but okay. You were telling me about that. Your yeah, and I'm just simply saying that there are obviously facilities in the area, not just in my area in Scarborough, but just I'm just in asking about your uh, facilities. I, I understand, but I'm saying to you that there are many facilities. My area has a number of facilities who are actually trying to help people. And in fact, um, But there's no overnight programs such as there were before. I don't believe that there was a lot okay. of overnight program in the past. Oh, okay. Counselor, in my thank area. You. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Ainsley, three minutes, questions? Uh, thank you. Through you, uh, Madam Speaker, to, to Councillor Thompson. Um, I'm trying to understand uh, if you can clarify for me um, the need to remove the word crisis or is the recommendation um, crisis. You said in your comments that the situation that we're currently undergoing, uh, I believe you referred to it as shameful. I'm trying to understand the difference between something being shameful and not being a crisis. Thank you very much for the question, Councillor. Um, both levels of government, provincial and federal governments, are contributing to the challenges that we're having in the city with respect to homelessness. My view is that they're not contributing sufficiently. We know that where we have the need to house people, there is a tremendous effort that's actually being done by the city of Toronto. And when I look at the original motion, it speaks to the fact that, it, at least the impression is that, nothing's actually being done. I've also heard the comment from others, uh, whether or not it's through the media, that says, City of Toronto, you're not doing anything to affect this particular problem. I would argue that a lot is actually being done. Yes, more needs to be done, but what I've discerned over the years in this environment, in as much as we do, there's more to be done. So where we have a situation where it's suggested that there's a need for a thousand beds, for example, once we apply the ability to put that in place, we're told we need another thousand. My point with respect to looking at this matter and the nature of the crisis, Councillor, as you've asked me to explain that, when you declare something a crisis, you should have the mechanism and the ability to respond to what you defined as a crisis. During the questioning at Board of Health, we asked the staff who are responsible the question, if we deem this to be a crisis, what are the measures and or the instrument of change to address this crisis that you would bring into place? The answer is, we have no instrument, we have no ability to respond to it in that fashion. So the question is, why do we simply say something is something, in this case a crisis, yet we can't do anything about it? Why don't we put in place measures to try to deal with the problems through the mechanism that we have? Part of it is dialogue, negotiation, and asking for more resources to invest. But I will say this final point, in as much as we apply more resources, we will continue to have this problem. We need to understand that people who are in need of shelter and other types of you know, things in our city, people who are poor, we have to start the discussion a long time, er, a lot earlier 
than simply when they arrive at the conditions that's prevailing at the time. We have to start when they're young people. We have to start with families and helping them. There's a lot of work that's being done now Thank in this space. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cheng, a three minutes clarification of the motion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, through the chair, uh, when we, I heard you mention this, and I also heard Gord Tanner mention it yesterday, that uh, one of the things that are of concern is when you open a site, it fills up, and then you open another one, and it fills up. So where should people go if we're not opening them up to Speaker, be filled up? Clarification on the motion. On the motion. Yeah, you're the, right. So you just questions on the motion. Right. So with regard to the request for 24/7, you're deleting the the request for 24/7 shelters from April 5th until April 15th, right? That's being removed. So if the case is, is that you're opening them and filling them and opening and filling them, that's a problem. So in this gap that this motion is trying to fill, the gap is a warm place to land. And, and we've heard from frontline workers, it's not just about a warm place to land, but a place to land. Um, what would your suggestion be to fill in this gap? Thank you very much for the question, Councillor. We heard as well from Mr. Uh, Tanner yesterday and we've also seen by his actions where he actually opened up a facility uh, last week because one was needed. That provision is still available to Mr. Tanner through the mechanism that we have in place now. But would you not say that if we open and they fill, we open when they fill, that the demand is there and that it's not just, uh, that we're not actually filling the gap at this time? Councillor, again, staff has the ability to respond to the need. We've also heard from the staff that in as much as we would desire to add more facilities, we don't have the ability to do so. First of all, we don't have the number of people to be able to do the staffing. So, and so, we don't, may I just Okay, Councillor Cheng, please allow Councillor Thompson to answer yes. your question. Sure, thank you. We don't have the ability to do that this time. It is part of the process that I'm asking Mr. Tanner and staff to do to look at how we structure that. In fact, we heard that clearly from Mr. Tanner yesterday. That's part of the work that he wants to do. So in as much as you've expressed that there is a gap, and I agree that there is, we also heard from Mr. Tanner that identifying those gaps, he has the ability to address that issue. And so we don't need to say, by the way, open the whole system 24 seven, because first of all, we can't do it. Secondly, we know that he has the ability to respond to the need as he sees it. So let the professionals Sorry, do Sorry, I just work. have one more question. Sure. Okay, so last word, question because it's only yep. three minutes. Yep, so the word crisis, uh, I appreciate that you are trying to say we have to work constructively with the province and the federal government. Clearly there needs to be a collaboration across all three levels. Does the word crisis not then bring more urgency to the different levels of government or other, rather than a warm invitation? Uh, no. Okay. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Councillor Carroll, three minutes clarification of the motion. Yes, Madam Speaker, I just want to clarify. I, I hear the questions about why not the crisis declaration? And when I look at the motion you've moved, council calling the provincial government to require large, all munis, large municipalities in Ontario to provide, provide shelter space. I'm wondering if the intent, and maybe you can clarify this for me, it may have been missed when we were doing the hotel uh, item. But one of the things we adopted in committee was the clause asking the provincial government to simply move on the recommendation of their own Auditor General right. to have a homelessness strategy. There is no provincial homelessness strategy at all, and their AG is quite concerned about that. It's so recommendation one. We move that uh, unanimously. Is this to dovetail with that? Because it's very similar, but it, I think it's well placed with warming centers as well. Right. I, I can tell you, Councillor, that through you, Madam Speaker, that when you yeah address the point and raise the issue 
it rung in my ear very loudly. So this is part of that complementary aspect where yes. I didn't specify the Auditor General from the province right. talking about having a strategy uh, provincial-wide. Yes. It is to reflect on investments that are made by the province with respect to other municipalities. There's a need for other areas to have facilities. Let me give you an example right. quickly. And I know you've got yes. more questions. During the summer, uh, in my neighborhood, where there is no shelter in the immediate area, right. there's a gentleman walking in the neighborhood. I was coming from the side of my house. And I saw the gentleman, he saw me, and he asked me for a dollar. And I found that really strange. He was in the work, construction boots and stuff. And I said, what are you doing? Why are you here? He said, well, I'm going to try to sleep on a friend's couch. And I got that. Yeah. So where are you from? He said he came from Quebec. And I asked him, how did he arrive from Quebec to Toronto? He said he had heard that we had all types of programs here that were yeah. amenable to helping people. So he's left Quebec. I've met someone from Sault Ste. Marie and also someone from as close as St. Catharines who have expressed the same thing to right. us. So the more we have here, the more we um, obviously are able to do. So people come, what I'm simply saying that the, the, Toronto is not the only place that homeless, has homelessness. Right. There are other areas in Ontario as well. If you provide the mechanism in those areas, people would want to stay close to their loved ones and getting help with respect to shelter. They come because we have it available here for them. And that's why all major municipalities. Correct. And this is what I'm seeking the in the motion. The crisis is actually provincial and national. It is, not just the city of Toronto. Right. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that clarification. You're welcome. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Malik, uh, three minutes clarification of the motion. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, um, uh, to the, the mover of this amendment, you moved a similar um, a similar amendment at the Board of Health. Can you remind us what happened to that that amendment? I didn't move a similar. I moved the same. It wasn't okay. similar. It's the same. Well, it uh, lost four thank to you for that clarification. Lost, lost, and, and what happened? It lost four to three. We didn't have enough people to vote in support for it. It was defeated. It so lost I, four I, to three. I, yes. Thank you for the clarification around that. You're welcome. Um, my, my questions are very brief because I'm mindful of our time. So I just want to be clear that instead of responding to this crisis, listening to experts and saving lives, your amendment is amounting to us doing absolutely nothing more um, to actually address the serious urgency of the issue that we've heard from literally thousands of people. I just want to be clear that that's what your motion is. On the contrary, actually. I'm actually trying Thank to you. do something. I don't want to try, to try to highlight and try to create a crisis, which, as you've defined it, where we can't do anything about it. We need action. If it's action that you need, you need to support the motions that are here. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Councillor McKelvey, you have a question? Three minutes. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. It's Deputy uh, Mayor. Councillor oh. Councillor Thompson, you just mentioned oh, Deputy Mayor, the need for action. If we want action or we want to do more faster, do we need the help of the provincial and the federal governments? Is that where you're going with this? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Okay, I think that is it for the questions. We will now go to the next speaker, which is Councillor Matlow. Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I I wholeheartedly support the Board of Health's recommendations, and I want to commend Councillor Bravo and her fellow members uh, for uh, supporting. Uh, an effort to ensure that Torontonians who do not have safe access to warm spaces during the cold months in this Canadian city have the ability to do so, to protect their lives and their health. I find Councillor Thompson's motion shameful. And the reason I believe it's shameful is because both it is obtuse to the crisis, to the urgency of this moment that we must meet 
It, 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 it aspires to this possibility that we will be bailed out by the federal or provincial governments, which they have proven not to do for us over and over and over again. We have a multi, multi, hundred million dollar, hundreds of million dollar shortfall in the mayor's budget that is based on assumptions to be balanced, even though the federal and provincial governments have not come to our rescue, have not fulfilled their responsibilities under their purview in our governance framework. And moreover, Councillor Thompson's motion doesn't even address the reality of the recommendations themselves. These recommendations don't prescribe that the city is going to put together some new office or organization or agency or set up rooms in city facilities and have to hire staff. This motion says that we need spaces somewhere with somebody to have predictable access 24 seven in the cold months for people who are out in the cold. The Board of Health's recommendations does not solve the housing crisis. These recommendations do not solve the problem of homelessness. They're trying to do the bare minimum. The bare minimum. How would any of you, Councillor Thompson, myself, any of us feel if a member of our family, someone we knew in our community, someone we care about, found themselves in a situation in life where they were out in the cold and they needed somewhere to be safe and warm when it's minus 14 degrees outside, when it's minus 13 degrees outside. In fact, you can develop hypothermia when it's above freezing. Never mind this arbitrary trigger of minus 15 or hoping that the general manager can scramble the resources at that moment, even though the community may not be aware of their access to somewhere at that moment at some time. That's absurd, that's not a plan. Would you, would you wait for the federal government to come to your child's rescue? Would you wait for the provincial government to come to your siblings' rescue? Would you write a letter saying, oh please, will someone maybe one day, even though you've proven over and over again not to help us, come to the rescue of somebody, your neighbor, somebody in your community who's found themselves out in the cold? No, you wouldn't, because that's not how we behave with each other. We're better than that. Torontonians are better than that. Torontonians care about each other. They support each other. And I just find it so hypocritical and once again shameful that when, when we want to do like a performative action, like find money to, to put police paying them overtime to be in these arbitrary spots on this massive transit system when there's no evidence that they actually prevent crime in that context, that there's no evidence that the city is getting any safer, there's no evidence that we're adequately investing to the root causes of violence in the city, into mental health, into poverty, access to housing, and much more racism. What are we doing? It's amazing. We can just find money when we want to, you know, make up stories like Smart Track or, I mean, we just, we, it's amazing how we just find money for these things. But when we're actually talking about something real, something substantive. 10 seconds. Access for life, safety, and health. Well, let's just write a letter to the feds and province and hope they come to our rescue. That's absurd. Councillor Sachs to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have two motions. Um, the first one is a best efforts clause, so it's an amendment to Ms. Cheng's original motion. Um, in respect of staff's very limited resources, which were clearly described by Mr. Tanner at length yesterday, I don't think it's responsible to order staff to produce the result that they've told us they cannot produce especially given that their staff is already exhausted um, after enormous and continuing efforts. 
At the same time, the unhoused population is desperate, and those who must work with them, ER physicians, judges, the TTC, libraries, they all tell us that they are at the breaking point as well, because desperate people with nowhere else to go are filling up the emergency rooms and the courts and the TTC and the libraries and anywhere else they can go in ways that are materially interfering with the ability of those other services to provide the public services for which they were created. So in this circumstance, I think we can fairly ask staff to do everything they can, but we can't ask them to magically produce the impossible. So I'm moving a motion to amend by adding the words use best efforts to the recommendation uh, for 24-7 warming centers and uh, that's somewhere in the clerk system, I know. The other motion that I have on this item is this. Uh, Mr. Tanner mentioned yesterday, and Mr. Thompson, Councillor Thompson, just mentioned this again, that last week the number of warming spots in downtown Toronto were doubled because a new warming center was opened in my ward at the Cecil Community Center. Now that required cooperation from a lot of people. It also required the people who use that center, the kids programs, the, the choir, the family programs, they all had to give up their space and give up their program during the extreme cold weather so that 30 to 35 desperate people had a place to stay. And that was a trade-off that people were prepared to make. But that happened only in my ward. So I'm, my second motion is to challenge each and every one of my colleagues bring a warming center or respite center to SSHA in time they can be opened this winter. We need places. It isn't just up to staff to do it. We also have a responsibility. I challenge each of you to join me in bringing such a center. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cole to speak. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a motion. I could put it up on the board. Uh, basically, uh, City Council requests Chair of Economic Development, uh, Community Development Committee to reach out uh, to the City of Toronto faith leaders to explore the feasibility of creating partnerships with the Shelter Support and Housing Administration for the purpose of using available space in churches, mosques, gurdwaras temples and synagogues as warming centers. And, and I think uh, the word mayor is missing. I wanted the mayor to join with the chair to sit down with the faith leaders. I don't know if you've ever been to a Gurdwara, but that's the model we should be following, where you can go there, anybody is welcome. You go in there, you get something to eat, you can sleep. Uh, and there's not that many of them in Toronto, but there's certainly a lot in Mississauga, a couple in Etobicoke. And I wish the other faith leaders would follow that lead because we can't, government can't do this by itself. As you can see here today, we're beating each other up, uh, saying that Councillor Thompson didn't do enough, uh, you're disingenuous. You know, this is exactly what the feds and the province want us to do is beat each other up and blame each other. You know, Councillor Thompson has been in the front lines of this for, I don't know, 10 years. He's the one that's made it possible for 9,000 beds to be there. He's been 12 years. And to say, well, dismiss him as uh, this and that. Listen, we may disagree, but by beating up each other and not looking upstream, you know, like right now, as we heard yesterday, 2,700 of the people in our shelter system are refugee claimants, 2,700 and we don't get any money for these 2,700. We welcome the refugees here, but we have no control over our borders. The federal government is in charge of refugee claimants. We need money so we can house them. We don't get that money. Let's not even talk about the provincial government. We still got to talk to, but all their great housing plans, there's not one dollar, it's zero. Zero, in fact, they took out $230 million in development charges for building housing. And then people forget, we've got a very vulnerable population in our TCHC buildings. 
Over 105,000 people sleep there every night, and they're taken care of. Who does that? Not the feds. The province downloaded housing on the city. The only city in Canada that has downloaded housing is us. 105,000 people. If we don't take care of those 105,000 people, because I've heard nobody talk about the work that our staff does in taking care of those 105,000, I appreciate that work. No, they sit here, and uh, Mr. Tanner there was lambasted yesterday. For what? For trying to solve this incredibly difficult problem. And we sometimes get very frustrated with staff, but they're doing the work 24-7. And then it's not just a matter of places. We need people, trained people, not volunteers. Sure, we get the help of volunteers, but you got to have trained staff. It is very delicate, fragile work that's done in our shelters. It's not just buildings and bricks and mortars. It's trained staff. Mr. Tanner says how difficult it is to get trained staff, especially after the heroic work they did during COVID. Nobody here said thank you to those workers that every day they risked their life for two and a half years taking care of our homeless, afraid of con uh, catching COVID. They were there every day, 24-7. Nobody here said thank you for Mr. Tanner and his staff for doing that. So it's about time we start beating up each other, work together to find solutions and not just sort of create things that we can't solve. Let's ensure that people in Toronto too get on the phone and maybe call Ottawa or call Queen's Park, God forbid, and say, hey, listen, there's a housing crisis here. We can't solve it ourselves. We've got to solve it together as a province or as a country. Do you think they have this debate in Ottawa? Never. Debate at Queen's Park? Never. We have to bear the brunt, and by doing this internal bashing, we are not helping the homeless, we're not helping ourselves, and we're not helping the people of Toronto. Thank you. Thank you. No applause. Councillor Ainsley to speak. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I did have a, a motion that I sent to the clerk's table. I don't know if it's uh, ready yet. We were. Kind of back and forth. Uh, Councillor Ainsley, we're not ready with your motion yet. Okay, I'll move my name down the list. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Malik to speak. Thank you very much. Um, during this winter, and we heard yesterday as well, upwards of 100 people are being turned away from central intake because there are no shelter spaces available. And I wanna follow the previous speaker by saying, we are so grateful for SSHA and everyone who is doing their absolute best. And we know that we are in such a challenging situation. And that's why we're here debating this motion right now, because even in this challenging situation, we know that there is more that we can do and we must do. We have a duty in our city to protect each other, especially in harsh and cold weather conditions. It was bitterly cold this weekend. We saw yet again the desperate need for warm spaces and the impact that, that not having that has on our neighbors experiencing homelessness. We've heard it again and again in this chamber over this debate and over this season the city's extreme cold weather alert policy only triggers the opening of emergency warming centers when the temperature dips below negative 15 degrees Celsius. And that forces people to put their health, their lives, and their safety at risk. And studies have shown, Councillor Ainsley raised it with us yesterday, that 72% of hypothermia cases amongst people experiencing homelessness occur when the minimum daily temperature is much higher than negative 15 degrees Celsius. The city's current approach of opening and closing its few 24 seven warming centers based on limited criteria leaves people suffering through rain and snow and the drops in temperature, unsure of where they can go and for ho how long and how to get there. We also heard yesterday, yesterday that before the pandemic, Toronto had 24 seven, <clears throat> excuse me, 
Toronto had 24-7 respite and drop-in spaces where people could walk in anytime and be warm indoors. Today, 24-7 walk-in spaces are no longer available and people are seeking shelter anywhere they can find warmth. We've heard it again and again. TTC, libraries, hospitals, coffee shops. Toronto can and must do more and we can do better for people right now to keep them safe and save lives. We've heard from our residents, I know you have, from the heads of emergency departments, from the Ontario Human Rights Commission, from people who are working day in and day out with those experiencing homelessness, from people experiencing homelessness themselves. We have heard from workers of all kinds, from transit workers, ATU Local 113, from library workers, QP Local 4948. We heard from the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, from Unity Health, from doctors and healthcare workers, from local businesses, from faith groups in every corner of our city, from people raising families here, people who want to see a future in our city, and so many more, thousands more, tens of thousands, I know. Torontonians from all walks of life are counting on us today. Anyone who needs a space to be warm shouldn't be turned away. We need 24-7 indoor spaces with walk-in access and livable conditions. And of course, the city must address the housing crisis with the urgency it requires and ensure housing is a human right. And we need to ensure that we have warming spaces right now that are open when people need them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Morley to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, to my colleagues, um, Team Toronto, uh, this is something that's really important to me. I had the very great pleasure of leading the vaccine engagement team in South and Central Etobicoke when we were in a crisis, when we were experiencing a pandemic. And I was so heartened to see how we came together as a city at all levels of government and how we were able to do the hard work of knocking on the doors of the most vulnerable and convincing them that vaccine was an important path forward to getting out of that crisis. And we did that work together, not with identifying challenges and problems, not with taking it personally as an affront to the work that you've done or, you ha or whatever else, but by looking very squarely in the face of our challenges, leaning on each other and being bold in declaring the needs that we had. This, in my opinion, is another one of those opportunities for us to do better. No one is standing today and suggesting that great work has not happened, that there aren't important protections and social supports already part of our system. There are, but we've heard as well that this is the most unequal city I don't remember the stat, but I'm sure in North America um, and, and potentially in the world. And that is largely an outcome of how our systems do or do not work. And so in my experience, growing up low income, not having a lot of resources, when I had problems, I didn't have the luxury of looking to other people to solve those problems or to come forward with the resources that were required. It was incumbent on me to face my challenges and to work through them with the resources that I had available to me. And I do wanna thank our Shelter Support and Housing Administration team again, once again, for the heroic efforts that they are doing. Torontonians are appreciative of these efforts. But what I think is not acceptable is for us to turn our backs on Torontonians who need us. We're on the front lines. And we've heard from my colleague, no, Making a motion to request more resources from the province or federal government is not going to result in that outcome. So I do agree to say that, unfortunately, this amendment feels like uh, uh, us not taking on the responsibilities that I believe we have. And I would look to my colleagues who've been in this chamber for 10, 15, 20 years doing this important work and work with us newbies uh, who are obviously passionate in this area. We want to learn from you. We want to contribute here and we can do better than what we're doing currently. So those are my comments. I hope um, that we can all come together uh, with the understanding that Torontonians depend on us and we do have the capacity to serve them. We are doing that work, but there's always more to be done. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. No applause.
Councillor Myers to speak. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, I just want to echo the colleague, uh, the comments of my colleagues, Councillor Cole and Councillor Morley, that we should really be Team Toronto and we should not um, delve into any types of uh, personal attacks or impugning anyone's motivations behind their motions. Uh, obviously, this is an issue that arises a lot of passion in people, and that's good that we have a strong and healthy discussion about this because it is an important topic. And like many people in this city, it, it's really sad to see the level of homelessness in this city that has truly reached a crisis. Um, I tell my staff this all the time. You know, one day I was coming to work and I was going up the Queen Street um, from the subway car into the Eaton Centre and on the stair was a gentleman who was using, putting a needle in his leg and security guard was just watching him. And for me growing up in this city, that 20 years ago that was unimaginable in Toronto. But unfortunately that is more and more the reality of where we are as a city. Um, regarding the two motions uh, from Councillor Thompson and the motion from the Board of Health, I don't necessarily see them as um, competing with one another. And I actually think with the uh, amendment offered by Councillor Sachs uh, to use our best efforts to provide 24-7 indoor warming locations, I think they're actually, they can work together. I just spoke to uh, Gord Tanner. Um, at the shelter, um, for sh from shelters, and he says that there is not enough staff to actually run 24-7 indoor warming locations across the city. Um, maybe if they work um, with their partners and their community partners, they can open one, which I think would be a step in the right direction, but we also have to be cognizant of the fact that there are just not enough people to actually run 24-7 indoor warming centers across the city. And I think we have to accept that reality, um, no matter our best efforts. And I think if we add in Councillor Sachs' very helpful motion to put that amendments of using our best efforts, both of these amendments could make a good um, impact in sort of helping us to resolve the crisis that we're in. So thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Bravo to speak. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I'm going to support uh, the, um, the motions from Councillor Chang and Councillor Sachs. Unfortunately, I think Councillor Thompson's motion negates what we uh, moved at Board of Health, and I, I stand by what we brought here as advice to the City Council. There's a lot of things that we can agree on right now. We can agree that a permanent home is the long-term solution. We can agree that it should be affordable and in a lot of cases uh, supportive. We can agree that the op opioid and addictions crisis and the mental health crisis are, are health issues that need to be resolved with help of the provincial government. And of course, we can agree that the city does make crucial investments and that city staff, the public service, works hard and does exemplary work. I think that what's different now is, is the nature of the homelessness that we're seeing, the, the scope of it, uh, the numbers of people, uh, the, the numbers of people who are working full time and just are getting evicted because they can't afford their rent. This is a situation that we haven't seen in this city before and we need to act like it. You know, we've got 18,000 people who are identified as not uh, having a home, about 10,000 people sleeping on the street, and I think that the strategy of opening and closing these, uh, these getting inside centers, I don't want to, doesn't matter what you call them, is confusing to people. And we heard that, and we heard that in questions, and we've heard that from the community. And there is a cost. There's a cost that we pay when we see that people who are homeless are sheltering in transit and in libraries and, and in, the, in the foyers of buildings. And there's a cost to the homeless person, hypothermia. Uh, loss of, of, of a hand, of toes, uh, death. That's a, high, a, high, a very high cost to, to bear. And also we know that being homeless, being on the street, not having a roof over your head creates an incredible amount of tension and makes people more sick. It makes people mentally ill. We've heard that from experts. 
And yes, we can agree that the provincial government has a huge responsibility, that it doesn't pay its bills in relation to social services. And yes, we can agree to go back a little bit further that the download that was done by the provincial government at amalgamation has been destructive for the city's finances and for the situation of housing in this city. And yes, we can go back even further and say that that the Paul Martin budget in the 1990s, early 90s, when the federal government got out of investing in, a, in, a, in the construction of affordable housing has been devastating for the city of Toronto and for the whole region and the country. But even though we didn't make this crisis in Toronto, it's come to our doorsteps and we have to do something about it. And, and I think that it's not, it's not just about listening to somebody like me or, or any councillor here. It's about listening to so many people. You know, uh, 10,300 people signed a petition. We're talking about the deputations that we heard at ECDC and Board of Health. We're talking, in my ward, small business people, uh, residents associations are telling me to fight like hell for this because they don't want to live in a city where they have to walk over people to get into their business or walk over people uh, to get to where they're going. Um, we heard from transit workers, from library workers. These are also public servants that we need to value and who are on the front line. And of course, we've heard from uh, the 79 department heads and doctors from hospitals, including Sunnybrook, Mount Sinai, Michael Guerin, UHN, uh, uh, CAMH, and Unity Health, who signed an open letter at urging us to act. And we also heard from the Ontario Human Rights Commission, which I think shows that the bar has been raised for us. This is a systemic problem that's regional, it's provincial, but we have a responsibility to act. If we can't go to the provincial and federal governments and say, hey, get on this, if we don't escalate our action and treat this thing like the crisis that it truly is, we have to name it. If you don't name something, you don't action it, you don't solve it. We have to give direction and support to our staff to say, this is what we value. This is what we value in this chamber and what our residents say that they value. And I think it's the fiscally prudent choice because we pay in other ways. It costs about 100 million to police homelessness. We're investing so much in enforcement and we know that if we get people inside, they can get support. We can value their humanity. We can respect their humanity and treat this idea that everybody should be inside as a human right. And of course, we have so many important community-based partners who will come to our aid, I'm sure. If we say that we want to treat this like the urgency that it is, I hope that, I hope that this isn't partisan. It's not a political situation. It's a human situation. Five seconds. And I hope that uh, some, of, some of my uh, colleagues will see it in their hearts uh, to support this Board of Health motion and the amendments that make it even more powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I can ask members of council and, uh, to try to keep it down because it's very difficult to hear the speakers, but I, I think that we're having problems with the uh, mics because um, it's difficult to hear. Um, what I'm going to maybe suggest until we get it repaired, because I don't know really what's wrong with it because they're not working properly. I mean, it's hard to hear. Um, maybe if you sat, when you spoke, you sit down, so this way you're closer to the mic, that might help because it's really hard to, spe uh, to hear anyone speaking until we get it repaired because there is, a, there is an issue with them, okay? Just till we get it repaired. Um, so I'm going to, Councillor Ainsley's motion is ready now, so we're going to go to Councillor Ainsley. Can you hear me okay, Madam Speaker? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I do have a motion that I would like to move. I could have it put up on the screen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to move a motion that City Council declare a public health crisis in the City of Toronto based on the lack of adequate 24-hour drop-in and respite indoor spaces and call for the provision of safe, accessible 24-hour respite spaces, which are accessible through walk-in uh, access. So I've taken um, the original Board of Health motion and I fine-tuned it a bit. Um, I've heard some uh, comments that um, outright blaming the other provincial and federal government for lack of action um, is a concern for, for some councillors. So I've taken that reference out. Um, I do think it's important though 
that we have the term uh, crisis in the conversation and it needs to stay in the conversation. You know, the number of times that I've talked with uh, MPs and MPPs, in particular in Scarborough, um, we recently uh, had a, a, a homeless shelter built in my ward. Uh, when we, um, when I heard from residents and we discussed why there was a shelter going in the ward, um, time and again, the word crisis uh, came up, whether you want to refer to it as a homeless crisis, uh, housing affordability crisis. I think that the word crisis has to stay on the table. And, you know, over the past uh, few weeks, uh, months, a number of variables have come to the forefront. You know, two years in a row now, we've had over 100 people that have been in our shelters have died within our shelter system. Uh, to me, that is a crisis. Um, you know, uh, last week I was in Union Station. Um, I go through there every day. I see more and more people sleeping in Union Station. The other day I had to get uh, to the instant teller. I needed money. To get to the instant teller, there was a man sleeping on the floor beside the homeless shell, beside the ATM. The security guard came along um, and told him to go sleep on the TTC. I think, you know, there's a disconnect um, between departments and agencies. And I was reading an article the other day um, on New York City and how they were dealing with homelessness. And one of their advocates, he defined homelessness as a prism held up to society. And what we see refracted are the weaknesses, not only in our healthcare system, our public health system, our housing system, especially our welfare system, our educational system, and our legal system, our correction systems. He said, if we're gonna fix this problem, we have to work together to fix the, fix the weaknesses of all of those sectors. And I think, you know, it's not only a municipal issue, it's a provincial, it's a federal government issue. Uh, but once again, I think to have an adequate and a proper amount of attention paid to what's going on um, in the homelessness uh, situation, not only in Toronto, but I think right across this country, as the largest city in Canada, we need to identify it as a crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you. We do have a question for you, Councillor Matlow. Three minutes, just a sec. Three minutes clarification of the motion. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, Councillor Ainsley, uh, if I can clarify your motion along with the Board of Health recommendation, whether it be a uh, respite or warming center, Neither are prescribing that it must be, because there's a narrative going around this chamber today that somehow either yours or the Board of, Rec Board of Health's recommendations would prescribe immediate hiring of staff or, or immediate city resources any, in any substantive way that could not be done. But your, your amendment along with the Board of Health recommendations could also foresee working with uh, the, the drop-in network, um, out of the cold, um, other you know faith leaders like you're not you're not prescribing one way or another you're just saying this is what we need to do so sorry councilor Matlow I missed the last part you're you're Maybe not your prescribe you're not prescribing exactly how we are doing it this could you could envision uh, working with with partners like uh, the Toronto drop-in network and out of the cold and 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 churches and synagogues like that's what that is a, an option is, is it not uh, in, in what you're driving yeah at? I you know I'm I'm supportive of some of the motions that have gone before us today like I'll make reference to Councillor Cole's motion looking at the churches um, and the the mosques the synagogues um, you know anybody and everybody that can come to the table you know I'm my wards in Eastern Scarborough I can point to you know, the East Scarborough storefront. Um, um, as I said, I have a shelter in my ward now. Um, I had, um, when I was first elected, we actually had a council that represented every ward in my church um, because we were using a high number of motels 
along Kingston Road for temporary shelters, uh, the family residence that's in my ward. I don't think anybody wants to be living in a motel. Um, but we had a council of all the churches that came together to bring community resources to bear to see how we could get those people out of shelters and the family residence and into a, um, proper living arrangements. So uh, uh, just to clarify, and thank you for that answer, uh, if there's a narrative going around this chamber or being driven toward the public that either the Board of Health recommendations or your amendment could not happen because we don't have staff available, you would describe that narrative as false and untrue and not a fair description of what you are uh, proposing nor what the Board of Health is recommending. Last question. Yeah, I, I think one of the difficulties, uh, Councillor Matlow, is you know you look at the amount of money that we need to spend. Um, yesterday, you know, um, eight thousand dollars a month to to house fifty people, and you know, um, Mr. Tanner explained that the the amazing work that his people are doing. But we need other organizations to come to the table, including the provincial and federal government. Thank you, Councillor Holliday clarification of the motion uh, oh, there you go thank you speaker through you to councillor Ainsley is a really serious question um, can you define to me the problem you're trying to solve with your motion just articulate it for me yeah so so one of the the difficulties that I have uh, councillor holiday and I'm sh and I'm sure we all have is that uh, you know, we've been having this discussion around homelessness as as long as I can remember. I've been a councillor proudly uh, since 2006. When I go to my MPPs, my MP, you know, in Scarborough, I'm on the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. When I talk with MPs, um, you know, we seem to get into the, the same conversation. And, you know, I think we need to ramp it up. And I think, you know, as I identified earlier, having... 100 people in two years in a row die in our shelters, uh, you know, to me that's a crisis. And I think we, you know, we need that terminology in place um, to get other levels of government to listen to us, um, to get um, community organizations to listen to us. When my residents, and I'm sure residents in your ward as well, when they're seeing somebody sleeping on the street or, you know, so, so looking your, at somebody goal, in the subway, no more... that's a crisis. Is your goal to be no more deaths or no more people sleeping on the street? Like, why not just say that, say how you'll measure it, and ask the staff to come up with a plan instead of prescribing something? Like, why not define the problem we're trying to solve and, and send them to it? We've well, got the experts right here. This is so pretty. Yeah, so, so Councillor, I think in this report, we, we've, uh, told, we've told staff to come up with a plan, to define a plan. We've asked them. To come back, you look at Councillor Thompson's motion to come back and um, look at the options for warming centers. But I think, you know, for that plan to work, we have to call it what it is. And we have to call it what, you know, my residents are calling it. And that's a crisis. And so you think that this somehow defines the issue and, and somehow advances in that? Or is it the plan that solves it? I, I think it helps, uh, for lack of a better word, I think it helps put meat on the bone. Uh, okay. And it brings, it helps focus what we're trying to do. That, you know, we have people dying on our streets. We have people, I'm on the library board, the TTC board. Um, there's people sleeping on our subway, on our buses, our libraries. Um, you know, the staff that work in those facilities. They're not trained to, to deal with homeless people. I think we need to um, find the focus that we can deal with a homeless crisis, a housing crisis, whatever you want to call it. But first, and to me, it's a crisis. Thank you. Councillor Carroll, three minutes clarification of the motion. I, I'm afraid my, my questions of clarification follow on Councillor Holliday's, and it's not because I'm trying to give the mover of the motion a hard time. I, I, cause I don't disagree, Madam Speaker, but 
it, it, the crisis motion here and the crisis motion I've seen before both seem to want to assign a solution and also assign blame. And the word homeless isn't in this motion. I'm wondering if if the the mover would consider simply declaring homelessness in the city of Toronto a crisis. And then all the other motions we get we get at the solutions. We get at what staff have described they're doing and 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 what we are moving and the and the motion could simply read that we declare homelessness in the city of Toronto a crisis as you've just answered councillor holiday would that be a friendly amendment well i i think councillor carroll if you want to call homelessness a public health crisis i'm fine with that amendment so could we could we simply reduce it to its essence because on that I think there is no one in this room elected official or staff who disagrees yeah. or the people in the gallery that city council declared yeah and I, and I think I just agreed with you I just period. agreed with you councillor you asked if we could insert the word homelessness into my motion and I just agreed that we just agreed with you that we could and so the, the phrase the crisis is there because of a lack of 24-hour drop in stairs. Da, 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 da. Could we save that to be addressed in the other motions and in the other actions of staff? So I, I'm agreeable, Councillor, uh, to a friendly amendment. If you want to put homelessness as a public health crisis, I'm fine with that. So that your motion would now read, moved by Councillor Ainsley, that City Council declare that homelessness in the City of Toronto is a public health crisis. End of motion. No, that's not what I said. Thank you. you uh, that's the if, answer I was looking for, so it would not be a friendly amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Madam Chair. Okay, if I... Thank you. Fine. Councillor Pasternak, three minutes clarification of the motion. <laughs> I'm not sure whether to, to, to stand or sit. Um, through you, just a couple of questions of, of clarification. The, the closest I could find to a statutory um, reinforcement of your motion is the Emergency Response and Civil Protection Act. Now, I don't, I'm not advocating we, we ask for that. But I notice it's, it's not there. And the, and the word crisis can be kind of moved all over the place. I mean, we, had, we just came out of a public health crisis. You don't seem to be... Um, reinforcing your comments with any any request from the other levels of government for any kind of statutory backing and and the financial resources that that come with it uh, on this, do you do you think we're we're not quite there yet, or or we're, our 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 statement should just stay as as a general crisis and let let people define it as they see fit. Yeah, uh, so Councillor, I'm not, I'm not really trying to embed anything in law. I'm trying to um, bring some focus to the conversation. You know, no offense, but um, if I was just talking with MPs or MPPs or even my residents and I started talking about, you know, as you made reference to the Emergency sorry, Services Act, um, I think I would lose them. I said, I think that if, you know, I start talking about a crisis because you know, I saw a man with all of his worldly possessions with us tucked into a sleeping bag on the subway. Um, people understand that. Um, if you're trying to drive home at night and you pull up to the intersection um, along Kingston Road and almost every intersection has somebody standing there that's going to come up and knock on your window and ask for change, um, to me that's a crisis having people sleeping in our libraries in the Grand Hall at Union Station, to me, to me and to many people, that's a crisis. Do you think it has the strength we need when we declare so many things a crisis? Well, um, if you wanted to declare public health, homelessness in Toronto a crisis, um, I think that's very appropriate. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Prime, am I done, Madam Speaker? I'm, I'm sitting, but. No, you're not. Councillor Perks has a question. All right. Uh, Thank just, you. Just one sec. Okay, Councillor Perks, three minutes. Speaker, before you start my time, I, I have a point of order. Before point you start my time, I have a point of order. Thank you. Um, before I ask questions of the, of the mover, I need some procedural clarity. The substance of Councillor Ainsley's motion is pretty much identical to recommendation number one from the Board of Health. We have a motion on the floor from Councillor Thompson to delete recommendation one and recommendation two. In the event that the, Councillor Thompson's motion passes and then Councillor Ainsley's motion is in front of us, aren't we voting on the same proposition twice? Well, I think it would be redundant, wouldn't it? Or is Councillor Ainsley's oh. motion just redundant oh. in the first place? I just need to understand that before I ask oh. questions. Well, okay. I. The staff need a few minutes, uh, Councillor okay, Perks. Well, so do you have a question to Councillor No, I, I, I don't know what question no, to ask I know, until I get No, I know, but we don't have the answer for you right now. Then I guess if you I want to ask the same question yeah. to me, Councillor Perks, yeah. I'm more than happy to answer it. No, it's not a question I'm asking of you. You're not the clerk. Okay, we'll get back to you. Councillor Perks to speak. Well, we don't have the answer, Councillor Perks. Okay, you're the last. You're the last speaker, Councillor Perks. So you want us just to stop council until you have an opportunity to ask a question? Well. Well, we've already finished uh, that uh, list. Count your Mayor Tory, did you? Yeah. I think Councillor Perks' uh, suggestion is quite fair. I mean, whether he's last or first on the question list, he says he needs some procedural advice before he asks his questions. And I was just going to suggest if the staff need a bit of time to give that advice to you or to him, uh, that we take 10 minutes. Uh, hopefully that would allow time, and then he can get on with his questions or not. But I just think, I think his request is fair. Um, it, it just so happens he's the last person we can't do somebody else while he's waiting, and he happens to be the last questioner. Yeah. So I just think rather than sit here, we could take 10 minutes, uh, or, or maybe get advice that the staff can offer well, that advice, or you, or you can sooner. Yeah. Uh, take 10 minutes, and, and then uh, he can get his advice. Actually, uh, Councillor Prutza just put his name down to speak. So, Councillor Prutza, do you want to go and speak? Councillor Prutza. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to speak after first, sure. Pardon? I, I think, Speaker, isn't the question that Councillor Perks wants to ask questions or not, depending on the advice he yeah. gets? So we can't move on to speakers unless you're prepared to go back to questions. But Okay. Uh, Councillor Prutza, did you put your name down to ask a question or to speak? would like to speak, but I also want to hear all the... the, the okay, questions. okay, so thank, you. Him, right? thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, we do have uh, Councillor Perks advice from the clerk that uh, in fact um, it is similar, right? So I would have to rule the, the motion out of order. Yes. Okay, just one sec, Councillor Perks. We'll continue with your questions. No, no, there's no questions of it. You've oh, ruled no it out questions? of order. Okay. <laughs> 
So okay. I'm challenging the chair. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to. Can, oh, I didn't hear that. Councillor Ainsley is Speaker, challenging I'm, the chair. I'm challenging the chair. Okay, Councillor Ainsley is challenging the chair. If members of council can take your seats. Yes, Mayor Torrey. Okay, on a, just on a point of order, I think there'd be a lot of people in the room, perhaps including me, that wouldn't be clear on, on you know, what the ruling is so that when we vote to, chat, to uphold you or not, that we're uh, clear on what that is about. Just right. if somebody could go through what the question was that was posed by Councillor uh, Perks and what the answer was, just so everybody's clear. Okay, so for members of council, so Councillor Perks did ask the question on Councillor Ainsley's motion so to... um, and uh, Councillor Thompson's motion. Um, so what I have uh, ruled is that Councillor Ainsley's motion is similar, so it would be redundant. And so I'm ruling Councillor Ainsley's motion out of order. Uh, Councillor Ainsley is challenging the chair, so we'll be voting on to upholding the chair. A point of order, Councillor Thompson. Uh, I just wanted to really, it to be clear. So you're suggesting that Councillor Ainsley's motion is similar to the motion that came from the Board of Health, is right. that correct? And you're ruling his out of order because of that similarity. Right. And so you have been challenged. So it is to uphold the chair by voting yes or not to uphold the chair by voting no, but to vote yes to uphold the chair if you want to uphold the chair. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, recorded vote. The motion to uphold the chair's ruling carries 24 to 2. Thank you. Okay, before we go to the next speaker, um, Councillor Pasternak, you would just like to make an announcement on who's in the council chambers. You have a classroom. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is both an honor and a pleasure to welcome to our council chamber uh, the Afrocentric Alternative School. Uh, along with uh, teachers, I think it's a Mrs. Wheeler and a Mr. Tawani. Thank you so much uh, for coming. Um, very, it's it's a remarkable it's a remarkable school, and one of the only good things when we expanded our wards was the school was once again in the ward that I represented. 
And it, it originated from a community request back in 2007. And then in September 2008, a report came to the TDSB called Improving Success for Black Students. And by 2009, uh, it, was, uh, it was established in the, in the ward I represented as a school board trustee at the time, although um, uh, enrollment has fluctuated over, over the years. It opened full and with a waiting list and is now a K-date school. I've gone to many other graduations and it is truly a, a remarkable group of students and parents uh, who have made this school the great success that it is. So thank you so much for coming to City Hall. I'm gonna come up and say hello. Thank, thank you, Councillor Pasternak. Thank you. So, Councillor Fletcher? Yes, I'm arising on a point of order, Speaker, point of personal privilege. I was in my office and heard uh, Councillor Cole, I believe, speak about me, that somehow I was admonishing uh, Councillor Thompson and putting him down in some way. Councillor Thompson, if you took it that way, I'm very sorry. I don't know if you spoke to Councillor Cole. I'm very interested in how councillors are handling the homelessness crisis across our city, and particularly in Scarborough. We've heard from Councillor Thompson. We also heard from Councillor Ainsley about people collecting money at intersections. I think that's relatively new. Uh, just doing my due diligence, so I really do take exception to Councillor Cole's little carry on there earlier, Madam Speaker, and I wanted to say this to the Chamber. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councillor Perks to Councillor Peruzzo to speak. What? You're looking for me? I, but I thought he, I thought he was going. Huh? You? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't going to say very much on this uh, because I, we've we've had you know sort of a, a number of conversations down the road on this particular issue, and um, I suspect that uh, that folks are are tired of of listening to me on this particular subject. But, uh, Speaker, it is absolutely unacceptable when uh, folks trying to you know we have we have winter here in this country and sometimes our winter get becomes real real cold and in my view it's unacceptable when somebody who wants to come out of that cold has to seek refuge on buses subways uh, emergency wards, uh, stairwells, because we don't have a system that is able to deal with that, that is able to deal with someone who essentially wants to come out of the cold. I believe that that's absolutely unacceptable. Do these motions that we have in front of us today from uh, various councillors Will that do that? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I, don't, I, for one, don't believe that we have a system nimble enough to, to be able to respond to that. I don't believe that. I don't know. What, I don't know what this will do, whether it will open it up and then all of a sudden lo and behold, people will have places to go. Or whether we will be back here a month from now uh, and our staff telling us, hey, listen, this is, this is you know, what we think we can do. And this is what we think, uh, this is how we believe we might be able to move forward. Here's what I do know. I know that we are currently, we have a system that is completely unsustainable completely unsustainable. You're talking about fast growing budget areas in our budgets. The hotel shelter system, when you round that up in round numbers, is around $114,000 a client per year. When you round out the entire system, you're at about $80,000 per 
client per year. That kind of money, and we're here in an acrimonious exercise talking about people sheltering themselves on buses and in stairwells and in emergency rooms. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing for all of us. So, if the collective motions in front of us force our staff to go away and think about what it is that we're doing here and develop a more sustainable plan where we can shelter people, everyone who needs shelter, then I'm happy to support it all. I get it. I, I've been around long enough to know that, in part, these motions throw our staff under the bus. They do. They pick them up and say, here you go, under the bus you go. But you know what? If under the bus gets us to thinking about how we do this better, then I'm happy to, you know, lend my hand to, you know, to that activity. Ten seconds. Oh, thank you. Councillor Moyes to speak. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> uh, please forgive me. I'm not 100% today, so I'll try to gather my thoughts the best I can. So I just want to start by saying thank you to SSHA for all the work that they do and have continued to do. Um, you know, Councillor Cole said it best, you know, that there's people working in the trenches every day, uh, supporting people in TCAC, I think 105,000 people. Uh, this year we'll support 9,000 people in the shelter system across the city. I can say to you that over the last 20 plus years, 22 to be exact, I worked in the healthcare field and working with people who are suffering from addictions to mental health and underhoused. I have spent days in our shelter system, you know, working in, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? different shelters. You know, I've worked at um, the Gersten Center, spent some time there, uh, shadowing the work that they do. I've spent days at Seton House, working with the staff there, and seeing how hard the work is. And honestly, these people deserve a medal for the work that they do. So, you know, I know firsthand how hard the work is. And living in Toronto Center and representing Toronto Center, I, I have seen over the last three years how the city has changed and in that there's so many people on the streets of Toronto in every corner you know every street corner if you walk by young Dundas if you walk over at young and um, Queen uh, any vacant business there's a homeless person sitting uh, in front of the vacant uh, storefront so I see it every day, and I know how difficult it has been. And, you know, the work predates me here. It predates, I know there's seven new councillors in this chamber, but the work has predated us. And many councillors before us, in my predecessors, for example, at Public Health, you know, Joe Cressy and Joe Mehevic, you know, have, have tackled this as well, the best that they could, and even before them. So, there's no one magic bullet, I understand that. And I think, you know, we're all trying to do the best that we can, you know, in the best way that we believe that we can actually make a difference. Be it the amendments that's brought forth from Toronto Public Health, or I'm even gonna say even the amendment that Councillor Thompson has brought forth as well. Like, you know, he's doing the best that he can in, in, in that sense. But I have to say that, um, what we're doing here is not sustainable. You know, we cannot go cap in hand to the province and the federal government every time and every year uh, because they're not coming to our rescue. We spoke about this yesterday when we spoke about uh, different revenue tools. And so really that encapsulates some of the things that we're talking about here today. There is no easy path forward. But I just wanted to add that um, 
I will be supporting the motion being brought forth by Toronto Public Health. I think it's, uh, it's reasonable um, and it is compassionate and it's thoughtful, and I hope that uh, that is supported. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Perks to speak. Let's remember what we do here. Our job is to represent the people of Toronto in making decisions about how we govern ourselves. I do not believe there is a single person in Toronto who would disagree with the idea that the government of Toronto should do everything that can to give people a safe and warm space to be during the day and somewhere to sleep at night. Every Torontonian agrees with that. And we are here to turn that into action. That's our job. It's very simple. You have two options in front of you. There's the option that comes from the Board of Health with some helpful amendments from Councillors Chang and Sachs. And then there's the option that Councillor Thompson is putting in front of you. I characterize those options this way. The Board of Health recommendations with the amendments tell city staff, do everything you can to make sure that right starting now, we make every effort we can to make sure that everyone in Toronto has a warm and safe space to be and somewhere to sleep at night. That's what those motions say. Councillor Thompson's motions say something different. They say, don't do those things. Instead, wait for a report in April and ask the other governments to do more. Now, I don't object to asking the other governments to do more. I, <laughs> you've heard me here over and over again, like the mayor, like all members of council, pointing out that the provincial government has walked away from their responsibilities in providing housing supports, in providing housing, that the federal government's housing plan is inadequate and that the city of Toronto has been left adrift without adequate revenues to pay for the services that we have to deliver. But we are the last line of defense. And in a moment like this, when everyone we represent is asking us to do everything possible, that's what we do. And what is possible? Let's take a moment to think about that. Not long ago, we were getting calls and because people were concerned about whether the transit system is safe. And the mayor went to the you know, police headquarters and stood up and said, as of today, we, we are going to put additional police officers onto the TTC. And he was asked, how are you going to pay for that? And he said, it doesn't matter. We will figure it out. We will just get it done. And we heard from the city manager that, you know, in that case, they, they aren't, we aren't being told to have a specific offset in our budget, but that the TTC and police will figure it out from within their resources. So when we need to, we can just tell staff, go make your best effort. Similarly, we've been through a pandemic. March 2020, pandemic hit. Our staff told us the shelter system is no longer safe because we can't socially distance. And we told them, go out and make your best effort. New sites were added. We went and leased hotels. We built infrastructure into the Better Living Center so that there would be additional places. We kept adding and adding and adding because it was a crisis and people were dying and we had to act. That's what we can do when we choose to. Yes, it will be difficult. Yes, our staff are being stressed and they've been stressed before and, and God bless them for what they do. But everyone in Toronto is expecting us to make best efforts. So let's look at what the Board of Health has said. The Board of Health has two recommendations. One, call on city staff to do everything they can to provide adequate shelter or adequate uh, warming centers. And the second, with Councillor Sachs' uh, amendment, which I commend to you, says to make best efforts to have a 24-7 drop-in network. Call on staff, make best efforts. That is what Torontonians want us to do. 
Torontonians do not want us to do what Councillor Thompson is recommending, which is to delete that word, to not call on staff to, to do this, to not make best efforts, but instead put everything in a report that goes in April and ask somebody else to solve the problem. Anyone who votes for Councillor Thompson's motion will not be representing Torontonians. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher to speak. Thank you, a Speaker. I will be supporting the motions from the Board of Health. And I also just want to add, before I start, to add my voice to um, those that have said thank you to our city staff. I think Councillor Perch said, God bless them. Day in and day out throughout the entire pandemic, our folks have been working so, so hard. So thank you. And then there are so many others in our city, our faith groups, our agencies, our groups, our nonprofit organizations that have gone the distance, that have gone 24 seven to try to deal with what they also are feeling so strongly about, which is those who are unhoused in the city of Toronto. So we do need to recognize them every time we speak about this, it is, one of the hardest jobs, if not the hardest job, that our staff and our nonprofits do. But they do it because they're very committed people. I'm supporting this motion because I think it's time to just, sometimes when these things happen, we turn our chairs in and we think, well, we have to do this, we can't do that. It's the turn the chairs out, almost in the same way as the mayor said, I want to have a national mental health uh, advisory meeting that those chairs, turn them out, and why? When we're talking about this, uh, we can't forget, how did our ranks swell to such a degree? Yes, there are refugees coming, and yes, the federal government has a role, and yes, we need to be, pho we need to be phoning our MPs, and yes, we need to be putting that pressure on. Somehow, there's a free pass for other elected members of government. How is that, that they get a free pass? They shouldn't have a free pass. Nobody has a free pass. We don't use a free pass. They're using it. That's a problem for us. And let's be real about it. We don't put enough pressure to say, pony up, 2,500. And I think that's our job. But really and truly, when we look at the number of rent evictions, the number of people that can't pay their rent, the number of business failures, we thought that was in the pandemic. I'm sorry. This is the rollout and the echo and the earthquake has many shock waves after. These are the shock waves of the pandemic. There was just recently a story about a guy who lost his job, lost his apartment in Ottawa, lost his job, came to Toronto, lived in and out of our respites and shelters for a month until he found an apartment and, as he said, got my identity back because that is what happens, as we know, Mr. Tanner, when people go for a long time not living, uh, or living on the street or living in a tent or living in a shelter, they start to lose who they are within the system because they do not have any of those relationships. And I think our previous Deputy Mayor, Anna Bailao, at the Dufferin Grove, we call it the Dufferin Grove model, that's where folks went into that park and who are you? What do you have? Well, I don't have a health card. Well, I don't have this, I don't have that because there are now folks that are lost within the system. So every time we talk about housing, let's not forget the Residential Tenancies Act, the raise in, in rents that's happening everywhere, the scandalous raise in rents, and the refusal of some levels of government to deal with that because that adds to our crisis of homelessness. Yeah. And if I were to say to you that the city of Perry Sound, the whole city of Perry Sound has a population that's the same as the number of homeless people in Toronto. Would you call that a crisis? I would. If you were to say the town of Renfrew has less people living in it than the number of unhoused people in the city of Toronto, would you call that a crisis? I would. So we need to nest this where it is. Why are we getting such incredible numbers who is there? Thank you to staff for all you're doing. 
What more can we do? What about those other members of government? Not just the federal government, and the, the members of government. What are they doing? And remember, we have enough people here that we could put a second Perry Sound beside the original Perry Sound. And that, my friends, is a crisis. Thank you. Councillor Holliday to speak. Thank you, Speaker. I've felt this conversation has been so troubling on so many levels. Uh, Councillor Peruzza made a comment he said, you know, we're throwing staff under the bus. You know, I felt the same way as I read all of this material and listened to the dialogue. And, you know, it started when I was questioning Councillor Cheng last night at the beginning of this debate. And, you know, her response were saying, well, I, I hear from these people and these individuals are telling me this. I don't know, I, I have a tremendous respect and trust of, of our public service. And in particular, Mr. Tanner and his team, and I can... I won't use my time here, but I can tell you stories of phone conversations that I've had on really sensitive issues. And they are the most human of humans. They do their work because they have a passion for other people, especially those people that are in need. You know, EC 1.9 is available online, and you know, it's part of the, the larger discussion around our policy. And committee decision number two says, they directed the general manager, shelter support, housing administration to continue to use their discretion that takes into account all weather conditions when it comes to opening warming centers, not solely predicated on emergency cold weather alert being issued while this report is being prepared. And I think that strikes at something that I think we all know is that it's not if then, it's a discretion that's applied, and it's applied by people that really understand the shelter system and all of its moving parts. You know, there's shelters, there's 24 respite centers, there's warming centers, there's extensions beyond that in different programs that are used to serve people that are in need, and frankly match what it is the people are seeking. Because we know it's not one size fits all in how we treat vulnerable people. But I'm so concerned that clever counselors have smarter ideas than, than our public service. And that, you know, magically there's this secret answer, you know, open this up for these number of days and suddenly this is all going to be solved. I trust our public service. If they were coming to us saying, look, we, you know, we ran out of money and we're really worried, you know, we'd like to be able to do this, this, and this, they'd come. I trust that they will. But it's the other way around. Instead of trying to define the issue that we're trying to solve, we run straight to the answer. And then it's made, of course, into a political fight at council for larger reasons. You know, my, my vote and the way that I vote in this process goes to trusting what it is the advice, excuse me, trusting the advice, what advice is brought before us by people that truly know the system and people that I truly trust are passionate and fair and human about what is required. I hope members of council will think about that and the implication of what your vote means to how you trust Toronto's public service and the services they offer to the most vulnerable people in this city. Thank you. Okay. Just one moment, Councillor Fletcher. Point of order, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, I'd like Councillor, uh, I don't want him to qualify, but I think saying that anyone who votes for a motion that says this is a homelessness crisis and to deal with it is not impugning staff. And I think that that was, a, a, you, need, you need to ask him to withdraw that. Thank you. That is not anywhere there. And I feel very strongly about it. I will not be pigeonholed in that way, Speaker. Councillor Holliday? No, I'm asking. Yes, just one, Councillor Holliday. Well, can, can you please describe to me exactly what the issue is here from Councillor Fletcher? I'm not, I'm not seeing how my remarks had anything to do with a declaration I, of a crisis. Uh, Councillor Holliday, you'll have to get closer to the mic. I cannot hear everything that you're saying. Well, uh, why don't you sit down? Yes, Madam Speaker. Okay, now speak in it. I think we can hear you now. Okay. Well, Madam Speaker, um, I wondered if you could explain to me about what my remarks meant in terms of impugning other members of council, because 
I certainly didn't intend that. I asked people to think carefully about how they're voting and what it means. Sorry. Go ahead. I will accept that he didn't intend that. Excuse me, I'm Just in the middle of my point of privilege. Just a sec, we're in the middle of, of a point of order right now, Councillor Prudza. I will accept Please. that from Councillor Holliday that he didn't imply that he didn't mean to imply that, and if it came across like that, I will accept that as his. Thank his, you, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you. Now, Councillor Prudza, you have a point of order. A uh, point of privilege. I just really I wanted to apologize as well for the staff for 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 my language. I I basically was the one that uh, coined the phrase, you know, throwing them under the bus, as, and and Councillor Holiday uh, played on that phrase and and made his own point, and and it's it's I'm quite respectful of, of that. Uh, all I meant to say, uh, Speaker, was that uh, this is a challenging system. Right. Okay. And and what I meant to say uh, uh, with that. Uh, was that staff would then be challenged to go out and have to think about uh, developing a plan that, uh, or or dealing with a with a situation that, um, that quite frankly I know that they are currently swamped with the current uh, Th thank system thank you, and Councilor. with their current work, and I didn't mean that uh, to be in any way derogatory towards the staff. So okay, if thank, it was missing, thank you, Councillor Peruzza. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Carroll, last speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Okay, just one sec, Councillor Carroll. There, got your mic on. Okay. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we, we, we've been talking about humanity all along. It, we were reminded last night that we're talking about humans, and everyone in this equation is a human. You know, uh, months ago, before even the, the election, one of the earlier items that we... Uh, discussed shelters uh, just before the election and and a great part of the advocacy community came forward and you know we think of people becoming homeless for for you know dire reasons sometimes uh, uh, addictions family members who regrettably just can't anymore uh, uh, have the family suffer and so they send that person out hoping that Government somehow will be the better angels and, and pray that that, that that makes it work. Uh, fleeing abuse, all of those things. But we had a gentleman come to the community and he spoke on behalf of all the people in his particular uh, 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 shelter at that time so articulately. Councillor Thompson, chair of the committee at the time, was brave enough. He looked him straight in the eye and he said, can, can I ask you, do you, is it insensitive me? why are you homeless how did you become homeless and i and i i wouldn't have been able to do that i would have felt like i didn't have the right but he, he'd made a connection in their exchange and he felt he could and he he had no trouble answering it he was here in the chamber all day yesterday by the way still advocating for that community even though he, he now is living in an apartment and he said it, it sort of just happened it just happened now here i am and it's over a year now. And I, I really don't feel at fault. And I'm not blaming you either. And that's why I have problems with a, a declaration of crisis motion that seeks to assign blame right within the motion that it's got to be somebody's fault and there's got to be a solution. It has to be my solution. It can't be anybody else's solution. It's got to be the one I brought today. That's why I have a problem with those motions. It is a crisis. Does anyone in this room think that the medical officer of health and the general manager of SSHA doesn't know it's a crisis? Of course they do. The province might not know it's a crisis, but their auditor general told them it is. She said, you have no strategy, none, not for any city in Ontario, and you need one right now. So we move reminding them, oh, by the way, we read those recommendations and we want you to have a homelessness strategy. And then I mailed it to every other mayor in the GTHA and to Cam Guthrie, who was passionately dealing with this problem all the way in Guelph. So that they would all send a letter to the premier saying, you have no strategy, we're dying out here, we need more. We did a lot of things, we took a lot of actions. So I have, I have a lot of problems with my colleague's speech saying that Councillor Thompson's motion says we're doing nothing. The reason we didn't move, 
Mr. Tanner do something at economic development is because we heard that he was doing everything possible right now. As a result of the conversation in that committee, he, he said, if I had the space, I could pull together five bodies right now. I could do another center. And a counselor, Councillor Sachs said, what about Cecil Street? Let's go. And a week later, it opened. But do I have 10 more bodies to take every warming center right now and turn it into a 24 hours? No, we actually don't. You could get 10 bodies and turn one of them into a, a 24 hour and open no more. Or you could take those 10 bodies and open two more if there's a willing counselor who will place it in their community right now and it meets all the functionality requirements. Those are the types of things that Mr. Tanner is doing every day. That's why we didn't move, could you please do everything you can right now? Because he is. He is. And what he can do is redesign it, because we're making it pretty clear we want to redesign it. But he said, I'm going to keep pulling staff together. If you give me till April, I will come up with a cohesive and doable. I think doable is pretty important. I will bring you a doable report in April, and you can decide if it's enough. You can decide if the province has written a check to add to it, but you will get it, and that's as fast as humanly possible. But in the meantime, I am doing everything I can to try and house everyone who needs it. But it is a crisis, and more come every day. But I'm not going to stop doing everything I can on any given day. That's what we heard in that committee. Thank Those you. Those are my comments, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. OK, um, we'll take a five-minute break so the staff, we can get organized with the motions, and then we'll come back and vote.
Okay, if I can have members of council to please come back to your seats. Members of council, can you please come down to your seats? We don't have any bells. Where's um Okay, if we can take your seats and we're going to be, we're voting. And please, I'll give the, uh, you the order of the motions. Okay, our first motion, we'll put it on the screen. Motion 1A by Councillor Cheng. I'm sorry, can't hear you, Councillor Perks. I, I would like all the votes recorded, please. Thank you. Okay, we'll put the, uh, the motion is on the screen. That's motion 1A by Councillor Cheng, recorded vote. Councillor Sachs, may I have your vote, please? Affirmative. Affirmative. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Fletcher, may I have your vote, please? We will send IT over to help you. Um, in the meantime, may I please have your vote verbally? Yes. Affirmative, thank you. And Councillor Peruzza, please. Affirmative. Motion 1A does not carry. It loses on a tie. 13 votes on both sides. Our next motion is Motion 3A by Councillor Sachs.
Motion 3A does not carry. It loses on a tie, 13-13. No, we're in the middle of a vote. Sorry. Our next motion is motion two by Councillor Thompson. Recorded vote. Um, you want to vote separately on Councillor Thompson's motion? So you want to vote on one and two separately on Councillor Thompson's motion. Okay, one. Yes, Councillor Perks. Sorry, there's a complexity here that I think we need to be careful of, which is that if you're deleting in order to make something active, you can't really split that. Yeah, just, just, um, I'm trying to look at this motion on the screen. Yeah. Sorry, Councillor Sachs. It's hard when you don't have the motion in front of you. Yeah. I know. Okay, so we're, we're recorded vote on Councillor Thompson's motion. Um, so members, I have received, now that I have paper motion here, I have received advice from the clerk and she is saying in fact that you can vote on it separately, so let's vote on it separately. Do you want to challenge the clerk? So you're... Did you get your point of order, Gordon? Councillor Thompson, you're challenging me? No, no, I'm point of order. I need to understand something before I know where I'm at. Okay. So if I, if I can have the clerk just comment. Madam Speaker, my advice was that because each of the propositions contained within the motion could stand alone, it would be in order for council to vote on them separately. Okay, that's fine. So, so uh, I need to be very precise before I vote. Can you get closer to your microphone? My microphone wasn't on, now it's yeah. on, okay? So the splitting would be splitting delete, which parts we delete? Or would it be splitting the deletion from Councillor Thompson's motions? That's what I need to understand. Madam Speaker, I believe each portion of this motion is distinct. So I would say that council can vote separately on each of the deletion, one and two, and each of the additions of one and two, because they are all distinct propositions and not tied to one another. Even though the language says adopt instead? I'm gonna challenge that. Okay. Uh, I... No, I'm asking for the rule. I need to know what we're doing. Okay, so the clerk has given given okay. some advice. So, Councillor Thompson, so. You, but if you do, I'm challenging you. Yeah, I, you know, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think it should be separated. Okay, so, then I don't yeah. have to challenge you. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Holliday, you have a challenge too? 
Okay, Councillor Holliday. Uh, forgive me, I thought I just heard you rule that it's not to be split. Did, did I just hear that? Yes. Okay, thank you, Madam Speaker. No, no. No, she's... My ruling is not to split it. We vote it. We vote in as one. Okay. Yeah. So she's not accepting the ruling. Okay. Do we want to get this item done before lunch? Yes. Okay. Okay. So are you are you challenging me? Okay. Okay. Let's let's just vote on the motion by Councillor Thompson, recorded vote. Yes. Motion two carries, the vote is 15 to 11. Our next motion is motion 1B by Councillor Cheng. Recorded vote. It was amended, Councillor Perks. <laughs> Councillor Cheng amended when Councillor Thompson asked questions. Yeah, okay. Pardon? Motion 1B carries unanimously, 26 in favor. Our next, our next motion is motion 3B. Okay, Councillor Cheng, you can celebrate later. Councillor 3B, Councillor Sachs. Recorded vote. Motion 3B carries. The vote is 23 to 3. Okay, our next, our last motion is motion 4 by Councillor Cole. Recorded vote. Motion four carries unanimously, 26 in favor. Okay, thank you, we got that item. So we do have a few minutes. Um, do, do any of the members of council wanna release some items, please? No items to be released? You wanna come back tomorrow? 
Well, that's the question. No releases? Okay, Councillor Fletcher. It is a CC. It's, uh, sorry. Oh, sorry about that. It is a CC 3.3. 1555-1575 Queen East, authority to amend Section 37 agreement to reflect the minor variance decision of the Committee of Adjustment. I'll move that. Okay, Thank so you. Councillor Fletcher is releasing CC 3.3. On favour, show of hands, carried. Any more? Councillor Moyes, are you ready to release yours? Queen Street? Um, let's try to get all the releases done before lunch, so this way we don't have to come back tomorrow. Councillor Moyes? Uh, you held CC 3.13, 471, 479 Queen Street. Yeah, but I do have an amendment, though. Okay, is amendment, does the staff have your amendment? They do, but it's in private, right? Okay, so if the staff has your amendment, you can move the amendment and we can release the item now. Okay, sure, that's, yeah. Okay, so let's put the amendment on the screen. Councillor Moyes, do you want to get up and, and uh, move your amendment? Just the public one? Okay, I wasn't quite ready for that. <laughs> one second. Let's have my paperwork. It's on screen. It's on screen, here we go. Okay, okay, there it is. Do I need to read it? So I move uh, that City Council adopt the recommendation of the to if you the city, do I need to read it, uh, Madam Clerk? No, you don't have to read everything. Okay, so yeah. I just move it. I'm <laughs> sure. moving it. Okay, okay. Thank you. On the, there's an amendment by Councillor Moyes. It's on the screen. On favor, show of hands. Opposed, if any, carried. Item is amended. On favor, show of hands, carried. Is there any more? Councillor Holliday. Speaker, it. it with your indulgence and that of council, I would like to speak for about 60 seconds on IE 1.5. If council doesn't want me to make some comments, that's fine too. Okay, uh, Councillor Holliday, I'm really sorry, but I'm having problems hearing you. Can you just sit down and speak? Because sure. for some reason, I don't know, you got a soft voice. Well, I, I, maybe I'll shout a little louder. Um, okay. IE 1.5 is the FG Gardner Expressway and Don Valley Parkway closure. If, uh, Madam Speaker, you will allow me to speak for about 60 seconds on it, I can release it. I don't have any amending motions, but I have some comments to make. Okay, so 60 seconds. Thank you, Councillor right. Holliday. Thank you. So this item is the, the closure of the expressways for a charitable event. Uh, we've done these for a number of years in the city. You will notice, members of council, that this one extends the time even later into the afternoon till 4 o'clock, really is essentially the closure for the day. Um, I've heard from many constituents about concerns over congestion in the city, and I think this is the one opportunity that I would like uh, to signal um, that's not supportable. It's not supportable. And I don't, it's not that I don't support the charity. They do wonderful work. It's just that these sort of things, in my opinion, and from the perspective of council, are more political in nature. They're the closure of an expressway and something that people rely on to cross the city. And I think post-COVID, people are moving around seven days a week and more often than they were before. And so uh, I am simply going to vote no. Uh, because I think there's a, quite a few number of people and members of the public that are growing more and more concerned with these type of closures, and they have changed a lot. When they were originally done, they were early in the morning on a Sunday when people didn't notice, but they seem to be longer and longer and longer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Thank Speaker. Thank you. So we'll have a recorded vote on IE 1.5. Recorded vote.
we're, we're voting. Councillor Holliday is releasing IE 1.5. Councillor Fletcher, yes. can you please, um, we're in the middle of a vote. We're in the middle of a vote. Yeah. The item carries, the vote is 23 to two. Okay, are there any, are there any further releases quickly? Councillor Cheng, I, you don't wanna release planning and housing? Because there's really nothing there, just a report. Oh, okay. All right, recess to two o'clock. Okay, Councillor Carroll. Sorry. I'm keeping people from their lunch. Madam Speaker, I, I can uh, release GG 1.12, the fair wage policy. I got my questions answered. Which one? Uh, GG 1.12, the fair wage policy updates. Court of vote. Got okay. my questions answered. Okay, so Councillor Carroll's releasing GG 1.12, updating. Vote. Updating the per wage schedule. Recess. Recess. Okay. Recess. Well, you'll have to take the vote later. People have left the chamber. Please left. Just do it when we get back. People have left. Call the
These are the last four that were added this morning for your binder. I'll call this meeting to order. Okay, members of council, this meeting is now resumed. Before we start the member motion run through, I would take the release of polls. The clerk will open the speakers list on CMP and you can please place your name on the list if you have an item to release. Any releases? Okay, Councillor Sachs. Yes, thank you. So, uh, uh, DM th 3.1. Yeah, I DM 3.1. Yeah, this was a recommendation having to do with the proposed uh, heritage designation of four properties at the corner of Avenue Road and DuPont, sorry, Avenue Road and Davenport. Um, and I have a motion to uh, amend those recommendations, which has been circulated. Uh, the gist is that I'm recommending the designation of three of the properties be withdrawn. One of them should proceed. Uh, it's all on the motion. And um, there is a significant benefit to the public realm to removing those properties, which are now way too close to the road. There's a very unsafe condition um, with a narrow obstructed sidewalk at a very busy intersection. And changing the recommendations will allow for significant improvement in the public realm at that corner. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we have the amendment by Councillor Sachs on the on the screen. On favor, show of hands, item is amended. On favor, carried. Councillor Carroll, quick release. Uh, yes, Madam Speaker. Uh, General Government 1.12, updating the fair wage schedule. I've had my questions answered offline. Okay, Councillor Carroll's re pardon. Uh, okay, Councillor Carroll's releasing GG 1.12, um, and Councillor Holliday's asked for recorded vote. Recorded vote. Councillor Bradford, may I have your vote, please? In favor, thank you. Councillor Peruzza, may I have your vote, please? In favor, thank you. Councillor Fletcher, may I have your vote, please? Councillor Fletcher? In the affirmative, thank you. And Councillor Myers, please. In the affirmative, thank you. 
The item carries. The vote is 23 to 2. Thank you. Now, I understand, Councillor Moyes, uh, you want to reopen an item, CC 3.13, 471 79 Queen Street, uh, and you have a corrected uh, an amendment that you want to move. Councillor Moyes? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I think the amendment uh, will be on the screen shortly. We did this prior to the break, and uh, there was some discrepancy in the motion. I'd like to reopen it and make the amendment. Okay, so we'll put it on the screen. Yeah. Okay. Motion. All favor of reopening, all in favor, carry. Okay, if we can put the amended uh, motion on the screen. There it is on the screen. On favor, show of hands. Item is amended on favor, show of hands, carry. <laughs> Councillor Cheng, I understand that you want to get up on a point to personal privilege. Councillor Cheng. Yes, I'm here to make an apology. I uh, received an email that uh, expressed the deep hurt of someone because they felt that my comments uh, about uh, the masking and PPE of SSHA staff uh, was harmful. And I, I'm not saying that at all. I value the contributions of SSHA staff um, who have put themselves in the front line during the pandemic when a lot of other people shut down. So uh, I please accept my apologies. I, I respect the work that SSHA staff do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, ju just one sec. Uh, Councillor Peruzza and Councillor Cole, uh, can you please try to keep it down? We're trying to listen. We're trying to listen to members of council. Please, Mayor Tory. Uh, speaker, I, I uh, too received a copy of that email. They copied a few people in the in the civic administration, and I want to thank first of all Councillor Chang for. Apologizing, I think it was the right thing to do, but it's not always the easiest thing to do. And just to say that I had had brought to my attention, um, you know, some uh, concerns from staff generally uh, about how sometimes our interactions with them, not, not just speeches on the floor of council, are not all they should be. And uh, we'll discuss that at a, at a future time, but I just think it's so important that we, uh, we do, you know, try to think about these things as best we can in our interactions and our speeches here because uh, they work hard for us, especially, uh, but not confined to SSHA, SSHA by any means. But I do thank Councillor Cheng for her apology. Thank you. Okay, so we'll now go through the members, the run through for the members motion. MM 3.1. Okay, it's on the screen. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Toronto and East York Community Council. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Show of hands. Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3.2. Okay, this... Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to, uh, to the Toronto and East York Community Council. Two thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion relates to an Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario hearing and has been deemed urgent. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3.3. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Toronto and East York Community Council. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion relates to an Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario hearing and has been deemed urgent. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3.4. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Economic and Community Development Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. 
On the item, all in favor, carried. So we've dealt with 3.5. MM 3.6. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Scarborough Community Council. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3.7. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Etobicoke York Community Council. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. February 6, 2023, a revised member motion was posted. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3.8. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the executive committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried on, pardon? Hold. Okay. Councilor Crawford is holding. MM 3.9. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Toronto and East York Community Council. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion relates to an alcohol and gaming commission of Ontario hearing and has been deemed urgent. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried on the item. All in favor? Carried. MM 3.10. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the executive committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3.11. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the executive committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3.12. Notice that this motion has not been given. A two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the striking committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. All in favor of waiving notice? Carried. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 3.13. Notice if this motion has not been given, a two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Toronto and East York Community Council. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. All in favor of waiving notice? Carried. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 314, notice of this motion has not been given. A two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Toronto and East York Community Council. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. All in favor of waiving notice? Carried. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 315, notice of this motion has not been given. A two-thirds vote is required to waive notice. This motion is subject to referral to the Toronto and East York Community Council. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. All in favor of waiving notice? Carried. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor, carried. So on MM 3.16, um, I'm going to rule this motion out of order um, because I believe that um, this amendment should come forward next week and when we do when we um, approve the 2023 budget, which is being considered. And uh, Councillor Matlow, you could move this motion next week. Councillor Matlow. Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, uh, 
I, I uh, in, in no way challenge your, your ruling, um, but I would like to uh, make a point of order, uh, I think informational for, for council, because this is new. Uh, and if yeah, this, is. this is extraordinarily new. Um, so, you know, typically, tip, tip, typically uh, what, I, what I've moved here would be very common, very normal, uh, and it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't bat an eyelash. Today, uh, I understand that it needs to go to uh, the budget uh, meeting um, because the mayor has already uh, put forward his budget due to the new uh, strong mayor legislation. Can we hear from perhaps the city solicitor as to uh, why this is and what and and how this how this has been impacted by the changes in legislation? Through you, Madam Speaker. The legislation contemplates the mayor preparing a proposed budget and sharing it with members. It permits council to amend that budget through a process and council has scheduled a special meeting for that purpose next week, which is the appropriate place for any amendments to be addressed. So did the, if I may, uh, did, the, did the legislation perhaps not contemplate um, a situation perhaps where it, at this moment, there'd normally be a section 45 or section 37 moved, where there might be uh, a, a genuine reason for urgency at this moment, and did it not contemplate our process to allow, whether it be through council or delegation to the city manager, to move the money to make it so? It's my understanding that this is not an urgent matter, and I'm unprepared to provide advice on a hypothetical situation. Okay, I won't pursue it now because it is okay. a point of order, but so I just Councilor, I think it was yeah. important Councilor to bring Mallow, it to Mallow, I would suggest that next week, and because once we approve the budget, then the funds are there, we can explore you can it, transfer yeah. the funds, yeah. right? Yeah, and yeah. I will. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, MM317. Like, Pardon? If there, if there was a real urgent... Yeah, so the microphone's still on. Ruled it out of order. <laughs> thank you. Maybe, maybe the city's... Out in normal course of things, not in a budget cycle. Yeah, then, with, then you out, can move it, yeah. You can move that. Yeah, so yeah. in June, you yeah. could move this yeah. outside yes. of being a budget year, right. a budget meeting. Thank you. Okay, let's continue, MM317. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agendas before council for debate. On the item, on favor, carried. MM318, this motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agendas before council for debate. On the item, on favor, carried. MM319, this motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agendas before council for debate. On the item, on favor, carried. MM, MM 3.20, this motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agendas before council for debate. On the item, on favor, carried. It, it's not, no, this is just on the item. Oh, okay. Councillor Perks, you want to hold it? Councillor Perks, you want to hold it? All right. Well, we'll hold it in your name. That's MM, yes, MM320. Okay, MM321, this motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda before council for debate. On the item, on favor, carried. MM3.22, this motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added 
to the agendas before council for debate. On the item on favor, carried. MM 3.23, this motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agendas before council for debate. On the item on favor, carried. MM 3.24, this motion is not has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agenda before council for debate. Qu hold. Okay, Councillor Holliday is holding. MM 325. This motion has been deemed urgent by the chair. This motion is not subject to a vote to waive referral. This motion has been added to the agendas before council for debate. On the item, all favor, carry. Okay, that's it for the motions. Point of order, Councillor Crawford. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to inform you um, as we go through the afternoon that I'm going to be requesting for CA 2.2, the appointment of the public members to the Board of Health, that I do have uh, private questions, so we'll have to go in camera. So we can, it doesn't matter when, but I just want to inform you that we have to go on camera. Yeah, okay. So we'll have to go on camera on that one. Um, Board of Health, civic appointment. Councillor Fletcher? Yes, uh, uh, MM 3.17, the extension of the VHT. Uh, just these new installment dates, I did have some questions and it slipped by. I don't know if, particularly on how we're going to let people know things. Pardon? Do you need to reopen that? You want to reopen yes. it? Yes, so I can ask those questions on behalf of my constituents, please. Okay. So can I have a motion to reopen MM 3.17? On favor? Thank okay, you. and Councillor Fletcher is holding down 17. Thank you. Okay, so we'll now go to the our item, which is IE 1.5, 1.4 Cycling Network Plan. And um, I know we have city staff here, so if members of council have questions to staff, please put your name on the list. Councillor. Matt Lowe. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'll begin with um, uh, to transportation staff. Um, there have been um, some suggestions that rather than move ahead and make the, uh, the Young Street Complete Street Pilot permanent uh, now, uh, that um, that it'd be extended for another year. Um, do you have a do you have a position on that? Is that something that you would think is reasonable? Are there any problems? What's your position on that? Uh, through the speaker to Councillor Matlow. So we. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Should I sit? Is that better? No, it's not. It's either. it's everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, through the speaker to Councillor Matlow. So we have been uh, working uh, pretty diligently, I think, on the design, the modifications, uh, listening to the community about concerns. There are definitely concerns that still remain in the community about this project. Uh, we have demonstrated, I think, through other projects that we've done similar to this one, that even if the project becomes permanent, we will still be uh, open and available to continue to work through issues as they come forward. So I, I personally don't see a lot of value in it continuing this as a pilot. Aside we from value, is there any problem with an extension? Any like actual issues the, that you face? The challenges that I see actually are that we have a number of development projects that are coming forward that we've contemplated uh, that we would like to negotiate with the developers of those programs to be able to build those frontages permanently. And if it's a temporary program for a year, we do miss some. Uh, we do miss some opportunity there. To thank you, uh, Barbara. Uh, uh, to our emergency responders. There have been concerns raised by the community uh, about um, uh, the possibility that there are uh, delays in response time, uh, EMS, in particular EMS and fire. Uh, 
What is your position on that? Do you have any concerns with respect to uh, being able to, uh, to uh, with respect to delays? And also, there's been a request for more granular data uh, to demonstrate uh, the position that, that staff have put forward to council. Madam Chair, I'll start and then my colleague uh, from Paramedic Services can continue. So, Councillor, we, we undertook a comprehensive data analysis on uh, the a more granular approach than first. I'm, I'm sorry, would you pause my time? I can't hear a thing. Please, quiet. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So we, uh, we comprised a study area. Initial data was on the ward level. We went more granular than that, looked at uh, a pilot study area and intentionally compared our response time performance in 2019, uh, intentional, intentionally selected to, so as to avoid any issues uh, with the anomalies experienced during COVID and compared that to January 1st through October 31st, 2022. I can tell you that in that comparison on uh, the response times in the study area increased by 49 seconds as compared to 41 seconds in the rest of the city. That means the net increase over what we're experiencing in the rest of the city uh, was eight seconds in that study area. Uh, with respect to your question, Councillor, uh, through you, Madam Chair, about more granular data. We absolutely can assess on a more granular basis. The challenge, Councillor, is this. The smaller the data set gets, the less reliable our, data, that our ability to do either predictive analysis or comparative analysis gets. So we can get more granular, but the ability to do the comparison that I just, that I just quoted to you is reduced because of a higher volatility in the data because of a smaller data set. Back to transportation. Um, thank you. Um, there's also been a suggestion about the idea that it could be seasonal. Uh, so for the warmer months of the year during the cafe TO, there could be bike lanes and then they, the bike lanes could be removed uh, during the winter months. Is that, is that a feasible concept? Are there costs associated with doing that if it were to happen? Like, what, what, what would your feedback be on that? Through the speaker, we've been asked about seasonal bike lanes a bit before, and we've never supported them uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Even though cycling volumes do go down in the winter time, there's still many, many people who cycle all year round. Um, also, the uh, cost, as you asked, to put in and take out a bike lane uh, of that nature every year would, would exceed $2 million to do. So we'd have to have that as an annual cost going, because it's about a million and a half to install, and it would be about a million to take it out. So. It, there would be cost incurred, as well as time spent by staff to do that. Okay. So um, I want to just come back to, with the little time that I've got remaining, just because the, the big question today is like, do we, do we make it permanent and continue to make, you know, reasonable changes and improvements, uh, or do we extend the pilot for another year? Are there, are there any pluses or minuses that you could see to, to doing the, uh, the extension? rather than uh, making it permanent? Through the speaker, so um, the minuses that I see actually is we have a very big commitment to get 100 kilometers of cycling infrastructure on the ground this year as part of our uh, Transform TO work, actually not this year, the next two years. And it is a very staff intensive process to do ongoing consultation uh, and the data analysis that's been asked, and I, I think appropriately asked of these projects, because there's lots of questions when they get uh, um, okay. put forward. And so we would definitely be impacting our ability to work in other locations. And uh, quite frankly, we don't have a lot more. I mean, we have all the data resources that we have right now. We have the ability to make changes and modifications as we hear concerns or as we observe concerns. So I, I am not sure what uh, the benefit would be of extending the pilot rather than making it permanent with the knowledge that we are going to commit to making improvements uh, okay, along the way. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, we're going to have to try to get these questions and answers short because we want to finish the the agenda. Councillor McKelvey, questions. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, can you outline why Young was selected as the preferred corridor over Avenue or Mount Pleasant, etc.? Through the Speaker, Councillor, the 
corridor analysis that was directed by council was undertaken back uh, before the pilot was installed, comparing Mount Pleasant Avenue and Young. And Young was found to have a better opportunity um, for a complete street corridor to be implemented, at least as, of the, as the highest priority of the three corridors. Um, some of the factors there were because it had a, um, a less safe record in terms of collisions between uh, pedestrians, cyclists, and, and motor vehicles. So we had a bigger opportunity for safety improvements on Young Street. We also have a, a lesser grade on Young Street in terms of the, the steepness of the hill compared to Avenue. And notably, because a complete street is also about supporting local business, Young Street has a more rich retail profile and more BIAs that there's an opportunity to work with BIAs to have those streetscape improvements uh, implemented. So the those combination of those factors as well as others, as well their Avenue carries more traffic per lane than Young Street. Um, and so that was another factor in the consideration. And how has the project improved over the pilot that you've done? What improvements have you made, for example, over the last year? Um, we have made quite a few improvements, um, partly from when we were first directed by council. We installed left turn lanes at a number of locations, three locations. Um, we enhanced loading markings to provide that space for businesses, um, side street loading as well. Um, we in installed slow markings for cyclists to slow down at key locations where there were concerns about the speed, um, pavement markings to highlight hydrant locations uh, for fire safety, um, signal timing at 19 signalized locations in order to improve flow along the corridor as well, and pedestrian head start signals to improve safety, and several others. I'll, I'll stop there. OK, and I already heard your commitment that you'll continue to find those improvements through making it permanent. Yes. Um, can you speak to, and I have two more questions, uh, one more question after this. Um, what is happening north and south of this area? Uh, council has directed additional studies. So north of this area, Council's directed that we uh, assess the corridors of both Young and Duplex to confirm which is the best corridor to continue a complete street treatment and bikeway. And south of the corridor, um, we do have a, an environmental assessment that's been approved by Council for the Young Tomorrow section um, south of College. But between College and Bloor, there's a future EA planned uh, for that work as well, given the significant redevelopment on the corridor and major state of good repair work planned. Okay, so studies are continuing through that area. Okay, the same question for EMS, fire, and TTC. Um, were you consulted in preparation of this report, and are you comfortable with the recommendation? Through the speaker uh, for paramedic services, yes, we were. Thank you. Uh, Madam Speaker, fire services, yes, we, we did the analysis. It's been fed into our colleagues at Transportation Services. In TTC? Uh, through the speaker, yes, we have been consulted and we are satisfied with the operation in the street in relation to our shuttle buses and our regular service. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your work on this. Okay, thank you. Councillor Robinson. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask the general manager of transportation. Um, you're aware that there's 825,000 um, pre-COVID shuttle users, or, or su not shuttle users, but subway users on that line. Uh, you're aware of that? Through the speaker, uh, yes. And how many, um, how many cyclists are using this corridor? 1,500 approximately a day? Uh, through the speaker, yes. Um, okay, so that's helpful. Have you had any conversations with shuttle users when people are booted off the subway that carries 825,000 people pre-COVID? Have you had conversations with the drivers of those shuttles or um, with the actual riders and, and telling them to, you know, tell you a bit about reflecting their, their rider experience? Through the speaker, we've worked pretty closely with the TTC, a couple of different um, you know, groups within the TTC who have, uh, of course, direct uh, involvement with both the drivers and, and their own users. I don't know if Scott Haskell, who's on the, on the WebEx here, would like to talk a little bit about what they've heard. Uh, through the speaker, uh, the TTC customers tell us often about their experiences and we do check with them on their experiences when it comes to shuttle buses. Uh, nobody likes to have to ride a shuttle bus instead of the subway and so those generally the comments reflect that, that reality. Uh, we, we have not seen substantial differences in the travel time along Young Street before and after the bike lanes. Okay, 
Thank you. Um, and there's no data here at all for the weekdays. I'm seeing data for Saturday and Sunday, but as a user of the system, I've been kicked off at more during Monday to Friday than ever um, when there's breakdowns, which seem to be all the time. So how, how significant are the delays for transit users during unplanned weekday closures? Where, where is some information on that? Uh, through the speaker, it was harder to, to, to pull data for that because they are, as you said, unplanned. Our major focus was on evaluating the effects on customers of the planned weekend closures, of which there have, of course, been many in recent years, but of course, for which there will be many fewer in the years to come. When, when the service is unplanned, it's often very difficult to capture the data, and so we weren't able to do that in a comprehensive way. Okay, well, I'd say to you that um that's when people are getting to work, trying to get to work, nurses to hospitals, technicians to hospitals, workers to grocery stores. So I, it'd be very helpful if you secured that data because that's when people have to be on time and get to work, not on Saturday and Sunday or some people, but um, most people work uh, majority and we'd like to know those, those numbers and how it's impacting them. So I hope you can secure that information for us. Um, and then I'd like to ask about um, dedicated transit lanes. Uh, will that ever be a future on Young Street? And if, the, if this it does happen, given that the subway pre-COVID was packed like sardines, whether you're at York Mills, Eglinton or Lawrence, um, what, how does that impact cycling infrastructure? Can we do both? Does one preclude the other? Through or the speaker, I'll defer, the the speaker, I'll defer to city staff on that question. Okay. Uh, through the speaker, we have a surface transit network plan that um, identifies 20 corridors. We've also been talking with the TTC about improvements along Young Street. Um, and uh, certainly with the corridor being permanent, I mean, we, we um, I think we've been demonstrating that we are uh, very willing to work with the TTC to ensure that um, if there is a surface transit, we take that into consideration right now. Uh, my understanding is there is not a plan to uh, to continue to um, put surface transit along Young Street. We will, of course, be responsive if TTC brings back to us the fact that they um, are interested in doing that. One of the other things I just wanted to bring up uh, during the pandemic, because you mentioned the pandemic council appropriately so, and one of the reasons why we picked uh, the active TO corridors that we did was to provide an alternative for people who wanted to use uh, cycling as a way to either augment their trip on transit to get to work or uh, as an alternative. So that's one of the reasons why those corridors were uh, were selected as well. Okay, and um, my, the, the, cycling, the cycling numbers I'm seeing here are um, much lower than, for instance, let's say, let's just pick one, Richmond and Adelaide, which is more like 6,000. Is that, would you verify that the numbers on Young are much lower? Than, than some of the other cycling numbers where we've seen big successes. That was your last question. I heard, I heard that. Thanks. Through the speaker, that's correct, Councillor. It's Thank much you. lower. Thank you. Councillor Myers to speak. I mean, sorry, to ask questions. Thank you. Uh, through the speaker, um, I read the report and I didn't see any analysis on what the impact of the active TO would have either um, what the impact of the active TO would have on members of the disability community. So could you please let me know what analysis staff did as to what impact, whether positive or negative, active TO would have on uh, members of the disability community? Um, specifically whether or not uh, members of the dis disabled community were using the lanes with their motorized vehicles and whether or not there were any loss of accessible parking spaces to, to accommodate the permanent bike lanes. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor. Complete street improvements are about improving the way the street operates for everyone, uh, including those in the accessibility community. And, and one of the things that we undertook as part of this work was engagement with wheel trans users as a focus group to seek feedback um, from how the, the pilot could operate. Um, some of the improvements that we made on the ground um, were, were raised, um, raised accessible loading zones in order to provide um, that, that uh, level um, access egress 
cars from accessible vehicles. Uh, and we are very open to more improvements to accessibility um, if the project is made permanent and there's more civil improvements that we can undertake to make that accessibility um, um, experience better. Thank you. Um, so just so I know, were any accessible parking spaces lost to make this program permanent? Uh, through the speaker, prior to the pilot, there weren't any uh, parking spots on Young Street. Um, so the addition of full-time parking on Young Street provided more accessibility for parking. Great. And final question, uh, just to clarify, have you noticed um, whether or not uh, members of the disabled community were using the bike lanes more because they were protected, or did you not do that uh, analysis? There have been some um, observational sort of qualitative analysis of users of the, the bikeways. Um, I wouldn't have the details about the um, types of accessible users. Um, and then we have received feedback that people with mobility devices find the, the bike lanes to be smoother than going onto the sidewalk instead. Um, thank you. Is it possible in the ongoing analysis of the project, whether it remains as a pilot or whether it does um, become permanent, if that, if that type of analysis, that equity analysis with respect to people with disabilities, could that be included in the ongoing study? Uh, yes, Councillor, we're very open to improving the accessibility of all of our bikeway corridors. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sachs, questions? Yes, thank you. Um, to the Medical Officer of Health, can you tell us please what the health benefits are of complete streets? Can we start running my time when we don't have mics? Oh, there we go. Thank you. So through the speaker, uh, when it comes to complete streets, those that have enhanced features like enhanced cycling and walking facilities, for example, are linked with improved physical activity levels, which in turn is a benefit for health. Beyond that, when you actually see more users like walkers and cyclists using the streets, uh, what does happen over time is that you see reduced collisions with motorists, again, enhancing safety. And as well, when you have more users like cyclists and walkers out using the streets, you get social health benefits as well. Uh, and air quality benefits also? Indeed. So through the speaker, there are uh, clear um, air quality benefits associated with more people transferring use or using the streets uh, by walking and cycling as opposed to using motor vehicles. And would you agree with me, Dr. Davila, that transportation-related air pollution exacts an enormous toll from Torontonians? So through the speaker, yes, I would agree with you that that is in fact the case. We know that air pollution on a wide scale, on a city scale, does increase risk for a number of different health conditions, respiratory illnesses, cardiovascular illnesses, and a number of other outcomes, both of a cancerous nature and a non-cancer nature. Thank, thank you very much. And Madam Speaker, I hope you'll extend my time for the time we lost with the microphone. Um, uh, Miss, uh, the transportation. Uh, small businesses have t suffered terribly in the last three years. How do complete streets affect small businesses on Young Street? Uh, through the speaker, research from several major cities, um, including research previously of, with Toronto Project, has shown that people who walk and cycle to local main streets do come more often and spend more. Um, we have found uh, data even from one of the deputants um, who came to the Infrastructure Environment Committee from the Bloor Annex BIA that point of sale data does, uh, does present this. Um, in terms of um, other ways to support small business, we also have the opportunity to provide parking and loading opportunities through a complete street design that, um, but that just having those vehicle lanes used for through fare doesn't provide that necessarily. So complete streets are good for small business, yes? Yes, as long as we work with those local businesses to ensure that the design of the project meets their needs. And are you doing that? We certainly are. All right. Now, there's been a big increase in vehicle traffic across the city since the beginning of the pandemic. Has the area in the immediate vicinity of the Young Street, Complete Street, suffered disproportionately from traffic? We've certainly been monitoring traffic very carefully, and I'll pass it to my colleague, Roger Brown, to speak further. 
Yeah, through you, Madam Speaker, and thanks for the question. Um, no, I wouldn't say that it's uh, disproportionate in this area. Um, you know, basically in terms of the volumes we've seen, well, throughout the city, we've seen from you know, back in March, 45% uh, percent of uh, the typical volumes, it's gone back up to 89%. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, transportation, one of the complaints we've heard about the bike lanes is that it's uh, a lot of different shapes and types of material that used, people found it confusing. When you make the bike lanes permanent, will that improve the clarity for the benefits of cyclists and drivers? Through the speaker, we have a lot more opportunities to design the whole corridor consistently uh, with the use of permanent materials. Although I will say that we have, um, certainly if there are specific locations where people are concerned about that, we would be interested to know about it right away. But um, in other areas we've used, like the Danforth, where we've had um, multiple opportunities to really express the public realm there, and so there have been some different treatments. But I believe that it's, it's really important that uh, there is consistency in, uh, in the use uh, of, of materials, but also in uh, in sort of the u utilization of that corridor, so people it's predictable and they know what to expect. And it will be more predictable when it's permanent, correct? We have a lot more opportunity to to use permanent materials effectively than uh, with the limited palette that we have in uh, in pilot projects. Yes. Now we um, you've seen my motion for an enhanced traffic study. Is there any reason why you need to? to put off making the bike lanes permanent in order to do that study and make improvements for the neighbors? No, there's an opportunity to make improvements for local access ingress and, um, and infiltration, um, even if the project is made permanent. Oh, thank you. And now, CAFE TO, we Last had- Last question. Had, thank you. CAFE TO yesterday was approved with changes. Um, if uh, I understand that one of the things that's expected is that there will be fewer cafes. If there are fewer cafes, along the complete street. Uh, will that give you more opportunities to include parking and loading areas? And do you know that in advance, or was it something you'll be able to accommodate after the bike lanes are made permanent? Uh, through the speaker, so it will give us more opportunities next year if there are fewer cafes. We know that the, the nature of the cafe program and the locations of restaurants and being responsive there means that that's going to probably shift around each year a little bit. And so um, we will be flexible in how we address the space that would be used for cafes in the summer months, whether we, we utilize it for parking or loading or bike parking or public parklets or what have you. We have a, a palette that we've used uh, in other complete streets in other neighborhoods in the last three years. Thank you. That, that was your last question. Councillor Burnside. Thank you. Um, yeah, through you to the, uh, to the fire chief. I believe, and sorry, I didn't get all the information, but I believe you mentioned uh, call the time to take to get to calls goes up by eight seconds. Uh, Madam Speaker, correct. Based on the analysis, that's a comparative analysis from uh, January 1st through the end of October 2019, same period of time in 2022 in the study area, increased by eight seconds. Okay, and what was the study, what was the time? What were the times? Like, the issue I think with, with the bike lanes in general is that traffic, uh, you know, there's rush hour and, and, and things like that. So the fact that you got there quickly at three in the morning would be expected. Do you have times about three in the afternoon? Uh, what I have with me is our percentage or our performance by percentage, of course, the target being 90%. Uh, this is for 2022, Councillor. Our citywide, uh, citywide performance, 78%, was our, was our overall performance in the study area at 87.6% in, 2020, in uh, 2022. But you don't have actual hour by hour times? Uh, I don't have them by, t by hour. No, I don't. So, respectfully, maybe not as helpful as it could be. Yeah, hard, uh, Madam Speaker, hard to say that the way that we assess performance in accordance with NFPA, uh, NFPA standards, which is part of our CFI, CFAI accreditation program, it requires calculation to the 90th percentile gotcha. across an aggregate, not by hour. Okay, thank you. Um, through the speaker, uh, Councillor Sachs mentioned about uh, bike lanes, and I think uh, transportation concurred, that are, are better for small business. Um, what about these businesses? Of, uh, so I'm not looking about the general sense that bike lanes being, I think it was a general statement that bike lanes are better for small businesses in general. I want to specifically home in on Young Street. Uh, are all the BIAs, did they, I know you, uh, it was mentioned that one specific business uh, showed data. Were all the BIAs in agreement that business got better as, re as a result of these lanes? 
Through the speaker, some BIAs have come forward to say, I know at least one has come forward to say they have concerns and we're very open to continue to work with local BIAs to address those concerns as we have with other projects. We have been working with the BIAs uh, in this area um, since before the pilot began to ensure that the, the design of the pilot and then should it become permanent, the design of the project going forward would meet their needs. So we're open to continuing to work with them. Okay. I don't have data from the, um, any businesses. Thank you, and I, I trust you're doing your best. I was just yeah. more trying to get an actual picture about this specific as opposed to a general picture of Fair. bike lanes. Okay, thanks. Um, I know there were mention about developments. If there were a motion to extend the pilot by let's say nine months, um, how many developments might be, because uh, we're talking about developments on Young Street, might be affected and uh, in terms of if we extended that pilot by nine months in terms of negotiations for uh, build outs and whatever the case is, improvements? Through the speaker, I, I couldn't guess on the exact number in that nine month period, but certainly we continue to work. I believe there are 28 developments in the corridor that are in the pipeline, so that could be anywhere from tomorrow to five years from yeah, now. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand if we extended it by nine months, what that impact would be as opposed to. So I, I couldn't tell you specifically okay. on, uh, on how many developments would be impacted. Mm, thank you, no worries. Um, when the um, traffic studies were done, um, what were the um, citywide traffic levels versus pre-pandemic numbers? I know um, it was mentioned about 89% now is the traffic level. Was that the same when the study was done? Were traffic levels citywide back up to 89% or was it lower? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, yeah. In actuality, the traffic volume has been very consistent over the past while in that kind of high 80s, low 90s relative to pre-pandemic. When the study was done? Correct, yeah. Perfect, thank you. And then my last question, in terms of, uh, you might want to stand back up, uh, Roger. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Uh, <laughs> payback. Um, no, you're always very good to me. Um, in terms of, um, when we talk about an extra, for traffic, it would be, in general, an extra one minute of travel time as a result of the bike lanes. Um, that's over the 18 hour period, correct? Right. Which, once again, I, I believe, is that correct? Yeah, through you, Madam Speaker, it was actually it was actually broken through peak midday and PM in terms of that. Yeah. So what so, do we have those peak midday like peak morning, peak midday numbers and what the delay would actually be? Yeah, so you through you, Madam Speaker. Um basically the volumes are pretty flatlined throughout the day. It's about a thousand vehicles uh, per hour in both directions, about sixty percent southbound, about forty percent of that's northbound. And if anything, the peak's pretty much through the midday. It's not so much of an AMPM peak thing. Is it a still a one minute delay? That, that, that was your yeah. last question. Yeah, I understand question. that, thank you. Yes, yes, uh, that is correct. It's midday, one minute seconds. delay. Yeah, 69 okay. seconds of the midday when we have the highest peak, yeah. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Councillor Morley, question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and to you, uh, through you to staff, um, can you comment on the impact of cost of living for Torontonians when we have complete streets in neighborhoods like the one we're looking at today? Through the speaker, we, we find that um, people who have the option to choose not to drive for some or all of their trips um, do have reduced transportation costs, which can contribute to a lower cost of living. That's helpful, thank you. And um, my second question is sort of uh, on that same line is, uh, we know there has been an equity uh, impact assessment as part of this, and I just wondered if you could highlight for us what are some of the impacts on equity in our city as we move towards uh, making complete streets permanent, like this example. It's a complex question because equity does have many factors, but in terms of both uh, um, equity for accessibility, people of all ages and abilities, um, as well as different income levels and demographics, um, a, a complete street will, will serve um, a more equitable um, balance of needs uh, along the corridor, including opportunities to move safely without having a car. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, and thank you to staff for all your great work on this project. Those are my questions, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Speaker. Could I uh, request the clerk staff to display an image for me? So it's uh, 
nothing special about this. It's just one that I plucked off of a Google Street View. I, in fact, the Google Street View is kind of handy because you can drive down the street virtually and you see all sorts of things. But sadly, it's kind of like a increasingly common scene in Toronto. Um, I guess my question is to staff, you know, in a condition like this, is this, does this represent the 20 to 60 second delay or does it get worse from some, sometimes? These are all averages, I guess. Yeah, through you to, to Madam Speaker. Um, so again, with this particular area, we have uh, both the counts we've done, plus also we've got a lot of instrumentation there. Um, so we're getting real time information about what's going on versus sort of a snapshot image of queuing. So when you say though, over a, an average over a period, so an AM or PM peak, those AM and PM peaks are several hours in length, right? Are there not times when it gets really bad and times when it's a little better and thus you, you produce, you're not gonna produce an hourly number for us, you're gonna give us averages. Uh, three minutes speaking, actually with the data that we have, we are looking at it from an hourly perspective. So we okay. do see those nuances throughout the day. Uh, but going back to my earlier comment about the instrumentation, we do have the ability to fine tune tweak the signals in real time to accommodate for that. Are there not times when it's worse than 60 seconds? It's never happened. I don't know. Yeah, three minutes speaker specifically, I think at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, we did see that peak. Yeah. In terms of emergency vehicles, we heard that it's eight seconds, but is it fair to say there are times when it's going to be much worse than eight? I mean, like, you know, there's an example of a really busy point in the day in this picture. What would you do in this case? Madam Speaker, eight seconds represents the, the, the impact analysis to the 90th percentile. So our standard requires a 10% variance, and there is, in fact, a 10% variance, Councillor. We encounter the situations like you displayed on the screen that's not uncommon for us across the city. Right. And there are times when our response is slowed and when our emergency vehicles have to come to a stop and allow the lanes ahead of them to clear. That's just, it's an urban reality for us. Right. Is it fair to say that, you know, that if the TTC has to run surface buses, on the on the route if there's a delay in the subway i mean they too are subject to these types of delays they don't they, they can't magically bypass the traffic is that right because i know the answer we got before was like like i don't think there was a conclusive statement about what happens to ttc but but surely they're the, and they're in the same boat as the cars and the trucks that go along the street uh, through the speaker that is correct uh, effectively our buses are we're stuck in a lot of traffic before and are still in traffic today, both right. before and after the bike lanes. It is very difficult, as you know, to replace the capacity of a subway with an emergency bus service. Of course, of course. And then if it happens during the rush hour, they, they're subject to all of the other people that are trying to get down that same corridor. I guess my last question is, it's either gonna be for the clerk or the city solicitor, and I'm, I'm not sure which are able to answer this, but, um, under the strong mayor powers, could the head of council have a finding that, you know, a, a bylaw such as this affects transit and therefore, could they veto this? Could the mayor veto this? So the veto provision is new and the, the language is, is broadly worded. However, in my view, the veto should be exercised with caution. And when I read this report, I personally do not see that link between okay. housing or infrastructure to support housing. Or now, transit. the legislation does refer to uh, that link being something that must be in the opinion of the head of council. Right. Um, so I would be prepared to discuss this with the mayor if, in fact, he sees this differently. But I, I will say I do not see that link looking at the language of the legislation. Okay. But can I take it as fair that your answer isn't yes or no? That, that was it your requires last. Uh, if, if, discussion. If I were personally trying to decide whether I could veto this, my, my view would be that I, if I were in the mayor's shoes, I could not because I, I don't see that link. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. 
Thanks very much, Madam Speaker. Through you um, to staff, I have a couple questions related to the uh, plan developments. There's many applications coming forward, uh, thousands of units coming forward. And I'm wondering if we have considered uh, the Young Corridor, the Complete Street, Reimagine Young, in the context of the development that exists, not just today, but the planned development on a go-forward basis. Uh, through the speaker to Councillor Bradford, so we actually did do some modeling using the ME program uh, out through 2041 with the addition of the uh, planned developments that are in the area and we found that uh, the current configuration as well as the network itself could manage the increased volumes from those developments. Um, we also heard from a developer at the infrastructure committee who is developing building in the area and indicated that they uh, are putting in far less parking because they are going to uh, be promoting uh, both transit use and cycling use as well as walking in the corridor. And I would assume, although I don't know for sure, that through the site planning process that kind of um, uh, parking reductions are, are quite likely. And I believe the secondary plan called for such. Well, the city's moved away from parking minimums, as we know. We've had that for a couple of years now. Um, but it would, be, would it be fair or accurate to say that perhaps the proposed density with a corresponding reduction in parking is perhaps because the clientele or the marketing or the folks who are moving to that neighborhood might be making transportation-related considerations when they move there that reflect the fact that there's literally a subway underneath and there is an active transportation corridor? Is that part of the thinking? Uh, well, certainly we know that people do uh, make choices about their transportation as, a, as an overall uh, input to where they choose to live. And uh, certainly people who live in this neighborhood, or certainly on the Young Street Corridor in particular, or perhaps in the new buildings that are being built, would know that there was both uh, one of the heavy, most heavily used transit corridors in the city there, as well as connected facilities for cycling and enhanced facilities for pedestrians. So I think it would probably be a factor, but I couldn't say for sure. The secondary plan, the secondary plan that was done for this area, did it contemplate, uh, you know, I, I mean, it was done prior to a time to the world that we're in, and, um, PMTSAs and all of the provincial changes. But that work, when it was done by planning, did that contemplate the fact that we were trying to intensify and grow density where we had transit, where we had access to, to multimodal options? Uh, through the speaker, it did, in fact, uh, contemplate that. It also um, contemplated uh, future climate uh, goals and trying to ensure that we had many, many options for people walking and cycling. Um, and uh, lastly, no, I think that's it. So that's it, it contemplates that. It would also contemplate the reality in Toronto that people are going to continue to drive. Correct. Okay. So I guess all of that is to say what we have in front of us today, the pilot work that, that you've been doing over the past 18 months working with stakeholders, um, you know, hearing a wide view of perspectives, and I, it's certainly not all positive, um, but what we have in front of us here today is in fact in keeping with the direction of the secondary plan, is in fact with keeping with our climate objectives, uh, our objectives for safer streets, and uh, making sure that we're providing multimodal active transportation, stacking that on top of transit. All this makes sense. That is correct. Okay, Good. thank you. Thank you. So we'll go to speakers now. Councillor Sachs, you held the item down, so you speak first. So if we can change it, Councillor Sachs. Uh, just, just one moment. Okay, five minutes. Thank you. I have a motion, um, which I hope the clerks will put up. It's to increase the scope of the traffic study that I originally moved at IEC in order to address community concerns. But first, I want to tell you why it's so important that we make the pilot permanent today. So first of all, I'm going to ask you to look at this picture. And I'm going to ask each and every one of you to think about some young person that you love. Is there some young person that you care about? Because these are the reasons I'm here. Now, we know, whether we're ready for it or not, the climate crisis is here. And it's changing lives all over the world. And it's going to change their future and dominate their future. Even just today, two of my colleagues were telling me about the enormous dis disasters they're seeing in the places where they were born, in 
uh, Councillor Bravo in Chile and Councillor Morley in the Bahamas. The old normal is gone and is not coming back. We're beginning to see the end of normal. And science has proven we don't get to choose whether or not to change. We have some choice in how disruptive the change is going to be. We have some choice in how painful it will be. And the more we drag our feet, the more painful, the more expensive, and the more disruptive the climate crisis will be to everything that we care about. Our health, our wallets, our competitiveness, the quality of life in our city, and especially the better worlds that we've promised to those young people that we love. The city has promised those young people that we would transform our city, that we will get off fossil fuels, that we will move to the cleaner air and better health that the Medical Office of Health has just told us about. And we're not doing it. We're not keeping our word. We're not buying the thousand buses that we promised. We're, li we're lying and when we claim that we've done $2 billion of climate action, we're not delivering and my kids and yours are gonna pay the price. We can't buy our way out of climate change. We can't even buy our way to pay for the things we've already promised to do because this city's so broke. We can't count on the Ford government, which never misses an opportunity to make things worse. But what can we do? The cheapest, fastest, more transformative thing that we can do is to change who has priority in public space. People before cars. Active transportation before fossil fuels. And right now, everyone in this city, especially the people who don't have cars, are subsidizing the people who are driving, especially fossil fuels. We subsidize them with our health. We subsidize them with our air quality. We subsidize them with our wallets. We subsidize them with the damage to our infrastructure. We often subsidize them with our lives, all the people who are killed and injured on the streets. We've got billions going to the Gardner Expressway instead of your park, your library. We have to change and we can change in some ways and this is the one that we've got. The staff have done all their work. There isn't any more data that we need. Yes, of course, there was a need to try and see what we could fix and a lot has been fixed and transportation staff are going to continue to make adjustments and my motion will help make sure that that happens. But we do have to change, and the most important thing we can do is to make it safe and convenient for people to get around without a personal car, and they won't do it unless it's safe. Now, we know that bike lanes make a lot of things better. They're better for air quality. They're better for local businesses. They're better for crashes, or the, the deaths and serious injuries. They're be better for exercise. They're better for congestion. A person on a bike I cycle to work every day. I take up less room on the road than if I was driving. That leaves more room for everybody who needs to drive. It costs less for everyone for whom the cost of living is a problem. It costs the city less. It's better for climate pollution. It gives young people a better future. And besides that, it's more fun. Now, having said that, there are some concerns from the people in the community. And that's what my study is for. We shouldn't we know that the climate change is going to cause disruption. We shouldn't cause unnecessary disruption. And staff are already com committed to doing everything possible. Two thirds of the deputies last week supported making the bike lanes permit, as well as the nearly 9,000 signatories and the many residence groups for the petition I submitted yesterday. And others spoke clearly about their concerns. So I do propose that this traffic study should continue once the bike lanes are made permanent. It will be clearer where people should go, there will be less confusion. And as we learn and we see what happens with Cafe TO, we know that staff will continue to make adjustments change turn restrictions, turn lanes, bulb outs, other kinds of things that are necessary. Everything that can be done to minimize unnecessary Thank congestion you, will Sachs. be done, but we need to make the bike lanes permanent today. Thank you. Councillor Burnside. Thank you, I have a motion. I thought I had a motion. <laughs> You're messing with me. Sorry, I did you just change your fee a little bit. We had we took out the implements at the beginning. That's just, all. You just did that. Just did right. Yeah. Do I sign it or something? No. Oh, no, what do I say? No. Uh, thank you. Um, I actually agree with a lot of what um, Councillor Sachs said. The only thing I disagree with is about um, having to make this permanent right now. 
Uh, the motion I'm bringing forward is not about shifting these the bike lanes to Avenue Road or it's not about removing them. Um, it's about giving everyone an opportunity to further consult um, and for us to further consult with uh, those most affected um, by the changes and to make those structural changes when we make them permanent to make them the best that they can be. Uh, I still think we need more information in terms of uh, data and statistics and it's about um, having as council having as much information as possible so that when we make that decision uh, whether people agree with us or not they're confident that we've been fully and properly informed my motion asks for the continuation of the pilot uh, for another nine months which is till november 2023 i believe that um, taking uh, another summer to analyze the corridor and make the necessary changes we'll have a pilot in front of us in a better spot for permanency. And as I say, this isn't about um, killing the bike lanes on Young Street. It's about making them as best they can be. And I think we should all be in favor of that. And there's a part B to mine, should it, um, I believe. Have we got uh, Councillor Burnside's part B? Have we got Okay, thank you, Councillor Burnside. Councillor Matlow to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, so I have a motion. And uh, you'll see when it goes on the screen in front of you that the motion is, uh, in essence, uh, if we are to uh, make the Young Street Complete Street uh, pilot permanent, that there are a number of different um, focuses uh, that I believe reflect many much of the feedback that I've received from the community uh, to um, to work on and you know just remember even even something called permanent i mean every street in toronto is permanent if you call it that uh but through vision zero through a number of different initiatives uh they they continue to evolve and hopefully continue to become safer and improve uh we've done that with cafe to as well we continue to evolve our city and try to make it better so um regardless of you know the words you know permanent uh, there will still be work to do to uh, reflect the uh, priorities of uh, residents of ours in Midtown who live on what are colloquially referred to as the landlocked streets, along with supporting the local businesses, um, improving the, uh, the safety and attractiveness of the corridor. And there have been, you know, a lot, there's been a lot of talk about a lot of the development that is coming to Young Street, and there is. Um, and you know, the irony of this, uh, this challenge with respect to managing the development is that whether you want a through lane or parking on the curb lane or you want cafe patios or bike lanes, a staging area of a construction site is going to be a challenge. And we need to get ahead of that, and as Ms. Gray said, to make sure that we have a plan in place rather than a pilot, but a plan in place that we can work on to get ahead of that and make sure that we are planning for doing this in a, in a reasonable way. You know, the, the question of safety, um, I mean, certainly separated bike lanes are, are safer. They're safer for bicyclists. Uh, certainly, uh, as a driver, it's safer when you're not having to share the same lane uh, between a, a, a car driver and a, and a, and a bicyclist. And um, I haven't heard, nor have we, any concern come from our first our emergency responders saying that they have a concern about any delays. That they just haven't come forward and said that. Um, I actually met with the firefighters at uh, Balmoral 
And I asked them straight out without any leading questions, like, what, what's your perspective? And I, I assumed that they would express concerns, and they didn't. They actually wondered why I wanted to talk with them about it, because it was really not a focus of, 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 their, of their concern. They said that they, were, they felt very comfortable with what, what the city was doing on Young Street. Um, like overall, I think we want a Toronto that has, that's multimodal, that is safe for everyone, whether you walk or you ride or you roll uh, or you drive. And we want a city that is safe for everyone. And we also want a vibrant city. We want a fun city. We want a city that is animated and exciting and supports our businesses. I've, I've had businesses on, um, on Young Street, but not just on Young, actually throughout Midtown, and I imagine many of you in your wards, that have said that the Cafe TO saved them during the pandemic and has been such a, a, a boon for their business, but also community members who have said, yes, there are some who like can't imagine sitting on the road, I get it, but there are many who love it. Like they, they feel like we finally, it took a pandemic to get Toronto to finally have that European-like cafe patio culture that I think many of us have envied for a very long time. So Young Street is, is more vibrant with those patios and is safer for bicyclists because of the bike lanes. But of course there are concerns. Now there are some concerns that are, I think are based out of fear, but there are also reasonable concerns that my amendment seeks to address. And what, you know, speaking with staff, the assurances that I've received and their commitment is, is that it's not like it's going to just be and then they just walk away and they wash their hands. That we need to continue ensuring that as the development uh, staging comes, that we need to make sure that it's done in a way that mitigates both the occupation of the right of way, but also ensures that we still have- Five seconds. A functional, livable, and safe Young Street. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Morley to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, through you to my colleagues. This was uh, a file that was took up a lot of time uh, at our committee at IEC, and we were really glad, and I listened very intently to all 89 of the deputants who came before us to speak about this uh, important issue. Uh, while, of course, not everyone was in favor of the permanency of the Young Street pilot, the vast majority of those who came before us um, certainly were, and for a lot of different reasons. I think this is an opportunity for us to move into the future that we all want to have as Torontonians um, and I think it's a representation of incredible work uh, by our, our staff um, in various departments to really look at this issue to consult with those stakeholders we have the support of the local councillor we have a strong recommendation from staff here and I think we have a responsibility um, to urgently move on opportunities like this um, that help us get closer uh, to the kinds of um, uh, multimodal uh, alternatives um, to driving in your car uh, that we need to ensure are in place um, for us to get closer to our, um, our goals uh, as it relates to the climate. I think that this would be a very huge missed opportunity for us on council um, to dither or delay the permanency of this project. I think that we heard very clearly about future opportunities. Our city is growing at exponential rates. Um, there are large scale developments coming in and us making a clear and, and strong decision here um, in this direction allows our staff and our city to continue to grow uh, in the direction that I think we need to see it uh, grow. So I, I really do thank my colleagues for their interest on this file and for their support, um, those of you who are in support along the way. Um, I, I am in strong support uh, of this particular um, report before us and recommendation from staff. I think, again, this represents good city building, uh, good city planning, uh, and I would urge my colleagues uh, around the floor of council to support um, this recommendation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Robinson to speak. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I'd just like to say that uh, most of us have received significant correspondence uh, from various stakeholders, local residents, businesses, and community groups on this, on this issue. 
and transportation staff um, and members of council have heard um, about congestion, road safety, emergency services, and the landlocked streets. I certainly have. Um, and I've spoken at length, not once, but twice on this issue um, about transit riders and the surface transit delays on this critical corridor, critical. Line one, which is the line I frequent uh, my entire adult life, is the busiest rapid transit line in Canada. And possibly, and I believe it is the busiest in North America, carrying 825,000 riders daily pre-pandemic. And so I've been, uh, I don't drive to City Hall, I never have, many of you know that, that story. I ride the system. And so I have had this personal experience multiple times of, you know, during an emergency, and the TTC cannot help them all, they do their absolute best, but you know what, you're already late for a meeting or to get home, um, and to see your family, have dinner, and suddenly you're off in a sea of people on Young Street looking for some way home. And so uh, along the shuttles come as quick as they can, but it takes time to facilitate that. And it's, it's dangerous because there's so many people. I mean, I have photos of this. And um, then you're getting on shuttles. So delay, delay, delay. And so my concern is I've experienced it. Transit users have shared these stories with me, as have transit drivers. And, um, you, you know, we have the capital work at the TTC, but we also have these nonstop unplanned service disruptions. It's just, it's called the transit system. So I think it's very important we consider these shuttles um, and the thousands of riders that are using them on a daily basis. Now, COVID has changed some of that, but it is, it is creating more chaos and disruption. And the end result is riders are being delayed. That's my opinion. Um, and if we want to get riders back, we need to get them to places in a safe and reliable way. That is critical. Crowded shuttle buses caught in congestion in Young Street actually may discourage riders from using the TTC. And so this is my worry and my concern, and it's very tough. You know, again, adored Young Street my whole life, lived off of Young Street. The right of way there is very narrow. It goes in and out. It's a bit of a dog's breakfast, even though it's a magical street. And um, I'm not sure how many how many road users you can accommodate when you're trying to get 825,000 people up and down it. Um, and because it's so heavily used, there is more incidences, unfortunately, unfortunately there. So I'm going to be supporting the um, extension of the pilot. It, we haven't got it right. I've heard it repeatedly from people. And the point of a pilot is actually to try your best and see if it works and get it right. We, we tried and we have not got it right to date. And um, like I said, my number one concern is this, as a, as a Young Street City Councillor, um, that at some point with th that many people jammed on the system, and having to backtrack to go north to get on the system, going from getting on the Eglinton, going north to York Mills to get on. Uh, if we if we ever get back to that, it would be amazing. But um, in a way, I mean, that sounds funny. But um, the bottom line is, it is packed pre-pandemic. And so we are going to have to look at prioritizing Young as a transit, as a transit corridor. It's going to have to be a priority. And um, I just think that's very important. So I don't buy this emotional, uh, I'm sorry, not emotional, environmental argument. I mean, I have three children. I want a green future. Um, but slowing down and delaying transit riders, that is not the way forward. There must be another north-south north, corridor that won't impact 825,000 riders. And, of course, not many people are riding it. We've heard 1,500. Yeah, Richmond Hill is 6,000. So... I just hope we can really think about this um, and transform TO in that context of all those riders. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I have a motion. I should have that displayed. It's very simple terminate the active TO Young Street 
cycling network expansion project. So uh, there's been a couple of themes in our meeting this week, uh, but I would say that congestion has been one of them. Uh, there's this debate, there's the debate around CAF ATOs, um, there's the motion passed to, uh, to send uh, the administrative inquiry on the gardener to the committee. Congestion, congestion, congestion. Uh, many members of council, I'm sure, noticed, not with pride, but with embarrassment, that we were ranked top in the world. Top in the world for what? Among the top, I should say, is congestion. I think it was seventh in the world was the stat. 118 hours spent by commuters in the GTA a year on congestion. Someone talks about quality of life. Just make life better, more livable. But when you spend 118 hours sweating in your vehicle, trying to get from one place to the other, probably to work or trying to get home, trying to feed kids, trying to get to maybe a recreational activity. And we all know in this city, that's not just at rush hour. Traffic seems to be every day of the week, seven days of the week. Here we are, we're talking about something at council about taking two lanes or sustaining taking two lanes off one of the busiest streets in the city. One of the major arteries that people take to come into the downtown core. Yet I think this vote will just be another brick in the wall or maybe another raising of the drawbridge or burning of the bridge. Same thing that we did on King Street, on Bloor Street, and I'm sure there are plans for all the other arterials. The point I want to leave council on this, because I, I understand where the votes are. I understand it doesn't matter if the report said it was faster or slower, longer or shorter, or people were angry or they not. There's an ideological approach to this. It's about maybe what somebody said to me in an irate email after the CAFE TEO vote. If you don't like the congestion, just don't drive. That was literally the quote. That's too bad. There's a lot of people that suffer because of these. They don't feel connected with their city. They don't feel connected to the downtown of the city. And that's creating a fracture. So we talk about businesses and success and the downtown core and wanting to come here. But who wants to come here if you're going to sit through traffic? And I know, put more money into transit. They'll take it. If you build it, they'll come. I'm just, I'm just trying to represent the voice of so many people in this city and so many people that have told me they're so frustrated with how hard it is to move about. And it seems like council just doesn't care. It is driven by uh, ideology. But I'm gonna move this motion anyway because I want people to be accountable for what they vote on. Thank you for uh, letting me speak, Speaker. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Bravo has a question for you, clarification yeah. of the motion. Three, Three minutes. To you, Speaker, uh, to Councillor Holliday. Do you consider people that travel by bike a commuter? Well, I don't know how much of that is clarification, but uh, sure, there's all sorts of people that commute in the city. Just, I'm referring to your the speech that you made in the company. I know, but you can't. Your, your if you'd like motion. to debate it, we can. Okay, Pardon? but um, Councillor Bravo, uh, I'm ask a question it. on the motion that he's moving. Okay. Clarification of his motion. Is your motion intended to help all forms of commuting, including cycling? The motion is to terminate the active TO Young Street Cycling Expansion Network. There it is there. Yeah. And, and I, I understand that you're concerned about um, gridlock and, and the, delay, you, the delays that you cited in relation to the delays in, the, in Toronto compared to other parts of the world. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, I mean, we're the, uh, I think we're seventh in the world on congestion. 118 hours is what I read in the correct. news story. And many places that are doing much better, are they not turning to... Uh, wa like walking and cycling infrastructure to deal with gridlock? I, I suppose you should tell people that's what they should do. Just like the letter I got. <laughs> if you don't like the congestion, don't drive is what they said. Right. So if we're is that, is that the message? I mean, tell that to people. I mean, yeah, you, if we, if we want to encourage uh, people to, uh, to take, make the shift, for example, I, would, I like to cycle to work. Great. Um, I find it very uh, frightening to I do I love it in public the transit. 
Um, I cycle all the way up to St. Clair. It's really good for your health. Um, and I'm just wondering if we want to, if we want to encourage that change of mode, shouldn't we, isn't it important that we offer a safe and predictable way to get there? I, I think, well, if you feel that strongly, you should tell all the people in the cars, stuck in the traffic, that they shouldn't drive. I'm not telling anyone in any car. I'm saying that if I want to make the choice to remove make a car choice. by getting on a bike, is it you. incumbent on this on us to make sure that that's a safe choice? That's that's great that you have that choice. Okay. I don't think everyone does. Thank, no, thank but you. But if people, but that, that's okay, Councillor Bravo. It's we need to ask questions on clarification of his. Thank motion. you, Madam Speaker. Okay, thank you. Sure, we can debate. Councillor Myers, a clarification of the motion. Uh, thank Three you. minutes. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, just to clarify, Councillor Holliday, uh, does your motion anticipate what will happen to the people that are currently using Young Street to cycle? I, I suppose they still can. So does your motion make any accommodation for how these people will cycle safely? I suppose they'll Young cycle or the same street? way they did before the pilot started. Uh, Councillor Holliday, do you realize that Every year, about 44 people are killed in this city every year due to being hit by cars. Are you inferring that suddenly uh, the, the lanes are magically going to change all that? No, what I'm, infer what I'm inferring is that this is done in part to make that statistic go down as part of our Vision Zero program. And I'm also inferring that this motion is inconsistent with the Vision Zero policies that have been adopted by this council. I suppose a lot of things are. Pardon? I suppose a lot of things are. Right. Well, don't you think that? <laughs> I mean, Fair enough. I, Fair enough. Um, don't you, you think tell that? Tell everybody we, not to drive. <laughs> Just like the, the, the letter. Please, let's keep on topic here. I, like, no, you know, I know. Speaker, I, I, mean, I they understand. They want to debate. I'm, I understand. I'm, here, right? I'm not trying to debate. I'm trying to understand how this is consistent with what council's <laughs> already voted for. Well, yeah. It's his opinion. Like he doesn't it's an opinion. He doesn't support bike, bike lanes. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if I can be any clearer, but. She did sum it up. That's true. <laughs> Councillor Moyes, do you have a clarification? <clears throat> sure, I'll try to keep it as a clarification. So, Councillor Holliday, you know, I know you drive into the city to come I to work actually. every day, but I actually live I don't. here. Well, no, yeah, whatever how we get here. I live here um, I in the core of the city. And so I also sit on TPA, Toronto Parking Authority, and one of the things that they're championing is actually having more bike shares across the city, and a lot of them being downtown. And so the conversation, conversation I've had with them is that uh, they can't keep up with the demand of all the bike shares that you know they they, they keep producing that's not what the financial is a demand said. to it so so as someone who lives downtown um and let's say your motion passed <laughs> in, in some sort of america way what do you expect all the bike shares that are now on the road the electric scooters that are now occupying the the, the bike lanes even the electric wheelchairs i've seen using the bike lanes so if we were to remove the active TO on Young Street and elsewhere across the city, as you suggested, where do you expect these people, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people to go? Do you expect the them to, be, to go on the sidewalk? The exact same place they went in 2020 along the road. On the road. Uh, that's what they do Not a, the because city. I'm so <laughs> unless, unless you're proposing like to ban bikes on the street or something well i mean you know they could go on the sidewalk as the a lot of people it's have not a in binary, the past, and that was a it's problem it's not a binary concept right okay. um, and again councillor uh holiday point of clarification madam speaker <laughs> um one of the things that active to has done regarding the bike lanes is dividing the streets from the bike lanes to reduce um Fatal fatalities in our city. So, also so uh, the can you please ask your question on the clarification of the motion? Well, I'm asking. Yeah. I'm asking Council Halvey. You know, if oh. his motion was to go through. Yeah. 
What about the safety of, the, of people, commuters in the city? Get a report who on use, that the staff, who, who use these but, facilities? I think the motion is pretty clear. Yeah. Well, it's not. That's why I'm asking this point well, of clarification. I think, you know, it's a uh, pie in the sky kind of motion. But anyways, thank you. It's very clear. Okay. Uh, I don't disagree with that. <laughs> Councillor Malik to speak. Thank you very much. Um, so I am supporting all the recommendations in this report. And I will remind um, this body that these are staff recommendations, which we have spent the day talking so pointedly about and how important it is to respect and um, you know, take on board those staff recommendations with the seriousness and the weight that they deserve. So I will reiterate again that I support all the staff recommendations in this report. And I want to take a moment to thank all those who have worked on the active TO Midtown Complete Street Pilot. I want to thank staff, I want to thank neighbors, and I want to thank advocates. Throughout this pilot, we have seen an increase in pedestrian use, safer connections for cyclists, and increased access to our Cafe TO program. The city has laid out its plan for streets that welcome all users. This pilot project has showcased to Torontonians and beyond how it can be done. And after an 18-month pilot, it is time to approve this project. With permanency, Midtown will have the opportunity to transform temporary curb extensions into permanent planters and upgrade streetscape design to create an even more welcoming environment and to get us even further in terms of our climate leadership. I want to commend the local community and organizations such as Young for All, Cycle TO and the Bikeways Coalition and my colleagues, the local councillors, for their leadership where they have given it in creating a better, safer and healthier community for all of us. This is an incredible opportunity and I'm very excited for us to do the right thing follow staff recommendations, and make this pilot permanent. Thank you. Thank you. So our last speaker is Mayor Tory. Mayor? Well, Speaker, first of all, can I start off by saying that I will not be supporting Council Holiday's uh, motion. Um, but I want to be clear at the same time, in terms of what I will be doing, uh, that I continue to be a supporter of bike lanes and, the, and building them the best way possible, which includes a way that is compatible with the best interests of the neighborhoods in question. That's how we make progress, to make sure that these things carry with them the confidence of all the people, but including in particular people who are most directly affected. And I, I stand by being able to say that credibly, that I support that way of doing things because it is without a contradiction that I can say that since I was elected in 2014, uh, they, there has been built in the city an unprecedented amount of bikeways, 125 kilometers in fact, and we're going to build more, and it is going to be far in excess of the accomplishment of previous administrations, all of them. The debate today is about building what's best for Young Street and for the residents and businesses there, and I think they do have to be placed first at the end of the day because they live there and they, they are the ones that are cycling there, perhaps more so in greater numbers than anybody else. They're the people doing business, they're the people walking, they're the people living there. And I think it's about having the best main street in that neighborhood that we can possibly have, and especially when you take into account there are dozens, literally dozens of construction projects yet to come there. You know that, that they're approved. It's about, um, and I, I would like to, 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 to say at the same time as that we're dealing with a recommendation from staff, I, 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 of course I acknowledge that, to make this permanent, that we do whatever we can to make sure that the community's concerns, which I don't think have yet been completely addressed in the way that we could if we took a bit of extra time, can be properly addressed. The objective is to make this better. Extending the pilot does not take out these bike lanes, let's be clear. It doesn't affect the climate change benefits between now and when the pilot comes to an end. They're still there. It doesn't affect the safety concerns, just very legitimately raised. They're still there. People will still be able to use these bike lanes. They're still there. I believe extending the pilot is what's called the improve option. The improve option. 
My office in the last two months got 784 emails. And, and you know, there's been talk about well, how I was going around having meetings with the people that live in this neighborhood and the businesses and so on. They are my constituents too, because I have 3 million constituents as mayor. And I think for me to meet with them is the least I could do to sit and listen as I did. And what they said to me, and by the way, I did get 722 emails on the other side. But that often seems to me when you get that evenly matched number and hundreds of emails on both sides as an issue that might require further consideration. We do have to make a decision at some time, and I'm not saying anything even close. In fact, I express, expressly said I rejected what, Dep what uh, Councillor Holliday got up and said at the beginning. Uh, and I am saying, though, that I think we should take the time to listen to people's concerns, to address them, and in that respect, I think Councillor Burnside's motion sets out in very clear and very firm terms, not things we want sort of studied and considered and thought about, things that must be done to make sure that these bike lanes uh, that are, would still under my wish and his, obviously, with this motion, be in a pilot for an additional period of time to see if we could do better. And so that is why I extend the pilot, I support extending the pilot, so that we can get the right things done before we make it permanent. And that in the meantime, the climate change benefits of it, the safety benefits, all those things are still there while we work to make it, benefit, make it better. And it would be my sincere hope that if we extend the pilot, which I hope we would, that we can then spend the time doing all the things that are outlined in Councillor Burnside's motion and more to make these the best bike lanes they could possibly be that address these concerns very legitimately and rationally put, because I witnessed it firsthand, not just reading emails by the local residents. And I think that arranges all the way from emergency responses to uh, traffic considerations to uh, business concerns. Uh, I heard facts that hadn't surfaced in any of the, what I'd heard previously about the business impact this has had on some businesses, which has been very severe. And the whole idea of this, and it has worked out. My experience with bike lanes, which is pretty considerable here, is that every time they've been put in, the, the, the longer that time goes on, that as you continue to make changes, refine signal timing, refine the, the bike lanes themselves, and so forth and so on, they get better. And I think that as opposed to having something that the neighborhood views, for right or for wrong, and it's most of them, as being jammed on them and, and, and that we're not taking the time to fully address and properly address these concerns, the better we're off, off we're going to be in terms of them having confidence in what we're doing here. Uh, and, and it's about having the best streets possible and making neighborhoods, these neighborhoods here, part of that process. And uh, so I am uh, given these very real concerns expressed to me in person and in the emails that I received and so on in favor of extending the pilot. And I realize this may well be baked. I hope it isn't because I hope people would think about this for a second and say, well, you know, if you really think about it, what's wrong with extending the pilot? Why is there a rush to do this where we could spend the time earning the confidence of the local people who I believe have spoken far more about concerns they have about this that we can fix and make better so that we have a better product that will earn their confidence? And why wouldn't we do that? What is the rush? to make them permanent. We're not taking them out. I've said I expressly will vote against that when it comes up for a vote. We have built bike lanes. We're going to build more. I'm proud of that. I'm determined to do that because it's the right thing to do for climate change, for transportation options, for mobility, for safety. But I think what we have to do here, and we're on track to achieve, by the way, our plan to build 100 kilometers of bikeways by the end of 2024. But I think this one deserves further care, further improvement. It's the improve option to extend the pilot. It's only until November, but there's lots of time with this directive kind of motion that Councillor Burnside uh, moved to get those improvements in place and earn the confidence of the people who live around there, who I'm standing to represent today, among others, because I think they deserve to have that voice uh, here at the City Council. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Moore, do you have a, a, a motion to the Mayor? So. Uh, a question, yes. Yeah. So the mayor didn't move a motion, but... No, but I, I have to, I, I, yeah, I'm able to okay. ask questions, and I'm happy to. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you to uh, you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we heard from staff today that there may be some missed opportunities as it relates to future large-scale development along this corridor if we do not go forward with the permanency option today at Council. And I was just looking for, um, for your... So, sorry, the sound here is so bad. You said missed opportunities with respect to what? Um, so there are some large-scale developments, as I understand, potentially large-scale residential building developments within this corridor um, that staff have highlighted as an important opportunity if we're able to make this permanent for the developers uh, of those particular areas to be able to incorporate their plans um, and, uh, and developments as part of a 
permanent uh, and dependable um, yeah. uh, extension here or permanency. Three so I just speaker. wondered what your thoughts were okay, as it relates to speaker. that. I'm not knowledgeable enough, enough about all those developments to know which ones are at a stage where we have to make that decision because we're talking about a pilot that would be extended for, I guess, about six months or eight months. Um, and I would say two things. First, uh, eight months, I don't know how many of them are reaching the stage where they're going to make final arrangements that can't be changed if the bike lane, if and when the bike lane was made permanent later this year after some improvements. And secondly, I would say that even if they are finalized, their plans, um, there's no reason that change couldn't be made after they're made permanent later. And you can go to them and say, well, now this has changed a bit and you're probably going to want to change your development. So I, I'm not diminishing the question at all. I'm just saying I don't, I can't imagine that's going to be a big issue. How many developments will have their final, final, not, none of them are being built, or there's one or two that are, but they're already being built. So yes. I, I just don't think that's a big consideration that's going to cause us to have a lot of, as you said, lost opportunities. Respectfully, I, I, yeah, I don't no, know. I yeah, no, I appreciate that, and I yeah. just wanted to, to touch yeah. base on that. Um, I have a second question, and it's, uh, you've highlighted this uh, motion as an improve, opportunity to improve, and my understanding of the responses we've received from staff today is that even in the event that we make this permanent and vote on that today, um, there will, of course, still be ongoing opportunities to improve the project along the way and so I just wanted to hear your comments on that only to say through you speaker and uh, that in the event that the, the council votes to make them permanent I would hope every one of those changes and I know some of them I thought I know were put forward by Councillor Matlow as well who's supporting making them permanent every, I hope every one of those changes that's suggested in the two motions Councillor Burnside's and Councillor Matlow's and I think they have many similar things in them those things are done Got it. because uh, right now I, I believe that the voice of the local residents has not been adequately addressed in terms of things we could do and probably should do with those bike lanes. And I believe that to have this period between now and I think it's November with the pilot would end. Let's remember as well, the original pilot was to end in November, I believe. And then it was made earlier. And now all we're doing is going back to the original date to give it two full years. And you know what? Uh, my discovery over things like, I, I don't remember the times on Bloor and Danforth and so on, but I think that period of time may be the right period of time to allow you to do the things you should do and have to do to be re both responsive to the safety and, and environmental and other concerns of people from around the city, but also responsive to those 784 people. 784 <coughs> people. And you know what? They put their addresses and their postal codes on their emails to me so I could see they were residents of this area. And I didn't even mention, and I brought it here today, the landlocked streets. This is unique in the whole city. I would say there's never been a bike lane we put in where there are, I think, 11 landlocked streets, the ones marked in orange, yeah. where people literally have nowhere to go except to go on Young Street. And almost every other place on Bloor and other places like that where we put in bike lanes, people had other streets they could use to get around. And so I think these are the kinds of things that are unique enough that it, it warrants, out of respect for those people, the extra time and the businesses you know, businesses told me there aren't enough loading and unloading zones and so on. I know those things are covered in the motions that are in front of us, but why not take the time? You know, what, what actually is the rush here? Like, mm -hmm. what is going to happen, aside from maybe that missed opportunity you referred to, and I'm not even sure there's much of that, but what's going to happen between February and, and November that is going to uh, be, be the end of the world as we know it, mm -hmm. that is going to adversely affect climate change? The lanes are staying in during that time for another whole summer right. that we can see how we can improve them. They've improved since they first started. Mm -hmm. We should continue with that improvement by doing all the things listed in Councillor Burnside's motion and Councillor Matlow's for that matter. I haven't had a chance to peruse his as carefully. Yeah, absolutely. And in the meantime, we still have the bike lanes, still have the environmental benefits, still have the safety, and yet we actually can maybe make sure that some of the people from that neighborhood have more confidence in what's being done in their neighborhood. Yes. Their neighborhood. Yes, and I would note uh, that there were a number of folks within those landlocked streets that you highlighted uh, who did come down and who participated and shared their experiences. Um, so I appreciate you being a voice for them today. I would also just note that there were 8,000 petition uh, folks who signed a petition and the vast majority from uh, the Young for All folks who showed us live in the area. I don't know if that was a question, area. Speaker, about so. the 8,000 people, but I would say to you, let's remember something. And I'm not saying those people are residents of the city of Toronto. They're cycling enthusiasts, and that's, that's great. I'm, and I'm, I, engage, I, I'm, I'm, I, I welcome the fact they engaged themselves in the process. But 8,000 of them from a city of 3 million people spread across the city, and they were the ones that wrote the 722 emails, I would say is, uh, you know, th th that's worthy of careful consideration. So in particular are 784 emails and hundreds of people I gather that have signs on their lawn. I haven't seen them. 
signs on their lawn saying they, and I think some of them say they want to stop the bike lanes. I don't. I mean, I, I want to simply improve them and I want to make sure we study carefully the results of that improvement through the next six or eight months and find a way to earn the confidence of some of those very same people who wrote the emails to my office and I think the local councillors and who uh, are people that are um, having the signs on their lawns. I'd like them to take that sign down and rip it up and put it in the back of their house of, to take out with the recycling uh, because they say, you know what, they've made these bike lanes bearable by taking the extra time to do it properly. Thank you. Okay, so we're ready to vote. What? Oh, sorry, it was underneath. Councillor Myers, question to the mayor. Councillor Myers, go thank, ahead. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the mayor for your leadership on uh, putting these bike lanes in. So my question is, if the plan is to have up to 100 kilometers by 2024, I believe is the date, people are going to complain every time you put in bike lanes. So are we going to actually reach that target if every time we put in bike lanes, we have to keep extending these pilots um, if we're trying to actually reach this goal? Is that feasible? Based on my very short experience as a counselor, no matter what you do, people are going to complain. and. From my understanding is that you can still make the majority of these improvements while making the project itself permanent. So through you, Speaker, I would say two things. First of all, um, I'm used to complaints about bike lanes. But you know what? In all the ones that I have overseen putting in as mayor and as, as the person who brought a lot of those to council and including during the pandemic, I stood in there. I went out onto Bloor Street and Councillor Cressy, if he was here, and Councillor Mitlate and former councillors would confirm. I went out there. When, when people were saying that you know, this was gonna be the end of Bloor Street as we knew it. And I said, well, we're gonna, we're gonna have a pilot and we're gonna make improvements, and we did. And they have the confidence today of the people there and they're there. And similarly, Councillor Fletcher would have to confirm, much as she may be on the different side of this than me, I went to the Danforth and I stood there when people told me the entire Danforth would be closed. Every business would be closed and I said, no, this is the right thing to do. We're gonna put it in and we're gonna make it better and we're gonna improve it over time, which we did and they're still there. The objective here is to improve them. And I repeat something, I do not understand, and we will not go backwards, we're gonna achieve that target that you made reference to, and we're on track to do that. But I will tell you, this is called the improve option, not the delete option. The delete option was moved by Councillor Holliday, and I'm gonna vote against that. But, and I told the people when I went to meet them, the local residents, and I do not apologize for going to meet them. I, they're my constituents too. And they told me grave concerns they had, which were, if you had discounted them by 50%, they're still serious enough to be taken seriously by this council and by me as mayor. And to me, I ask the question again, six months of making those improvements and allowing them to feel that we heard them and, and gained their confidence as we did with Bloor Street, as we did with Danforth, I don't understand what the, what, what the, the, the hardship is that's gonna be done as a result of taking that time to extend this pilot and to do exactly the things that are in both motions to make them better, the improve option. Not the delay option, not the delete option, not the afraid option. It's one that says, let's get and keep the confidence of the people who live there in this part of town, uh, and, then, and then go forward with a bike lane that is more acceptable to them and to the cycling community. Because I assume every, anything we do to improve it will be good for the cycling community too, the people who rode in on the other side. I understand that, and I appreciate what you're answering. I you know, applaud you for your leadership on this file. I just don't think it's going to be realistic to reach this target if every time we install bike lanes, we have to keep studying them after staff have already recommended that they be made permanent. Do we have the staff capacity to keep studying these projects, in, not indefinitely, but longer than is necessary when we can still make the improvements, um, I, 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 so we can still speaker, make the improvements while making them permanent? Speaker, through you. I fully respect the tenor of your question. And I would just say to you, if it comes down to the budget over which I have some influence now more so than perhaps used to be the case, I would support. If the issue was capacity of staff to make them better and to improve them as opposed to maybe doing things in too much of a hurry, we will not delay those. The bike lanes will get done by 2024. We will do what we have to do to get them right. But to me, the important part is get it right as opposed to hurry up. And, and we'll make the 2024, we're on track to do it. 
But in this particular case, which is all that's in front of us today, I'd say, let's get it right. If we need more staff to be able to do that and proceed with the rest of the 100 kilometers, you just talk to me about that, and I will put that forward myself as an amendment to my own budget. But I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue is that people seem to think somehow we've got ourselves convinced that it's important we do this today and make it permanent today when I don't even understand what we lose. We don't lose climate change. We don't lose safety. We don't, you know, we get a chance to listen to the businesses, listen to the neighbors, address the landlocked issue, address technology, which we've already started to implement there in terms of keep things moving on the street. There's a whole host of concerns we get to address in six months. The lanes will still be there, and then we'll come back here and have, uh, see how we've improved things. And hopefully, as I say, a lot of those local residents will have gone and ripped up their signs and said, you know what, you've addressed this, you've got the improve option, you took the time, thank you. We enhance our confidence in, in those bike lanes and in government itself because you took the time as a council and as a government to do that. That is what I believe we're here to do. Thank you. Pardon? Uh, just a, a brief point of privilege, uh, just as instructed by the clerk. Um, I, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we, we made a, a slight variance to my motion so that it could be conducive to whatever eventuality happens here. Uh, and so I just want to remove the word, I'm going to remove the word permanent from Midtown Young Street Complete Street configuration because it, it actually is, it, it doesn't matter to the intent of the motion, but it will it make sure that it's in order for either eventuality because the items here are, as the mayor I, I think was sort of alluding to, are specifically in reflection to the kind of issues that we want, want addressed. So I just... To the instruct by the instruction of the clerk, just to put that on the record that we're doing that. Did, the, did I do it? Did I do that adequately? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if we can make that correction when we put the motion on the screen. All right. Okay. So we're ready to vote. First motion. Count, uh, motion 2A by Councillor Burnside, recorded vote. Councillor Crisanti, may we have your vote, please? Affirmative. Affirmative, thank you. Councillor Peruzza here online. Uh, affirmative. Thank you, Councillor Peruzza. Motion 2A does not carry. The vote is 16 to 10. Next, next motion is motion by Councillor Holliday, motion four. <laughs> motion four by Councillor Holliday, it's on the screen.
It is. And Councillor Peruzza, may we have your vote, please? I'm sorry, which one is this one? This is motion for holiday. No, holiday. no, no uh, against. Thank you. Motion four does not carry. The vote is 24 to two. Motion one by Diane Sack, Councillor Sachs. Councillor Prudson, may we have your vote, please? Uh, in favor. Thank you. Motion one carries unanimously, 26 in favor. Motion 2B by Councillor Burnside, recorded vote. Um, councillors, we're in the middle of a vote. Can you please try to keep it down? Okay. Councillor Perks, you should have asked. Well, you should have asked a question when Councillor Burnside moved the motion. We're in the middle of a vote. Okay. Well, let's finish the vote. Well. Well, the motion's on the screen. What is your point of order, Councillor Perks? We're in the middle of a vote. We, I understand that. You don't have a point of order in I the do. middle of a vote. I do have a point of order. You, why didn't you ask the question to Councillor Burnside when he moved the motion? It doesn't require me to have asked a question in order for me to have a right to ask a point of order, raising a point of order. What is your point of order? I, I want to understand if there's budget for this. Huh. Councillor Saxes says do a report and ask a question. I want to understand. Yes, there's budget. Thank you. Okay, let's move on. Okay, we've got the vote completed. Councillor Sachs, please, can you stay in your seat while we're voting? Councillor Perutza, may we have your vote, please? Councillor Perutza, if you're still connected. Uh, uh, sorry, thank you. Yes, uh, uh, I'm sorry. This is this is the, the motion to, to make some changes and improvements to the lane. So in favor. Yes, it's Councillor Burnside's motion. Yes, in favor. Thank you. In favor, you. thank you. Motion to be carries. The vote is 19 to 7. Okay. And then our last motion is motion number three by Councillor Matlow.
Councillor Carroll, may we have your vote, please? And Councillor Peruzza, may we have your vote, please? In favor. Thank you. Motion three carries 25 to one. Okay, item is amended on favor. Recorded vote, item is amended. Councillor Peruzza, may we have your vote, please? In favor. Thank you. The item as amended carries 22 to 4. Okay, our next item is EX 2.1, reestablishing council advisory bodies. Councillor Carroll, you held the item down. Do you have questions to staff? Pardon? Yeah, we're at the top of the agenda now. Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes, uh, just quickly, if, if uh, who's answering the questions of staff? I'm not sure who's in. I think there's a changing of the guard that needs to go on. Uh, just quickly, I'm just uh, I'm I'm wondering at how the uh, um, the strong mayor model has uh, has a uh, um, an influence over these. Uh, it has always been. I wonder if you could differentiate. It has always been uh, the mayor's prerogative. He has some powers of appointment in the City of Toronto Act, and always has done, and that uh, that sometimes you know generates the discussion that leads to who should chair it from the from from council who should lead these advisory bodies. But have there been any changes made to how we pick the public appointees to any of these bodies? Thank you, Councillor. Uh, through the Chair, through the Speaker, um, the public appointments processes for the Council advisory bodies, there's no recommended changes to that in this report. So the changes or the report that you see before you it primarily speaks to the terms of reference for these advisory bodies mm -hmm. um, and to sort of sets out their mandate for the term and things such as that. Um, there are no proposed changes at this time to the way that we work with uh, divisional staff from economic development, people in equity and so on in order to do those recruitments. The one exception uh, would be, as the report notes, there is uh, a consultation process which is underway to work with Indigenous uh, members right. of the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee and community right. members. Following the outcome of that work, um, the public appointments process for that particular committee might change in order to best meet the needs of whatever the revised mandate of that committee might be, if there are, if there are changes made to that. Otherwise, I would say our, the work that we do in public appointments has uh, not changed in light of anything in this report before you. Right, so there's the for the there's still that advisory body sort of panel model that 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 would look at the appointments. Do we not do we not uh, put together we, in in the ones where we need to we put together a panel uh, confronting anti-black racism, for instance, uh, and it describes this in the report. Mm -hmm. It was based on how the strategy was formed, and so we let you know social development, finance, and admin lead the process of making sure we have constructive leaders of the community in that uh, position. And so if, if similar to the Aboriginal Affairs Committee, if you wanted to make a change to that now, would it be the same sort of process whereby rather than have us do it on the floor of council, if we're really looking for community advice, rather than us do it on the floor of council, you would take that advisory body through a process similar to what Aboriginal Affairs Committee is going through and they could propose 
an improvement to the model if, if one needed to be made? So I'll, I'll have, um, I think there's two parts to your question, Councillor, through the chair. Uh, Meg, Rich, Meg uh, Shields from the city she manager's did. office, I think can speak to that uh, consultation process for the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee. I understand she's online. I'll just say quickly oh, that- online, okay. To, to, to answer the first part of your oh. question, um, that's correct what you describe in general, the selection process for things like the Confronting Anti-Black Racism Advisory Committee. Our office would support the outreach and application intake and then staff within that team and SDFA who are sort of the policy and program experts for that area yes. uh, would, would undertake the selection process which then reports through the Civic Appointments Committee. Okay, and did we, that those those are those are the those are the things outlined in the report. The reason I'm asking the questions, maybe I should clarify. Sort of had a preamble to my question. I'm asking the questions because the report came out, and then people started thinking, "Hey, why is it that way? How should we change this?" And I I'm really impressed with the the uh, the iterative and deeply considered process that's going on through the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee. And so for each of these, do we have real embedded policy that speaks to the structure right now? <laughs> or, or is this document, the document that's before us looks at here is how it came to be, here is, here is how we have formed it up until now. If we were going to change that, it's a real policy change. And, and, and we should actually work with that group before we start changing it. Yeah, I think I'll make okay. Shields a better answer that, I think, than me. Great, thank you, Councillor, for your question. Uh, yes, oh, uh, I can the see your face. Hi, Meg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one committee is, in fact, going through this review, and a couple things we hope uh, to learn actually from that process to see how we could be uh, incorporating some learnings uh, from that review in our broader uh, engagement and also council advisory body processes. Certainly, uh, council advisory bodies uh, have uh, changed over many terms and yes. are always open to hearing from the members about ways in which uh, they, their mandates or the way in which they function uh, can be updated. You'll note attached to this report, the simplified procedures are being amended as well. Uh, and, right. you know, the one caveat is that any changes would need to come back to council, uh, but it is certainly a part of an ongoing discussion that we've had over every term I've been at the city, uh, those committees have in fact changed. Right. But as to the recommendations in the report, they're before us now, but we, we haven't as a council had any sort of committee discussion on them. This is a report directly to council. So if we were going to start to veer from these recommendations, that really should be referred somewhere where you would have a deeper conversation, not just make a, you know, not cause a ramification by spitballing on the floor of council. Okay. That, that was your last question. You're way over five minutes. That's why I got really blunt about it. Yeah. You don't want a spitballing on the floor okay. of council. Th thank you. Am I right about that? Yeah. Yes, councillor, we would, we would be looking to the members uh, and our broader engagement to inform those decisions. Thank you. So, councillor Carroll, did you want to speak? Yes. Please. Okay, Councillor Carroll to speak. Yes, Madam Speaker, I can adopt the recommendations. And, and, and my, my reason for speaking is I want to make sure that it is, in fact, the recommendations we adopt. Because in each, these are all very unique. There isn't one process for each. Most of the, them were born out of, uh, it depends on what the strategy is that we're serving here. Um, you know, the, the music advisory, you want to make sure that you're re reflecting all of the industry and the public members. And then you want to make sure that you've got some people who know a little bit about it, if there is such a thing, in the, the rich talent pool that is council. And so that, that's the work that goes on. Confronting anti-black racism was a matter of, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Campbell pulling together. That advisory body was uh, culled out of the people who helped develop the, the confronting anti-black racism strategy. Who's, who's a leader in that place. And then once it, uh, once it was formed, it also pulled in more people because you know, we don't know everything. And once we brought that you know, community representation that was geographical as well as community leaders, they also said, you know, there's a young person that should be here. There's a person doing this. There's a person doing that. Can we pull them in? So they had a more a loose thing. Um, in each of these, 
is really born out of what, what we were trying to achieve and, and what staff learned when they pulled them into a room, which is why you see them, in order to restrike them, sort of sticking to those formats. And then what could easily happen in any of them is what is going on, well, wrapping up almost, but what is going on uh, with the, the process in the uh, Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee, a more mature committee at this point, but uh, uh, they have themselves said, over time we've achieved a lot, but we need to really look at our format. And they're going through a real formal review to decide going forward, now that we're really well into trying to embed TRC, take them beyond gestures to TRC needs to be a, a true lens on what we do. They're now looking at, do we have the membership and the functionality in this committee to achieve that? And that's the maturity of their process where you hope all of these uh, groups will get. And so that's why I wanted to say, I'll move the staff recommendations because they allow us to fill that room and then hear from them what to do next if we want to change, because they'll give us the best advice. That's why they're called advisory bodies, <laughs> not to be too glib about it, but that's, that's really the, the, the essence of it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay? I just, I Councilor know. Bradford. I, oh, okay. Madam Speaker, if I may, I'm, I'm working on something on this item. It's not ready. Would we be able to hold this down? I know we're all in a rush. Yes. Uh, I, and Shelly can keep holding it. It doesn't matter to me. I just need some time. Okay, so let's hold this item down. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, thank you. All right, so right now, if I can have members, let's try to do some quick releases. Do we have any quick releases? Uh, Councillor Crawford, I heard that you have one. Well, does anybody want to release anything at this time? Councillor Sachs. Councillor Sachs. Councillor Sachs, quick release. Councillor Sachs, your name is here. Do you have a quick release or not? Okay, forget it then. Yes, we are. I said it three times. Councillor Councillor Crawford, quick release. I have two MM 3.8 expressing support for okay, Bill. Okay, just a sec. MM? MM 3.8 expressing support for Bill 5. I have a referral motion to the Integrity Commissioner and to report back to Council. So you're releasing MM 3.8? Yeah, I have a motion. You have a motion? No, so it was referral to Executive. We're referring it now to the Integrity Commissioner. This was, this was advice I received from the Integrity Commissioner. He wasn't here to be okay, able to Okay, so the motion answer. is on the screen, so you're, re you're referring the member's yep. motion to the Integrity Commissioner, right? That's correct, yeah. Okay, motion's on the screen, MM 3.8. On favor, show pants carried. Hey, go? Councillor Crawford, do you have any, uh, what about the one for SC 2.1, your Scarborough that, Community Council? That, that's next. Yeah, uh, okay. 1625 33 41 Kingston Road, uh, rental housing demolition, final report. So you're releasing? Yep. Okay, Councillor uh, Crawford is releasing SC 2.1, um, 1625 33 and 1641 Kingston Road. On favor? Carry. Thank you. Councillor Cheng. Councillor Cheng. Okay. Uh, I'd like to do, I have a motion for PH 1.9 amendment. Um, I visited the infrastructure and housing community and spoke. Then I met with the housing secretary and the chair and I have this amendment to the motion. Does the staff have your amendment? Yes. Okay, we'll put it on the screen.
Okay, there it is on the screen. On favor of the amendment, show of hands. Pardon? Okay. Who, who's, who, who? Oh. Councilor Perks wants to continue to hold. Okay. Okay. Councilor Fletcher. C CC 3.1, speaker. And it is the uh, report from the Ombudsman. I do have a motion there that city manager Okay, CC 3.1, Councilor Fletcher. come back in March, the council meeting directly back. Councilor Fletcher. Yeah. Uh, if I can have members of council to look at the screen, what the motion is that we're, Councilor Fletcher is moving, so you know what you're voting on. Okay, that's on CC 3.1. Yes. Okay. So we'll come back March 29th, Speaker, with more information. Okay. So on the motion, on favor, show recorded vote. Recorded vote. Councillor Pertz, are you still connected to the meeting and voting? Uh, I am. I am. Um, uh, it's in favor. In favor. Thank you. The motion carries. The vote is 21 to uh, 4. Sorry. I, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, Councillor uh, Fletcher, you have another one? Uh, I don't think so. I just finally got back in. Let me just check. No, I've got the next one coming up. Thank you. No, uh, you have CC 3.4. Yes, I, I'm not releasing that. Okay. Does anybody else have any others? Councillor Holliday? Councillor Holliday? Uh, thank you, Speaker. MM 3.24, MetroLinx Community Participation and Actions Regarding Osgood Station and the Ontario Line. I'm uh, prepared to release that, and thank you to staff for answering my questions. Okay, so Councillor Holliday is releasing MM 3.24. On favour? Carry. Are there any further releases? All right. So we will now go to the the next item, which is EX 2.5, Transparency in the 2022 election. Councillor Fletcher, you held the item down. Do you have questions? Councillor Fletcher? Oh, sorry. We're at your item. Do you have questions? I'm going to ask the city solicitor, um, who helped me draft a motion, just about the rebate program that the city has, the contribution rebate program, which is an actual return of money. Um, that's assumed that there's some kind of general, I don't call it accountability of some kind for the donations and how you spent your money. Would I be right to say that? Yes, that's correct. And there was a thinking at when this was moved at, I think it was at executive, that because the campaign period had ended already, 
in December 31st. It's the end of your campaign period, and a number of people had put their filing in. Sorry, sorry. Could you, um, speaker? Councillor Chang, please. Councillor Bradford, Councillor Carroll. Okay, let's try to get through this, guys. Thank you. So that there was a thought that maybe it couldn't be done this year and it would have to wait till 2026 in order to ask people to put in their receipts for their campaign spending. But it could come in for this campaign, 2022 campaign. Is if that right? If it's the will of council to include okay, a I can't quite hear you. If it's the will of council to include a requirement that the receipts be submitted as a condition of participation in the contribution rebate program, that change could be made today for the 2022 election. So there's nothing precluding us from making that change in order to be part of the, your, your donors to be part of the contribution rebate program that your receipts would be filed with the clerk just as they have been every election for many, many years. That's correct. Legally, that could be done. Legally, that could be done. There's no yes. impediment of any kind. That's okay, correct. thank you very much for that clarification. Councillor Pasternak, questions? Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, through you to staff, um, my notes indicate that 100 candidates have already filed their returns under the rules adopted by Council that no receipts and uh, invoices are to accompany the audited statements and non-audited statements. Through the speaker, that's correct, Councillor, although I would like to clarify that of the 100 candidates that have filed, only a very small number, I think about seven, are actually participating in the contribution rebate program. Now, when someone uh, files a, um, a statement, uh, it is posted online and everyone can see it. So there's, there's certainly transparency that way. That's correct. And if you spend over $10,000, that has to go through another level of scrutiny, an auditor's report, and that is posted online. For candidates that are, per that is correct. Yes, and anyone, correct. anyone in the population can review any of these financial statements because they're all part of the public record and they're all online. That is correct. And included in those okay, statements. Just, just, just one sec. Councillor Chang. Please try to keep it down. We're, we're asking questions right now. You if you want to ask a question, please go to the back of the, the room. Okay, go ahead. So in those audited financial statements, the two crucial pieces of information are, did someone stay within the general spending limit? And did someone, the other spending limit is election night party and other expressions of appreciation. Are those, are those figures uh, viewable to the general public uh, when these audited statements are posted online? Through the speaker, yes, they are viewable by members of the public. Now, when you receive a, an audited statement or, or even a, a general statement, under, let's say a candidate spent under 10000 so it's a general statement, it may be a notice to read, or I'm, I'm not sure uh, actually what, what, uh, what category uh, it is. Do you send that to a third party to review to make sure that uh, the key spending limits are adhered to and if there's any irregularities in those statements? Through the speaker, we, we do not send the audited financial statements for a third party review. What we do is we do review the financial statements for uh, general accuracy and to ensure that the um, statement has been filled out and signed and dated. Um, and what we also do is uh, we do have a third party auditor that reviews contributions to ensure that contributors have not over contributed the amount they're entitled to under the Municipal Elections Act. So is it fair enough to say that the financial statements are reviewed by the candidate, reviewed by the auditor? Uh, ma Madam Speaker, the, can you get them to put a lid I, on it? Councillor Mallow. Okay, I, I, does everyone just want to have a break or something? Like it's just crazy in here. Uh, I'll, I'll wrap up quickly. I mean. Councillor Matlow, please. 
I forgot what my next question was. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, and all the donations, uh, everyone can review all the donations. That's a public document, that's all online. There's full transparency uh, with, with the donations. You have to list all your donors and the amount they gave on, uh, 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 it'll, it'll be part of the public record. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, yes, that's correct. It would be part of the public record and posted. Now I remember what my other question was. So th bef before these go public, the, the candidate reviews them, uh, an auditor reviews them. Uh, there might be a, a review by uh, Toronto Elections, and then they go into the, the public domain. And that all happens without submitting the hundreds of receipts uh, that, uh, that used to be submitted uh, in the past. So there's, can we agree that there's several levels of review um, for transparency? That is correct, but I would like to clarify that the review by the Toronto election staff is really for completeness only. Okay. Has the pri we don't really have a privacy commissioner, but we have the clerks who handle privacy issues. You're handing out, you're, you're submitting under the old system hundreds of documents with uh, banking information, credit card information, uh, personal, private home addresses. You're revealing the names of people who work for you on the campaign. Has, a, has the privacy commissioner or the clerk's office ever reviewed to that whether that violates uh, the Privacy Act, whether that can be used for identity theft or fraud, and what liability uh, do candidates in the city have on that? And I think okay, that was your last question. The public documents, right? Uh, through the speaker, um, we have not undertaken that level of a review. We have an expectation that candidates are uh, submitting their documentation after they have done their own review and redacted information that they feel uh, should be redacted before it's submitted to us. We do a cursory review uh, for sort of privacy considerations and there have been some occasions where we have contacted the candidate and suggested some information should be redacted where it's sensitive. Thank you. Councillor Bravo, questions. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to staff. Um, was there a, a, a po public policy reason for removing this requirement in 2022? Uh, there were a number of reasons why we recommended in 2022 that this requirement be removed. Um, to participate, so the Municipal Elections Act requires all candidates that raise or spend over $10,000 to uh, have an audited financial statement. In order to participate in the contribution rebate program, um, our requirement is having an audited financial statement regardless of how much money you raise or spend. So there is already uh, a level of auditing built into the contribution rebate program. Um, the act also requires that all receipts are kept until the next election and if there is a, a compliance audit application the auditor that would be appointed would have full access to the receipts at that point point. and the third reason was we were in covid and we were looking for opportunities to digitize further and having um, thousands of pages of receipts is a bit of a barrier to some digitization of electronic filing so you reference the municipal elections act and the higher bar that we have because we give we have a rebate program um, the municipal elections act is uh governs municipal elections that don't have rebates so uh so the fact that we're setting up a slightly higher bar seems like a minimum for uh, accountability isn't that the case that it's the rebate program itself that creates this duty to report we actually did a jurisdictional scan. There's only about, uh, I think, 10 to 12 um, jurisdictions in Ontario that do have a contribution rebate program. And we were the only one that required receipts be submitted. Um, so no other uh, jurisdiction currently with contribution rebate programs in Ontario actually require receipts. Are the other programs uh, providing a subsidy of close to $3 million? Or are they, I mean, we're talking about a lot of public money, aren't we? Well, these are jurisdictions that are much smaller, so I'm not sure what their output is, but certainly because of Toronto's size, it would be certainly smaller than ours, for sure. So the, 
the, the fact is that we all kept our receipts as is required, um, so that's not an impediment. Um, you're saying that it's more work to do digitization, um, but the fact that we're using public money, don't we have requirements of all kinds to report on expenses when we use public money? I'm thinking, for example, of my office budget. I could take out my staff for a lot of martinis, but I have to actually account for how we spend the money in my office. Um, you know, the, the transparency question, how does that relate to spending this public money in relation to the public money that we have to steward carefully in all aspects of city life? So through the speaker, the contribution rebate requirements are set by council by bylaw and all of the requirements to participate in the program, including transparency, um, are in that bylaw and established by council. So you might not, you might, uh, not be surprised to hear that in, in my campaign, we assumed we would be disclosing. Um, we're quite ready to share our expenses. Um, that's the expectation of the public, I think, and the voters. And I think it's certainly the expectation of people who made those contributions. Um, I, so is it, is it um, again, your uh, opinion, maybe to the city solicitor, that there is nothing that, that prevents us from retroactively applying this rule to the, uh, to the expenses of the 2022 election? Is that correct? That is my if it's yes. the will of council. If it's you. the will of council, we would certainly implement it. Thank you. Councillor Carroll, questions. Thanks, Madam Speaker. I do have this one question about the, the legal opinion and, and Councillor Fletcher said, don't fret about it, ask about it. So <laughs> I'll just ask. Uh, what we've heard is that, that legally we could go back to the 100 who have filed and, and ask them to, to submit their receipts if we want to require it from everyone who is not. So what I'm wondering is if they have filed and closed their campaign and, and submitted everything, um, how, how, if we request them to send in their receipts and they don't open their mail and they don't do anything, then what? Um, what's the recourse? Are they, are they now, they thought they were closed, but in fact what they have is a legally non-compliant return? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, the return, the failure to file receipts wouldn't affect the compliance of the return with the legislation. It would only affect the ability to participate in the contribution rebate program. And as I understand it, there are seven of the 100 who have indicated they intend to participate in that program. So the clerk would need to reach those seven people. Oh, it wouldn't okay. mean that it wouldn't affect the legality of their um, filings under the legislation, only right. their ability to participate in the city's contribution rebate program for which council establishes the rules. So, if, you know, and lots of people don't open their mail. I'm looking at me now. <laughs> so if, it, it's not that onerous. We're talking about out of those hundred, there are seven that we know have, you know, generously uh, provided the rebate forms and signed them, and we've got, to, we've got to find those people, or else we can't send out their rebate checks. But it's only seven. That's as my far understanding, as you know. and uh, the city clerk may wish to augment my response, though. So. Are, the, do, are those numbers? Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if Fiona wants to just confirm. Through the speaker, yes, that's correct. So although we have had uh, 108 people file, only seven of them have indicated that they will be participating in the contribution rebate program. So there are really only seven that would have to file receipts that we would need to contact. Okay, so those seven you'd really have to get because you, you can't really send out the checks and, and let, until they're compliant. But it's just those seven. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Councillor Holliday, questions? What, to the staff, what was the original purpose of filing the receipts for the contribution rebate program? Through the speaker, um, the, the inclusion of filing receipts for the contribution rebate program, as I understand it, was a member motion on the floor of council. It was 
predates me. Um, I believe that the debate at the time was for increased transparency and public accountability. What, what transparency is made available through that? And what, what does it do for public accountability? I'm, I'm just trying to connect all the pieces for the rationale to understand, because I, this predates my time as far as I know here. It's the first time I recall talking about it. What, how does it enhance things? Because I, I understand we've got a compliance review process, and they go through all the details. But what does it have to do with the contribution rebate program? Because that has to do with, with paying a rebate to contributors. Through the speaker, I think having the ability to uh, review people's expense receipts uh, is increased transparency because the public has access to all campaign information and the way that candidates spent uh, the money that they had raised uh, that uh, contributors donated to them um, and in some cases could um, assist the mem a member of the public in theoretically submitting a compliance audit application because they have access to information uh, where they may believe that a candidate did not follow the Municipal Elections Act campaign finance rules. So, so I, I appreciate that. I mean, I appreciate that process you outlined and the importance of it, but what is the logical tie to the campaign rebate program? Why wouldn't we just require candidates, say, to submit invoices with their detailed filings. Like, why Madam wouldn't we do that? That seems pretty, the most straightforward way to do it. Madam, Madam Speaker, I, I could assist with this, uh, if it's helpful. Uh, there is a condition of the rebate program that requires compliance with the MEA, which is why the rebates are not paid out until after the compliance audit period has, okay. has ended. Okay, uh, uh, maybe my question is, has, Staff's advice was not to collect this information in the last report to Council when we looked at this program. Has staff's advice changed? Through the speaker, candidates are still required to collect the information. The Municipal Elections Act requires candidates to keep all expense receipts until the next election. So all candidates should have this information as part of their campaign. But, but I didn't get an answer to my question. Has staff's advice changed since the, the last report to council on the process around this? Can, can, you, hear the, can you hear the question? Uh, I can hear the question. Okay. Through the speaker, our advice in 2022, in the middle of a pandemic and looking to digitize our financial, electronic financial system uh, based on the information at the time uh, was that candidates not be required to submit receipts as part of the requirement to participate and be paid out on the contribution rebate program which council adopted yep. at the meeting when they considered the item in 2022. Has anything changed since then? Through the speaker, I, I think what has changed is we're no longer in a pandemic. Uh, so okay. I think our context has changed since that advice was provided. Okay, and the last question I have, I, I don't particularly want to place a motion, but can you offer me some comfort that you do more than a cursory review? I guess in 2023, uh, knowing the concerns with cybersecurity and the ease for getting information from the internet, you know, can you offer me assurance that you do take a pretty good look at what is contained in these documents to ensure that, because they're not city records, if I've got that right, they are records that belong to the candidates, um, you know, that, that private or security sensitive information is not being placed out there. And I don't mean, you know, you don't include the invoice, but you redact the most sensitive parts, like a, an account number or something. Through the speaker, what we do plan on doing is providing candidates with more information of their responsibilities with their receipts uh, before they submit them to Toronto elections, uh, so that they have an understanding of what information they should be redacting before they supply them to us. Um, secondly, they are not... Um, posted online. They're only available in our office by hard copy for a member okay. of the public to 
review uh, so they are not digitized and posted <coughs> electronically online. We do a cursory review. Uh, I'm not sure that I can commit to doing anything more than that, but I can certainly provide candidates with more information to improve the way that they review those records prior to submission to us. Thank you. Th thank you. Councillor Malik, questions? Um, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to get clarification about um, how the recommendation um, to not um, require the uh, receipts to be submitted was, um, was brought to council. So was it a recommendation from the report or was it something else? Through the speaker, the recommendation in the report was to adopt a revised contribution rebate bylaw and the body of the report itemized what the changes to the contribution rebate bylaw was, um, including uh, that receipts uh, be um, omitted from requirement of the bylaw to participate in the program. Okay, so it was just a part of the, the submission of the report. I, I guess that's helpful. And you may have already said this, but just uh, I think it's really important to be able to just hold the number. How much money was given out in the re rebate program in the last um, in the last municipal election, the one before this one? Uh, through the speaker, there was two point nine million uh, provided in for contribution rebates in the twenty eighteen election. And in that election, the requirement to submit receipts existed? That's correct. Okay. Um, that's all I needed to know. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Robinson, questions? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I just want to get some clarity around um, what you've told us is that um, this was all basically um, part of a staff report and voted on by council prior to the 2022 election. So I'm assuming all the candidates that participated were told this via the candidate guidebooks and in information sessions that I hold, I know you hold many of them. So was this relayed to candidates as they went through the process of learning how to do the financial statements, et cetera? Through the speaker, it would have been included in our candidate information, uh, both online booklets and um, our information sessions. So everything related to the 2022 election that we all review as candidates, and we're a little bit more fortunate, uh, some of us being incumbents, um, versus people that are just learning the ropes. but. Everything, whether it was material or a verbal conversation from city staff in the elections department, or it was um, at a seminar, all of this would have been relayed um, in the, you know, that this was not a necessary element. Is that correct? Through the speaker, I'd have to check our materials in terms of how, um, how intentional we were around that they didn't need to submit receipts in order to participate in the contribution rebate program, but we would certainly have provided information to all candidates that they must maintain the receipts as part of their um, Municipal Election Act requirements. Okay, but going into this election, this was the system that was set up, approved by, or it sounds like supported by staff, approved by council, and this is what was relayed to candidates, correct? Correct. Okay. And then you're saying, um, what, I, what I'm hearing is there was a lot of paperwork, like tons of paper. I remember like oh, so much paper. You're trying to shift from all those binders of paper, which aren't great for the trees in our, in our, uh, in our country and city. So this, you're getting, trying to get away from paper into, into digitization. Is that the, um, the general principle? Through the speaker, that was one of the principles that we were looking at. Um, expense receipts, particularly on large campaigns, can be thousands of pages. Yes, I know. <laughs> I think we all know thousands of pages of wasted paper um, and, and, and down trees. So um, I'm glad you're working on that because a lot of us at, on City Council love trees. 
And then um, you're, you're saying there's a number of um, checks and balances in place here, including the auditor's statement. Um, the auditors, you know, the work that they, everybody, if you submit, you have to have it audited by a professional auditor. Is that correct? And all of those receipts would go through that auditor. Is that, uh, is that correct? In order to participate in Toronto's contribution rebate program, you must, uh, submit an audited financial statement and an auditor's report. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. We will go to speakers. The first speaker I have is Councillor Fletcher. If you just give me a second to get the mic on. Councillor Fletcher, go ahead. Yes, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, this was brought forward as a member's motion, uh, seconded by Councillor Moyes. And it was referred to executive where Councillor Pasternak helped by saying, let's do it in 2026. And I've confirmed with the city solicitor that it could be done this year. And uh, I've heard everything said here today, but I just want to remind everybody, and yes, we agreed to a bylaw, but usually when you're making a pretty big change, like you can mail something in uh, larger changes, they're reflected in the actual recommendation to council. This was not reflected in the recommendation to council. You had to go in, it, mostly it was about uh, mail-in ballots and the contribution rebate program, which is public money. And we've heard $2.9 million of public money that we give out based on us being part, those who are elected and those who aren't, who are part of that, having received public funds and we're dispersing money back to those who donated to us. There was in the past, but I'll just call it another layer of transparency and accountability for that, which was a pretty high standard in the city of Toronto, which is that you had to put in your receipts. I'm just gonna remind all councillors here that we have to put in our receipts for our office budget, which is $50,000, and every single receipt has to be signed if we're going out somewhere, who's on it, and clerks will say that's an acceptable expense or not, and everything is posted online, everything. And that's an accountability measure that was brought in actually by former Mayor Ford, who wanted everything to be very accountable in our spending. So I think we should just carry forward with that accountability procedure vis-a-vis -vis elections. And if we're doling out basically three million bucks to donors, they should have an idea of how we spent it, where we spent it. And just an answer, I think Councillor Robinson asked, well, doesn't the auditor do that? Councillor Robinson, if you were to ask your auditor, they are unable to use that lens on your files. They can't tell the clerk, oh, Paula Fletcher, she did X or Y, or Jay Robinson, we think there's something here. They're just like a doctor or a lawyer, that is between you and that certified professional. So I know that there was thinking that there was this kind of extra layer. We didn't need to think about that. And I had questioned the uh, deputy city clerk for elections about that when we first brought this up. And uh, that's what was told to me, that that was the thinking that that would cover this off. I don't think it covers it off. We should maybe just change all of our expense policies to just spend it how we Council want it, our business, city business, is our business, transparency is our business. Do you have a motion? Yes, I'm sorry, thank, thank you. you. That was, uh, you're not Francis, but I, you're okay. I wanted to catch you before you ended speaking. <laughs> Francis wouldn't have let me get that far, but you did, thank you very much. Yes, I do have a motion, and it's to uh, have this rebate program <coughs> that to delete that, uh, coming from executive and go back to amend the schedule to include the audited invoices with um, the audited financial statements based on the advice that I got from the city solicitor, who, by the way, said that in her early career as a lawyer, she was the solicitor for the elections department here in the city. So we're happy and lucky that she's here today for that. So I think it's just a simple recommendation to change it. Councillor Carroll said, what about those seven? 
I think there's registered mail. They all want their people to get money, so there's not going to be a problem, and anybody else would put those in. And no matter what, Councillor Pasternak's motion goes back to doing that already. So all we're really talking about is seven people that I'm sure our very sophisticated clerk's department can reach. And I will say about the clerk's department, I've said many times that if we just sent them all for a day to Pearson Airport, all those bags would be sorted out in about five <laughs> minutes because they're so good at what they do. I'm not worried about seven people being told that they have to photocopy those receipts and put them in. I'm kind of worried that we're bypassing one election, but with Councillor Pasternak's motion, we go forward to the next one. So if we're going to do it, let's just do it right and do it this election without any fuss, muss, or bother, and just continue in a very transparent and accountable way that we have struck in this council and in this city for the large amounts of rebate dollars that we give out. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, did you have a question? No. Uh, oh, no, okay. I'm just I'm just on there to speak. Okay. Councillor Councillor Pastor. Oh, hold on. Thank you. Um, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. Thank you. Thank um, you, Madam. Go ahead. Speaker. I mean, generally speaking, I did not have a big problem with the submission of receipts in the other three elections that I was involved in. It was a requirement to submit that with your financial statements. It was fairly onerous for candidates and the clerks to process it. It was generally a, 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 a misuse of staff time. When it comes to the rebate program, there's no real linkage between the submitting of dozens of receipts and the rebates. The rebates are based on a donation and a percentage chart that gives Does a rebate a back to the uh, candidate. You have a motion? I do not. No, I'm not going to. Oh. I'm not going to move that. Pizza receipts, sign receipts, campaign office receipts—they have absolutely nothing to do with the rebate program, which is based on a percentage rebate based on the amount of money that you've given. It was a tag on to make sure that you submitted as much paperwork as possible on your financials. I think the big risk here is it's another flip-flop Toronto. <coughs> council makes the decision. It was council directed. It came from a staff recommendation. It's very important at the time, remains important. And here we go again, flip-flop Toronto. Is this what we want out there? Is this a signal that we want to send, especially in light of the hangover from the 2018 election, which was not our doing, it was the provincial doing, but here's two elections in a row where we're flip-flopping on the rules. And uh, as I said, 2018 was not, not our fault. The big fear here is that privacy issues have changed in the years that we've been running elections. What we are submitting for public consumption is a treasure trove of personal information that can be used for identity theft, for fraud, and other crimes. Now, it's true, we have a responsibility to redact as much as we can. But within those hundreds or perhaps thousands of pages are banking information, credit card information, the names of individuals and their home addresses. Are we a responsible <laughs> municipality? Do we really want that out there where we can be liable, where people can be the victims of, of identity theft Crime. It's getting more and more sophisticated. We hear about it all the time. When it comes to transparency, the, everyone is, uh, who, who spent $10,000 or more is required to submit an auditor's report. And if they're hiring a capable, responsible, honest auditor who, who has a good reputation, those financial statements which are uh, available to the general public will be a true reflection of what the candidates spent and the rules they followed. At the same time, there's also uh, an opportunity for everyone to review it. So it goes through the candidate, it goes through the auditor, it goes through a tertiary review at clerks, and then of course it's put online for the general public to, to review it. It's important that the two key spending limits, the expenses subject to the spending limit, the general spending limit, that is viewable online and is available to any member of the public. 
Expenses subject to speaker to the spending limit for parties and other appreciation expressions of appreciation. That also is available online, available to any member of the public. A hundred candidates have already filed uh, their returns. Now, at executive, I must admit, we thought we thought many of those, much more of those, were people who would have qualified for the rebate program, and were now we were going to go back and try and ask for receipts. It's about ten percent. Uh, of those, and there may be even more coming. But you know, what, what does it look like from the city, even if it's a small number, that we're now sending registered mail out to them to say we've changed the rule, council can't decide what it wants to do about its elections, and we now like you to go back and photocopy the hundreds of receipts that you generated during your campaign. What does that say about the city? What does that say about our election process? What does that say about us? And I think it's embarrassing. I think it's embarrassing that we keep going back and changing our minds about council decisions. And what's unfortunate, and I don't, I don't really see anything wrong with the move to reopen an item, but the bottom line is we have to be respectful of decisions we may not agree with. And believe me, there's been a lot of decisions in this council chamber that I haven't agreed with over the last 12 years. But you know, it came to a democratic vote. It usually came with some, some uh, backing up by a staff report. Sometimes the staff reports are amended or rejected. But a council decision should be respected by all. And that's what's here before us. A council made a decision based, based on clerk's recommendations, and we proceeded with this election. This election is over, but the submission of financial statements is not. And for the credibility of the city, for the protection of our residents and those who helped us on the campaign, protecting their privacy, their security, their banking. I think it's best that we, we take a pause and we look at to, to reintroduce it in 2026 with privacy safety measures. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Bra Councillor Bravo to speak. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker. I think that we kid ourselves if we think that we have the consent of people and the support broadly after the results of the last uh, municipal election. 71% of people chose not to cast a ballot. Never before has government been seen as less relevant in people's lives or less trustworthy. And the municipal level of government <laughs> has the greatest crisis. We're all facing it. Even, even if we won with a huge majority, it's a, it's a majority of a very small number of voters. And I think that this kind of question of transparency strikes at the heart of the lack of faith that people have in us here. I heard uh, Councillor Pasternak's reasoning about exempting this one single election from this requirement. Why this election? Why was it a, a, a rule that could stand in 2018? and will stand in 2026, but won't stand in 2022. I actually think that what we're doing is making council look more responsible by making this change. If it's good enough for doing in 2026, then why not 2022? You know what it looks like? It looks like we're trying to hide something. It looks like we're trying to prevent the public from seeing something. And it, it, yes, it's, there is some photocopying involved. I'll, I'll admit to that. But that is a very small part of democracy. That is a very small part of the effort that we made in our campaigns. Knocking on doors, recruiting volunteers, asking people for money, asking people to make donations that are then going to be rebated by the state. That's a high bar for transparency and accountability. I would submit that perhaps, you know, there was a reason under the pandemic for reducing the amount of work but we're not in that situation currently. I think that we need to ensure that we're resourcing this piece of the work that we do here, so. which is to demonstrate Re how it is that we spent the money that is being rebated to people out of the public purse. This identity theft question is not something that came up in the questions to staff. I asked very specifically, is there a public policy reason for doing this? I, you know, when you submit an expense, you're not, it doesn't have credit card information. It doesn't have, it's an, it, it, you're just telling people how you spent their money. So again, I think that
If it was good enough for 2018, yeah. it has to, and it's good enough for 2026, it has to be good enough for 2022. I think that we do ourselves a disservice when we are not as radically transparent as possible at a time in which the faith in us is as, as low as it ever has been. And I include myself in that. None of us are exempt from this. The doubts that people have about government and in particular about local government. Let's take the lesson of the lowest voter turnout ever. And let's try to do things that inspire in the public a sense of confidence in us. And I, and I think that this is a very small uh, a very small action to meet a bar of transparency and accountability that I think the public will be grateful for. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm going to be very brief because I believe Councillor Pasternak did a great job explaining this. But I just, again, I don't think you can change the rules in the middle of the movie. You can't do things retroactively. Quite frankly, it's not fair to the participants who are not us. And so we have all sorts of resources and, and things that others don't. And um, I just think that um, this is um, ridiculous that we're having this conversation because the staff laid this plan out, council adopted it, um, and here we are trying to just literally days, months away from the end of the filing statement date, the process, and we're trying to change this. So it's been explained to all the participants verbally um, in, by city staff also in the guidebooks at the info sessions and now we're trying to, to go back so i just think it's incredibly unfair to the participants and uh, that was my initial reaction when i first saw this it's like wh why are we doing something re retroactively and it, it, you know not even middle of the movie we're in the last you know last you know we're at the end of the movie so um it just doesn't make any sense and then on top of that uh, being somebody who's moved many motions to tighten the tree bylaws at city hall it is gobs and gobs and piles and piles and piles and piles of paper so today we heard about people and their commitment to transform to and you know moving away from paper to digitization i think we've been too slow on this file we need to move quicker and i think you know i see it on the second floor paper being wasted um and here we are looking at literally if you i would love to know the, the outputs of this, what this would cost um, from a tree perspective um, and paper perspective to submit everybody's um, paperwork. So we're digitizing, there's a system in place, there's checks and balances in place. We've heard that from city staff today. And we also heard that we're the only, um, literally the only one that does this. Um, out of the 10 to 12 that do it, that do rebates were the only one and now it looks like we're maybe next term maybe going back to this but the bottom line is this should be about our commitment to transform to uh whether it's small or big it makes a difference and also our commitment to the other candidates who were told this is the way it was going to unfold it's just elementary and simple so i'll leave it at that madam speaker Councillor Malik. Thank you very much. Um, I, I will be short and I do just want to um, pick up on what was raised here about um, privacy and uh, security of information. And um, if that's something that is a, of a concern to us in this body, then it shouldn't just be limited to our receipts. What do we make then of all the information of our donors that gets published uh, uh, that gets um, published publicly. Um, the concern is just for for the transparency of our own uh, spending and not of their personal information. If we're going to be talking about um, 
privacy and security, then we have to take a holistic approach to that. And that maybe does require a different type of action and reporting back. Right now, and I will echo so many of my colleagues, this is about what um, the people of Toronto can count on from Stephen. us, um, that you, you would see at any other accountable body, right? Uh, a showing of receipts, it's something that we talk about in pop culture, and it's something that should not um, be just limited to that. It's something that we actually have to show up and do. We need to do it in our actions and our choices, and also in the process that it takes um, to actually hold um, this very important um, office that comes with a tremendous amount of uh, privilege and responsibility. And that's what this is really about. It's about making sure that our communities um, know that they can count on us to extend uh, that commitment to every aspect of the work that we do. Thank you, Councillor Malik. Councillor Nunziata. Yeah, I, just briefly, I'm listening to some of the councillors and w what really gets me is that some of these councillors, when we just debated the cycling, uh, they got up and said, staff is recommending to make it permanent. We have to listen to staff. Now with this item, staff is recommending at executive that you don't do it, you wait to the next uh, next election. So why is it that you listen to staff when it's to your convenience, but when other issues come up, we don't listen to staff? Point that's order. what really, that, no, that's Speaker. what really bothers Point me order. is Point that order. we listen to staff when order. you want an issue. Point of, Point of order. order. What's your point of order? Point of order. <laughs> What's yeah. your point of order? So Thank you, Speaker. Just let her, let her <laughs> Councillor Fletcher has a point of order. Point of order. Yeah, well, no, it, well, it's a point is, it is, that was not the staff that recommended that at committee, it was the councillor that brought that motion. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang Thank on, you. I just got to get your microphone on. No, it's on. my understanding. Staff, hey, hang on, on, hang on, I just got to turn your microphone so on, Councillor Fletcher. So I don't wish staff, the councillor, Councillor Fletcher, and I'm sorry, give them, I, I'm going to say that at committee, it was Councillor Pasternak that brought that motion, and the staff did not uh, there was a motion there from council. They did not countermand that. They simply gave Councillor Pasternak an alternative. So I don't okay. think that Councillor Nunziata, speaker saying we're impugning staff is correct. And I think that's wrong. And I'm very troubled by it, speaker. Very troubled by okay. it. Thank well, you. Thank well, you, Councillor Fletcher. If I may respond, one of the questions that was asked to staff, and I believe Councillor Fletcher, you asked that question, did staff recommend was that your recommendation at committee? And the staff said yes. So I heard that from staff. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nunziata. We can review the tape if you'd like. Okay, we're ready to vote. Okay, we have we have a motion by Councillor Fletcher. Members, if you could take your seats. I'm I'm supporting staff. Okay, Councillor Cole, Councillor Crisanti, if you can please take your seat. We're in the middle of a vote. Recorded vote.
Councillor Sachs, may we have your vote, please? That's in the affirmative. Thank you. And Councillor Perutza, are you still connected to the meeting? Uh, I am. I'm opposed. That's opposed, Councillor? Yes. Thank you. The motion does not carry. Vote is 16 to 10. Okay, on the item, on favor, carry. Thank you. Hmm? Oh, recorded vote. Councillor Myers, are you able to vote using the system? Councillor Myers? Councillor Myers. Councillor Perutza, may we have your vote, please? Uh, in favor. In favor, thank you. The item carries, the vote is unanimous, 26 in favor. Thank you. Our next item is um, Councillor Fletcher, New Business CC 3.4. Do you have questions to staff? Okay. Um, do we have staff here to respond to this item? Go in camera still. Pardon. So this is in camera, speaker, and the other is Pardon? in camera. We have two in camera items. Confidential items. Okay, so members of council, so sorry, Councillor Fletcher. So members of council, before, um, because the next item, we have to go in camera. So it was suggested we go in camera now, but before we do that, we can do quick releases. Do we have any quick releases? Councillor Cheng, do you have quick releases? Yes, I'd like to uh, bring back my revised version. Are you talking about planning P and housing? One point one point nine. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Oh, you have questions of staff. So it's a not it's not a fast item then. <coughs> okay, who who has a question? Okay, Councillor Holiday, can you maybe kind of ask the question offline or? Okay. Okay, Councillor Holliday, what's your question? To the city manager, have we secured for the next phase of the RHI operating funding? Just operating. No. Thank you. That was great. Okay, so on the item, point of order. Vote. I, I would like to vote on the committee recommendations number one and separately from two, three, and four. Boy, they... 
and I'd like a recorded vote on two, three, and four. Yeah, they can be a block. Okay, so if we can put, if we can put two, pardon? To do the amendment. You're the talking about, hold on, one at a time, Councillor Chang. Are you talking about Councillor Holiday, Councillor Chang's motion? Uh, no, I have no, no request on that. Pardon? It's the committee recommendations, unless well, your motion is changing them. The, okay. It's pretty straightforward. No, but at committee, if I'm correct, at committee there was just a presentation. There was no recommendations. Oh, is there? I'm looking at them. There's four of them right here. Okay, so you want to vote on two, three, and four separately? As a the, block. As a one block. Number one is fine. Yeah, I don't okay. need a recorded vote. I want to record my vote on two, three, and four as a block. Okay. And whatever Councillor Cheng's amendment is, I'll have a look at it. Thank you. Okay, let's put Councillor Cheng's amendment motion up first. Okay, so on two, three, and four, we'll have a recorded vote. Yeah. Counts, there's Councillor Cheng's motion on the screen. On favor? Carried. Okay, so now we'll do two, three, and four recorded vote. As a package, yeah. You want a recorded vote on one, two? No. He just said two, three, and four as a package. That's what I understood. Okay, there it's on the screen, recorded vote. Councillor Perutza, may we have your vote, please? Opposed. Opposed, thank you. Yes. Parts two, three, and four of the item carry. The vote is 24 to two. Okay, but we have to vote on one, don't we? Oh, okay, okay. Item is amended on favor, show of hands, carried. Okay, so members, do we have any more quick releases? No? Okay, let's go on camera. Let's have a motion. Wait, you should extend the meeting to... All oh, right, we have to extend the meeting. Can I have a motion to extend the meeting to finish the agenda? Moved by Councillor Carroll. We, we have only three items left. On favor? Carried. So, okay. Do we need to put the motion on the screen? Okay, we have to put the motion on the screen.
So, Councillor Carroll, when it's on the screen, can you move it? Okay, there it is. Councillor Fletcher, your item, um, do you have in camera questions? Okay. There you go. Okay. The council recesses public session to meet as committee of the whole in closed session to consider the following. CA 2.2, .2, appointment of public members to the Board of Health, reason for confidentiality, personal matters about identifiable individuals who are being considered for appointment to the Board of Health, and CC 3.4, claim to recover damages, Toronto Police Service Data Centre, reason for confidentiality, advice or communications that are subject to solicitor client privilege. On favor? Okay, we'll take a 10 minute break. Oh, five. 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 You yeah. can smoke in five minutes. Yeah, please. yeah. Come on. Uh,
Okay, members of council. So.
All right. So. So what we'll do is Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Fletcher, and we'll go to your item on CC 3.4. So you're going to move. I am moving. Consideration of the item be deferred until March 29th, 2023, meeting of council. Okay, that's Councillor Fletcher's motion on CC 3.4. On favor? I'll also release the vacant home tax. I'm sorry, what was the other one? The one uh, CC 3. Oh, member motion. I, I've lost my CMP. Okay, hold on. You held down MM317. The Correct. Big... Releasing. Oh, I did vote on it. On favor? Yeah, carry. Of the deferral. Correct. Yeah, on the referral. Releasing the vacant homes tax motion. So MM317, Councillor Fletcher Correct. is re releasing. On favor, show of hands, carry. Thank you. So we will now go to the item we were dealing with in camera, which is the public members to the Board of Health, Councillor Crawford, if you can put your name on to speak. Public. Did, did you put your name on? Did, yes. Oh, there you are, okay. Councillor Crawford. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Okay. Hold, hold on. Oh, hold sorry. on. Okay, Councillor Crawford to speak. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a, a motion I'd like to move uh, that City Council delete the existing recommendation two and adopt instead the following new recommendation two that City Council appoint the following a new Swiss Kandaraja, trustee, Toronto District School Board for a term ending on December 31st, 2024, and Ida Lapretti, trustee, Toronto Catholic District School Board for a term starting January 1st, 2025, for a term ending on November 14th, 2026, and until a successor is appointed. Before I begin, I want to thank all of the people, all of the candidates uh, for the Board of Health, and anybody who puts their name in for uh, public service. Uh, we, as the committee, I'm the chair of the committee, went through dozens and dozens of applications of people who wanted to be on the Board of Health. So I want to thank all of those people who put their names in. I want to thank the numerous um, candidates who the committee uh, um, and interviewed a couple of weeks ago. And before you, we have two that I've talked about here, but we have six very strong candidates, public candidates of citizens in, this, in the city, who are, we are recommended. And I just want to acknowledge and thank all of them for the, for the work that they've done in getting there and for the service that they're going to be pro providing over the next uh, four years. But as we talked about in, in private, one of the challenges we have with the Board of Health, um, there's 13, and this is all legislated, unfortunately, uh, we have 13 uh, members of the board. That includes one member from a public school board or from the from a school board and it has been either through the Catholic board or the TDSB. Um, we have in convention in, in years past there, there's no real sort of set how we decide on that other than the two boards appoint um, a candidate who's going to be coming and we as a, as a city uh, look at them and we point one of them but there's no pattern to how we determine what they want to do. Four years ago, the committee that I was on made the determination to look at it's really not fair to, to have you know, the Catholic board and not the TDSB. So we decided to have both boards represented on, on the uh, Board of Health. But to do that, we had to remove one of the citizen members. Um, and that was the same, um, if you want to call it dilemma, that the committee had this time. Uh, we, we didn't want, because we have such strong committee uh, citizen members, we didn't want to have to remove one of those uh, and, and to be able to get the two on. So we had a bit of a challenge. Um, what I've moved before you is, is a way to be able to recognize the two candidates that both boards brought to us and to give both of these candidates the opportunity to be able to serve on the Board of Health. And unfortunately, I would have been, it'd be great to be able to add another member, another voice uh, onto the board. Um, but again, provincial legislation doesn't allow that. So th this is our only option to give that opportunity to both boards to have a voice in this term is what I have before you. Um, again, this was not necessarily the recommendation that came out of committee, uh, but this is a recommendation that I feel honors both the Catholic board, it honors the TDSB's voice 
at the table. And this is the only option we have to give both of them that voice at the table. So I'm moving this. I'm hoping uh, that uh, at the will of council, we do support this because I think this is probably the best option moving forward for this term. And we still have to figure out how we move forward after this term. But as we're looking at the challenges we're having, I think this is the best option, the best sort of way to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor. Councillor Bravo has a question for you. Just one moment. Thanks. Councillor Bravo, three minutes clarification of the motion. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Councillor Crawford, you're proposing uh, to sort of split the baby here, I, as I see it. Um, can I ask what? why you propose to have um, the Catholic trustee um, second and the public trustee first? Does, is this an indication that you recognize that there's been a convention at the Board of Health of alternating and that's an attempt to alternate with a shorter time frame? Um, I mean, you, you, so that's so correct. The correct. The question is, is why the Toronto District School Board for the first two years and the Catholic as the second two? Um, I, I think part of the, the rationale behind that was just to try to give, first of all, to give both of them the opportunity to be on there. And when I decided to, again, the decision with I knew was really, uh, in, I guess, in the spirit of compromise. Um, with and, and there were a number of, of, of our colleagues who were looking at doing otherwise. There's no rationale, there's no saying I want a new first or, or I to second. Uh, I do know that the Toronto District School Board is the largest board. Um, they represent most of the, like more, I mean, more of a majority. So it just made sense to give um, the trustee for the Toronto District School Board that opportunity for the first two terms, or first two years, and then the Catholic for the second. So that's really the rationale. There's no specific rationale really behind that. It's just to be fair to both of them. So um, I'll, I'll preface my next question by saying I would prefer to go back to the alternating convention, which I think has been really important to the board, and in which case it would be the TDSB trustee. But should that, um, should that not go ahead, would you be willing to consider flipping the order of these two appointments? It, it seems to me that we're, if we're going to keep an existing board member to have them come back two years later it doesn't make a ton of sense to me since they were with us um, right now. So again, I'm, I'm just trying to sort out the rationale between for your question okay. compared to my rationale. I, I'm, I'm, I, I would much prefer just sticking with what I have here. I, I, I just don't understand your rationale of you know having the, the Catholic for the first two years, the school board for the second two years. I'm, I'm, I'm just comfortable moving it as, as is at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Moyes to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a motion. I think it's going to replace Councillor uh, Crawford's motion. If you could put it on the screen, I could read it. So it reads, uh, City Council delete recommendation two. Uh, City Council appoint the following school board nominee to the Board of Health at pleasure of Council for a term of uh, end of November 14, 2026, until the successor is appointed. And to adopt uh, instead the following, City Council appoint the following school board nominee to the Board of Health to pleasure of council for a term of ending November 14, 2026, and until a successor is appointed. Anushish Kanaraja, Trustee Toronto School Board. So again, as mentioned, it's been by convention that you know those two school boards alternate. And yes, there was an anomaly in the last term in that there were two trustees on the board. But that being said, the Catholic board represented the school board officially, their school board officially, and the citizen appointee just happened to be a trustee of the public board. And yes, you know, one of my colleagues mentioned earlier that since 1999 uh, to 2018, there was no Catholic trustee on the on Board of Health. But they, actually, they were actually given the opportunity to be on the Board of Health. 
but they chose not to be on the board of health because they didn't like the fact that the city provided aid, aid funding to uh, AIDS organizations. So let's make sure that's on the record as well. But again, since then, they have alternated. And quite frankly, you know, the mayor and I and the police and the uh, school board and city staff has been working diligently to address some of the violence around public schools. And so, a new Srish Kandarajak, pardon me, you know, is a tenured professor in sociology at uh, York University, focusing on uh, adolescent and youth uh, violence. She's also a trustee from Scarborough. She is a person of color. She's Tamil. When we look at, you know, public appointments, we want diversity and equity. And quite frankly, she checks off all those check marks. I've had the privilege of working with her for the last four years. And she is a hardworking trustee who represents her community. And so I feel that she can bring that voice and talent to the Board of Health. I look forward to working with her and utilizing her expertise in that role. So I hope my, my, my colleagues here in council will do the right thing and see that it is the turn of the public school board to be on the board of health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. We do have a question for you by Councillor Bravo. Three minutes <laughs> clarification of the motion. Thank you. Sorry, Paula. Uh, just quickly, without veering into any um, items that were discovered, discussed in camera, can you explain, having been a school trustee? Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, can you repeat the question? Chair of the Board of Health, Councillor Moyes, can you explain very uh, briefly, uh, so we don't vex people too much here, um, how how the TDSB, what, what does the TDSB, what due diligence does the TDSB do to put forward a trustee candidate for the Board so, of Health? Thank you for the question. So we have org board every year. At the beginning of each, uh, each year, we go through this. And so trustees put their name forth as to which committees they would like to sit on. And one of those committees is Board of Health. And speaking to the school board uh, trustees and the chair recently, she mentioned that three people put their names forth to sit on the Board of Health. And so there was Anu being one of them. And, uh, and there was a vote. And the chair, and, and, and Ustrish Karaja won uh, you know, the, the vote. And so then she came forth to uh, the city to represent the school board. So it was a fair process. So, when, I, when, so when the TDSB trustee shows up um, to be a, to here in this process, They've had to express their interest in being on the Board of Health. They've had to make the case to their colleagues. They've had to go through an election. That's how much they want to be on the Board of Health. That's correct. correct. OK, thank you. And also, just to add, yeah. also, um, because of the convention of the Catholic Board and the Public Board um, switching every four years, it was understood by the school board themselves that you know, it was their turn. So Anu believed that, the chair of the board believed that, and all 22 trustees believe that. And quite frankly, I believe that too, because I was there most recently. So you're indicating that perhaps there was a miscommunication in, in the process from the perspective of what you found out, your inquiries with the TDSB. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Burnside, question? Call the question when I have a chance. Well, okay. you have to wait till you put your name I to speak. Speak. So, okay, I'll ask my question then. Sorry, in term, uh, to Councillor Moyes, in terms of the uh, pro TDSB process, are you talking about historically or what happened in this situation? Every, no, no, 
Historically or in this situation? Sorry, sorry, answer. Sorry. Yeah, my, historically, sorry. that's what we have done. So I just need to clarify too. Um, we do have an org board every year, the school board, yes. But because the term at the Board of Health is a four year term, the trustee who's appointed in the beginning of the term remains for the entire time. So previously, Council Donaldson was here. And now, because it's the new term here at Council, uh, Trustee Shriskandaraja has put a name for it for the four year term here on the Board of Health. Sorry, I'm sorry for being a bit obtuse, but that's the process that you know, or you know that that's what happened in this situation? Like, were you, you were there to, or you were told about that, what happened? Well, I was a trustee for six years, and that's the process that we go through. Was the preview, time. okay, so yes. your experience, thank you. Okay, yeah, we just killed it. Councillor Holliday, three minutes, clarification of the motion. Thank you. I just I want to understand, um, the councillor had mentioned his uh, familiarity with trustee Siskin Raja uh, because of previous work. I just wondered uh, what the councillor's um, experience or platform to evaluate trustee Lepretti is. How, ch how can one choose one over the other? Well, again, you know, with all due respect, uh, Councillor Holliday, I don't know the Councillor, um, the trustee personally, but I can say to you, though, I've had a keen interest in the Board of Health, and especially during the, this COVID period. And the Board of Health um, presented to, this, to the school board on a regular basis. So. Um, I actually have viewed Board of Health um, uh, meetings uh, online. Okay. So I don't know the, count, the trustee personally, but I do know of her work. So you, you didn't interview Trustee Lepretti? Yeah, this is no, I did not. really close to in-camera stuff. Yeah. I'm just asking facts. It's hard to hear you and, okay. and so these, some of the questions we're asking are in camera questions. I, I'm just asking uh, <coughs> the counselor about his experience. I'm not asking about facts Sorry. about Sorry. either of the candidates. Speaker, on a point of order. Yeah, on that, a point that of would order. be that would be an in camera question, Councilor yeah. Holiday. So okay. just just uh, ask a question on his motion so that you have. In the simplest sense. Um, um, uh, Councillor Moise, you're asking Council to reject the selection committee process and you've presented a candidate that you're familiar with. Well, Council is supreme and it's a process that we're following. Right? But, but in essence, that's what you're asking. Well, but in essence, I'm following the process that we've always followed here. For example, you know, in other committees, for example, you know, uh, committee makes it, we've been here all day for the last two days. And things that are brought forth from committee, various committees, we've actually amended here I, at this table. I don't disagree. So this is just one of many items that we are uh, amending. But, but in it just your so answers, happens to be a yep. Board of Health um, motion, recommendation that I am decided to amend. But in, in your answers to me, you didn't evaluate the two candidates against each other. You chose one to bring forward. Sorry, Speaker. Okay, Councillor Holliday. Yes, Councillor Holliday. Okay, I, I, don't answer that. Okay, I'm thank sorry. you. I, I Councillor Myers to speak. Hi. Uh, so I just want to um, add that I will be moving a motion that starting in 2026, um, that we will be, that we should just alternate between the representative from the TDSB board and the Catholic school board nominee. Um, what we do in this 
current situation. I leave that to, in the supreme wisdom of counsel. I would just like to indicate that it was uh, a, not the best use of the Civic Appointments Committee's time to be interviewing both candidates if we are then going back and deciding that for whatever reason that we're going to choose uh, the TDSB candidate. I respect the, my colleague, Councillor Moyes, he's the Board of Health, he's a former TDSB trustee, so I'm not, I don't want to fight about this, but I think going forward to just eliminate this, we should just keep it simple, we should save time, save energy, and just alternate between TDSB and Toronto Catholic School Board, um, and that way it's a fair, transparent process for everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Myers. Councillor Sachs to to speak. Please call the motion. Okay, Councillor Sachs is calling the motion. Yes, please. Thank you. Councillor Sachs is calling the motion on favor, show of hands, carry. I'd like a, record, a, recorded, a recorded vote, Madam Speaker. Oh, Re come on, Councillor Prudza. No, I want to vote against, and I want to be recorded as voting against closure. I, I've never supported closure. Councillor Prudza is asking for recorded vote on calling the question. Recorded vote. Yeah. Councillor Thompson, may we have your vote, please? Uh, in the affirmative. Affirmative, thank you. And Councillor Fletcher, may we have your vote, please? The affirmative, thank you. And Councillor Perutza, may I have your vote, please? Against. Against. Yes, that's the affirmative, thank you. Sorry, was that against, against. or no, no, yes? No, against. 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 Okay, he's saying no, he's not here, so he's saying no. No, no, exactly. No, I'm not, I'm not for it. I'm against Okay, it. that's fine. Against. Councillor Perutza, yes? yes no. He said Correct. he's against. Correct. Thank you. Okay. The motion to end debate carries. The vote is 19 to 3. Motion by Councillor Crawford. Recorded vote. Councillor Crawford's motion. Recorded vote. Yeah, recorded vote.
Councillor Fletcher, may we have your vote, please? We've ended the vote, sorry, Councillor, so I'll take your vote verbally. I know, but just say it. Negative, thank you. And Councillor Peruzza, may I have your vote, please? Opposed. Opposed, thank you. Motion one carries, the vote is 12 to 10. Redundant, yeah. Okay, so, yes, Councillor Moy's motion is redundant, so now we're voting on the item. Oh, Councillor Meyer's motion, sorry. Councillor Meyer's motion. On favor? Carried. Item is amended on favor? Recorded vote. Bye, Councillor Fletcher. Bye. Thanks for a great day. <laughs> Drive carefully. We have one more item. Councillor Prutza, may we have your vote, please? In favor. In favor. Thank you. The item is amended carries. The vote is 19 to 2. So we have one last item. Councillor Perks, you held the item down. Yes. Which one? Okay, just one sec, Councillor Perks. Okay, Councillor Perks, um, you, you, you held down MM320? Yes, and I asked for it. Okay. And they haven't been able to do it yet. Oh. And I'm not allowed to talk about it before. Oh, okay. So It'll just take 30 seconds. They're just trying to figure out where something gets referred to. Okay, we do have questions. Uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor Carroll, questions? Heather. Okay. And I, I'll preface the question. I'll, I, I asked this question because we, we invariably get this motion at the 11th hour on the way to adopting a budget for the year. Have we ever, outside of the budget cycle, done a proper look at this relief program? To your knowledge. Through you, Madam Speaker. I, uh, Councillor, we do have a look at this on an annual basis, but it usually does come from a request during the budget process. Right, right. Okay, I'll have comments to, to, to that, um, uh, Madam Speaker. I'll put my name down. Thank, thank you. Okay, Councillor Perks. So I am uh, going to move that this be referred to the executive committee. Um, and before you get excited, no, this isn't something we waived referral on, right? This is not one of those members' motions where we've already voted to waive referral. And the reason for that is it because it wasn't submitted in time for the clerks and the mayor 
and the speaker to work together to figure out if it should be referred. It was a late add to the agenda. Okay, that's an important thing to remember. It's a late add to the agenda. And it asked the CFO to repair, prepare a report looking at a wide range of different inputs in terms of where we set the threshold for tax relief on the property tax, the water rate, and the garbage rate, and to have that for us in time for the budget in seven days. This is a long-standing issue. Every budget, every budget year that I can remember, somebody has moved that we increase the threshold or decrease the value of the house or tried to amend it somehow. Those same councillors who move it have been told over and over again, it's a complicated problem. Why don't you take it to a committee and we can figure out if we've got the thresholds right, the incomes right, the house value right, if we want the, the tool we use for the water rate to be the same as the tool we use for the property tax. And we should look at things like, did you know uh, property values haven't been reassessed in six years because the province of Ontario froze them. So seniors have not had to face an increase based on assessed value. And did you know they have yet to announce when the next review will be? So it's a complicated problem. And quite frankly, it's not the kind of thing you scribble down in an email and send to the clerk a couple days before council, having missed the deadline, knowing full well that it's a complicated policy piece. So. I don't think we're going to be in a position to have a coherent debate on it during the budget debate where we each only get one speech. So let's get a proper examination of this tool and also think of it in terms of, given the limited funding we have, the mayor has said he's got $6 million for us to play with, is this the right place to put part of that $6 million? Is this the first group of people in Toronto that you would allocate services to. That might be a consideration in whether or not you want to vote to refer this right now. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carroll. There's a short number of minutes to speak to a referral. Are, are they not, Madam Speaker, is it three minutes? Two minutes. Good. That's all I need. Um, uh, I, I, I hope that folks will remember looking at this, that this is a member's motion. It's not a staff report, it's not a motion properly moved to the committee and properly submitted in advance. It's a member's motion. It's before you with a sense of urgency just before we adopt the budget for another year. Those of you who may be going through your first budget cycle, get used to this, it happens every single year. What we never do is wait till we're outside the budget cycle. The budget committee does meet outside the cycle. They have what are called regular business meetings of budget. And that's where they start to look at things like policy. Uh, what needs to be redesigned? What needs to be advised to executive? Here's a piece of policy work that you may want to do. We've never got that really full and proper look at this. And, and I don't disagree, perhaps this is the time to do it. We're in inflationary times, we're in rate increase times. But I would submit, we do want to do this referral and we do want to look at this at a later date when we'll probably get the best work we could ever get out of staff. And, and then really compare ourselves to other municipalities and make sure that we're on the right track. But I would ask, that it be a full report, that it look at market forces, that it look at what is the general wealth of seniors. Because it, you know, we, we look at statistically in The Economist magazine and we're told these are the most wealthy seniors ever. Sure doesn't always feel that way. And I, and I get that, uh, partly because I'm old, <laughs> but also because the older you get, the older the people are that you care for. I care for someone who is almost 96 um, and, uh, and, and we've gone through property changes to make sure he's in the right place. Yes, you want people to age in place, but you do do things to meet your finances and make sure you have Count. as much cash possible Count. for Count care. Counselor. All those things happen. Count. Oh, do I not have three? Two. Sorry, I thought I, I, thought I heard you say no, three. No. I, I asked if I had three and I, I thought you said yes. 
Uh, I, if anyone wants to discuss this further, call me. <laughs> okay. We do have a referral motion before us. On favor? Okay, carried. Pardon? Okay, recorded vote. We're referring it to executive. Pardon? Did you say you wanted a recorded vote? No, he doesn't. Okay, we, he doesn't need a recorded vote. On favor? Carried. Okay, our last item is EX 2.1, reestablishing council advisory bodies. Uh, Councillor uh, Bradford, you held it down. Oh, sorry, just a Councillor Bradford. Th thanks, Madam Speaker. I have my questions answered offline. Um, uh, apologies for the hold. Thank you. I can let that go. So you're just releasing it? Just a release. Okay. So Councillor Bradford is releasing EX 2.1. On favor? Carry. Thank you. Members, be before I ask for a motion to enact the general bills, may I have a motion regarding the consideration of submissions on zoning bylaw and official plan amendments? Councillor Thompson, did you want to move that one? Sure. Okay, just wait till we put it on the screen. There Thank it is. you. Thank you. That the, the committee and council considers submissions in making a decision on zoning by law and official plan amendment. On favor, carried. May I have a motion to may I have a motion to introduce Bill 135? We will vote on this bill separately as it requires a two-thirds vote. It is the bill to repeal a bylaw regarding the Metropolitan Toronto Pension Plan. So the motion is that leave be granted to introduce Bill 135. Shall leave be granted to introduce this bill? Recorded vote. Do we have have recorded? We don't need to record about two meters. Oh, I just heard me. No, but it's... <laughs> be granted to introduce this bill on favor show of hands carried shall this bill be declared as a bylaw and be passed subject to section 226.9 of the city of toronto act okay and it's on the screen recorded vote speaker our computers are off so you're going to have to log us in speaker yeah Speaker, my mic is on. That's, Mayor, that's what it says here. Councillor Cole, how do you vote, please? Affirmative. Affirmative, thank you. Councillor Perks? In favor. In favor, thank you. Uh, Mayor Tory, affirmative. Thank you. Uh, the motion to pass Bill 135 carries. The vote is 20 to 0. May I have a motion to introduce the general bills? Deputy Mayor McKelvey. I move to introduce the bills. Oh, I'm just making it up. <laughs> yeah, those ones. 
Yeah, any bill will do. Oh, there we go. That leave be granted to introduce bills 114 to 134 and 136 to 153. Thank you. Shall leave be granted to introduce these bills all in favor? Show of hands carried. Shall these bills be declared as bylaws and be passed subject to section 226.9 of the City of Toronto Act 2006? All in favor? Show of hands carried. May I have a motion to introduce a com the confirmative bills? Um, count, uh, Mayor Tory. Bills to confirm to the point of the introduction of this motion, the proceedings of City Council meeting three on February 7th and 8th, 2023. Shall leave be granted to introduce these bills? Recorded vote. It says here, recorded vote. I'm just going by what's here. It says take a recorded vote. I, it, we were wrong. You don't need one. Okay. Shall he be granted? Uh, okay. Shall he be granted to introduce these bills? All in favor? Show of hands. Carried. Shall these bills be? We used to record all of them. Remember years ago? Shall these bills be be declared as bylaws and be passed subject to section? Did I already read that one? I already read that one. I already read this one, didn't I? Shall these bills be declared as bylaws and passed subject to section 226 of the City of Toronto Act? All in favor? Show of hands carried. This meeting is now adjourned. Do we want to have a recorded vote? No. We want to thank you, Speaker. Thank okay, you. thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank you to staff especially. I know we had some technical issues this council meeting. And thank you to members of council.